This is the Collected Works of Robert Adams. Part 3. Transcript 26. Dealing with Problems. 22nd November, 1990. Robert, tape starts abruptly. To do anything they want. No real sage has ever eaten meat. Not because they are particular about it, but because they follow a sattvic diet. It appears to me that the higher you go in consciousness the less food you eat. And the food that you do eat is pretty pure. Not for any particular reason, but that's the way it is. But still when you think of all the turkeys. Laughter. That were slaughtered millions of turkeys seems strange. Anyway I welcome you with all my heart. Notice what I said. I welcome you. I did not say my body welcomes you. Laughter. I said, I welcome you. Whenever I use the pronoun I, I always refer to consciousness. Though my I is the same as your I. There's only one I. There's only one person. There's only absolute awareness. That I is consciousness. That I is you and me. Though when I say, I welcome you, I'm referring to all of us as I. Yet the body has nothing to do with it. As long as we're stuck in the body-mind phenomena, we mean I as a person welcomes you. But I as a person has nothing to do with you whatsoever. Only I is consciousness. It is none other than yourself. That's called ultimate oneness. I received some phone calls from some of you last week about a lesson we had on Sunday. They still can't understand how to solve your problems. And that's usually what my phone calls are all about from people. Everybody appears to have a problem. Whether it's depression or loneliness or lack or limitation or sickness. There is always a problem. And they want to know how to resolve the problem. There's only one way to resolve the problem so that it never comes back and that's not at the level of the problem. That's to go higher than the problem, to ignore the problem and to realize who it is who has the problem. Think of your problem if you have any. You say, I have a problem. The mistake that you're making is you're identifying I with your body and your mind. Then that's the only problem you've got. You still believe that you are the problem or the body or the doer or the mind. That is the only problem you've got, no other problem. So, if the problem of I is resolved, every other problem is resolved also. And people cannot grasp this. But, think about it if you will. Whenever you have a problem of any kind, whatever it may be, who do you say has the problem? You say, I have a problem. You're referring to your body, aren't you? You're referring to your mind. But, if you can catch yourself and say, who is this I that thinks it has a problem? You will realize that I never had a problem. The body appears to have a problem. Only you are not your body. You have absolutely nothing to do with your body. Try to remember this all of the time. Your body is under the law of karma. There is no karma, there is no body. But, as long as you believe you've got a problem is because you believe you are the body. You therefore have to work from that point. And realize my body is under its own laws and rules of karma. It has absolutely nothing to do with me. I am absolutely free. When you look at it this way, you become the witness to your body. You become the witness to your thoughts. It happens by itself. You do not say, I am the witness. You say, the witness is observing my body has to be an eye to observe, where did that I come from? What is the source of that eye? Find out. But if you use the other method, say for instance, somebody's suing you in court. Though you say, I've got a problem because somebody's suing me. If you respond physically, and you worry, and you fear, and you believe something is wrong, then you may win the court case or lose the court case. But, Whatever you do, you've not risen 
higher than the problem, which means you're going to have to repeat it again and again until you get to the point where you do not react to the condition. Now what do I mean by not react? Do you ignore the summons to go to court? No you don't. Students laugh. You do what has to be done. When you go to court but you realize, who's going to court? My body is. My body is going to court but who's my body? There is no body. There is no court. It's all an illusion. It is really. Students laugh. And then really if you look at it that way something good is going to happen. More laughter, strange as it may seem you will overcome and transcend that predicament. But, if you don't if you react like everybody else does with fear and say, I'm not guilty. I didn't do it. Then you've got a problem. You're going to have to repeat that condition over and over again, as I mentioned before until you're able to realize that nothing has ever happened to I. I is free. I has always been free. Now put yourself in the other position. They somebody steals something from you and you sue them in court. And this time you're the plaintiff. Again if you lower yourself to that position you may win the case and get a judgment. But that does not end the condition for you karmically. It means karmically your body is going to go through it again and again and again. If you check the court records you're going to find something very interesting. You're going to find that the people who sue and get sued come to court again and again. They're always in some kind of trouble, they're always suing, and they're always being sued. It's the same people. Laughs. It's the same people that go round and round and round. They're on a treadmill, and they never get off. The same with a doctor or dentist. If you look through the doctor's records and the dentist's records, it's the same people coming back all the time. Once in a while you get a new patient. But once you get hung up with doctors and dentists you keep going back again and again and again. They make sure you do. Have you ever gone to a dentist when they haven't found anything wrong with you? There's always a filling you need. If you don't have one, they'll make one. Students laugh. Because that's how they make their money. What I'm trying to say is don't get stuck on that level. Raise yourself in consciousness. By asking yourself, who's going through this? I am. Who is I? Am I my body? Am I my mind? Find out. Who you are really. When the realization comes, and that you are not your body, everything will be resolved in an amicable way for all concerned. Why? Due to the fact that consciousness is harmony and bliss. If you become consciousness, you can only experience harmony and bliss. And that includes your body also due to the fact that you have no body. So what appears as a body becomes harmonious and blissful to you. To other people you may look like you're dying. But, as far as you're concerned there's nobody there to die. There's nobody there to have a problem. This is something practical you can work with. The realization again is that everything is attached to the I. Everything the courthouse, the plaintiff, the defendant, the summons, the doctors and dentists. It's all part of the I. Therefore don't try to change the things with the effects. Go to the cause and ask yourself, why am I going through all this? And the answer will be, because you're a jerk. Students laugh. You won't accept the I. More laughter, so you have to go through this again and again and again until you do. And that's what happens. You have one experience after the other and you're identifying your I with the condition, aren't you? And you're saying, aren't you, I'm going through this condition. I'm experiencing this. But that's not true, that's false identification. I am apart from the body phenomena. My body doesn't listen to the I. Remember your body is under its own laws. Your body does what it likes. Does it ask your permission to do anything? Of course not. 
When you have to go to the bathroom, does the body ask the I, can it go to the bathroom? It makes you feel that you have to go to the bathroom. When you catch a cold, does the body ask the permission of I to catch a cold? Of course not. It catches a cold. But the mistake has been that you've identified the I with the body. Now you know that I is not the body, I is consciousness, I is parabrahman, I is ultimate oneness, I is at chit ananda, and that is your real nature. Any questions about that? SR, I have a few questions, getting back to the problem, you know we started this with talking about the problem. Buddha's first noble truth you know, that life is suffering. It seems like there's always a problem, but like Ramana said the real trick is to find out who the problem is, so the appearance of these things like the summons, or the traffic ticket, or whatever you know, it's a problem in one sense, and in another sense it's really grace. Seems like, Robert, it's grace if you realize the I. Yeah I mean it only turns you in, eventually because sooner or later, because you know you can get tired of dealing with it on another level I think. Robert, unfortunately what happens Richard is most people never get tired. Laughter. They go through life after life after life after life until they will awaken one day which is true. SR, maybe it will happen, but we just want to be around for others. Laughs. But ultimately it will happen. But, if they would get their eye together, then they wouldn't have to go through all that. So think about your problems. Do you have any problems think? And don't you say, I have the problem? Now can you see your mistake? I has no problem whatsoever. I is completely free. Abide in the eye. Grab hold of the eye. And the work you do again is you ask, to whom does this come? To me. Me is the same as I. You hold on to the sense of me. Remember it's only a sense of me. Me doesn't exist. And you follow it to its source. How do you follow it to its source? Through silence. When you ask, what is the source of me? You keep silent. And the answer will come by itself. Remember you never answer the question because it's your ego answering. Whatever answer you come to in your mind, it comes from your ego. In this process we're trying to annihilate the mind and the ego together. And the only way to annihilate the mind and ego is through silence. When there are no thoughts, there's no mind. When you try to evaluate your problem and resolve it, your mind is making a lot of noise. Therefore you can never resolve your problem really. You may stop it for a time, but it will continue again and again, and come back in different ways to haunt you. As an example, a person has a tumor in the neck, instead of finding the cause of the tumor, they go to a surgeon. And the surgeon grabs a sharp little knife and says, I want to cut this out, and of course, you let the surgeon cut it out. Because after all he or she is a surgeon they know and they've got sharp knives. But, what happens later? A month later the tumor grows back on the other side of the neck. So you go back to the surgeon and you say you need a head transplant. Laughter. He cuts off that tumor so now you've got two big scars. A month later it grows back on your arm and you go on and on like that. Due to the fact the surgeon didn't try to find the cause, he merely tried to get rid of the effect. And that's the same thing you do when you try to resolve your problems. You're working with effect, not with the cause. The cause is consciousness. And when you identify with the cause, the problem disappears of its own accord due to the fact that it never really existed, and you become free. So if you're having trouble sitting in the silence, when you follow the I, when you ask, from whence does this I come, and you abide in the I, and you abide into silence, but you have trouble sitting in the silence, then you should begin practicing the mantra, 
I, I, and say that to yourself over and over again. I, 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 I. This will keep your mind from thinking. It will help to make your mind empty. Though you can sit in the silence without thinking. You have to do something. Again do not get down to the level of the problem. That's no way to solve a problem by getting down to its level. Merely rest in the eye. The eye will lead you to silence, and in the silence there's consciousness. There's pure intelligence and absolute awareness, there's emptiness, there's nirvana. You will experience all these phrases of consciousness. If you follow the eye to its source. Any questions about that? SD, I've got a question but I can't think how to phrase it. You've taught us that by self-inquiry, if you follow the I thought, you will find that ultimately there is a no I. And assuming that that's so, you've also given us a mantra to still the mind that says, as you breathe in, who am I? And then as you pause, I am pure consciousness and exhale, I am not the body. Well, who is the I, who is pure consciousness if there is no I? Robert, yourself. You are. Though the problem seems to be a matter of semantics with our language, because it seems to me like you're talking about two different eyes. Robert, there's the I, which is the personal I, and there's the I, which is consciousness. SD, so the I, that is the personal I, is the one that disappears. Yes, and then the I remains as I am. SD, but I thought that you said that the I disappear altogether. The personal I disappears altogether. SD, but not the real I. There is a real I as far as it goes. But, who needs a real I? Laughter. SD, well in the phrase I am pure consciousness, who is that I? God. SD, but we're still using the pronoun I. Because you can't do any better than that. Laughter. SD, so that's what I mean it's semantics more or less. You can call it semantics. You follow the personal I, it turns into I am. I am is consciousness and then there's silence. What you want to achieve is the silence. In other words you don't want to go around saying, I'm the real I, I'm the real I. Otherwise it's like a tree saying, I'm a tree, I'm a tree. SD, right. But, for your own good and for your own practice it turns into the real, I am and the real, I am is silence, quietness. There are no thoughts. SH, so beyond the phrase, I am pure consciousness is silence. Robert, I am pure consciousness is synonymous with silence, it's the same thing. But, when you want to express the silence you express it as pure consciousness. Feel how happy you are when you're not thinking at all, when your thoughts are very few. Fewer the thoughts the happier you become. The trouble begins when you think a lot. That's why I always say, do not think past your nose. As soon as you see the thoughts coming out, immediately stop them by asking yourself, to whom do they come? To me, abide in the me, hold on to the me. Follow it to its source which is I am or silence or quietness. Then, there's total happiness, unbroken happiness, unalloyed happiness. Total peace and bliss and joy which never goes away. What do you think of that? SH, sounds okay. Robert laughs. SV, the sense of I you're talking about holding on to the sense of I. Robert, yes. Is that the most I could possibly do humanly? Robert, no, of course not. As far as practice goes? Robert, there are a lot of things you can do humanly. You can take a cold shower. SV, no I mean practice wise. Yeah, you can take a cold shower, it helps you. Because a cold shower changes your metabolism and makes you more aware. 
Try it. SV, I don't like cold showers. That's the object. SV, sorry? That's just it. If you take one, say you're feeling out of sorts and you're feeling depressed. If you take a cold shower, the depression will go away. SV, will you forget about it? Will you forget about it? SD, will you forget about the depression because you're so cold? Laughs. That's it sure many changes come. But, then it gives you time to practice. Whereas before you couldn't practice because you were too depressed. But, now the depression lessens because you took a cold shower and you're able to practice. You're able to go within. Whereas before it was virtually impossible to do. You were too caught up in the problem. Or you can become the witness and just observe your depression. Observe you actions, just watch, look intelligently, systematically. Watch your thoughts. Come aware of your thoughts. Aware of your feelings and do nothing. That also quiets your mind. Everything you do, all of your sadhana is to quiet the mind. To make the mind still. That's what you really want. Therefore use whatever method you have to in order to still the mind. There's nothing really profound about it, it's simple, you want to quiet the mind. When the mind is quiet, your real nature ensues all by itself. Everything happens by itself. But, when your mind is noisy, then it appears that you have to work diligently, to do something to change your consciousness. Whereas in truth, there's very little you have to do. Simply practice self-inquiry or bhakta. Become a bhakta where you surrender completely to God. When you say, not my will, but thine and you totally surrender. In other words, you give God your life and your affairs and your problems. But, you remember not to give an outside God that. There's no outside God. You're giving it to God within yourself, and then you become that God yourself. They both lead to freedom, to liberation. You've got all kinds of choices to make and believe me, that's the only choice you've got. The choice not to react to anything and to turn within whatever you choose. That's the only freedom you've got. Everything else is karmic. Good. SG, Robert, who has the choice? Robert, the self. The self is self-contained. It gives you a choice as a body to find out you're not the body. You're doing it all by yourself. I'm talking about the ego self. SG, the ego self doesn't exist. Of course not, but you believe it does because you've got the problem. SG, that's true. As long as you're experiencing problems. Do not walk around saying the ego doesn't exist. If the ego does not exist, there would be no need to solve the problem. But, as long as you feel you have a problem to solve then, you may know the ego still exists for you. If we all knew there was no ego then this whole conversation will be redundant. The reason we're talking is because some of us believe we've got an ego. Even though we say we don't. That's why it's not wise to walk around saying, I am Brahman, I am consciousness, I am pure awareness while you're hurting, and you believe there's something wrong with your life or something is not going right with your life. As long as you can feel and see that there is something wrong with your life, no matter what it is, no matter how righteous you think you are, then you must know you've got an ego and a body. Then you've got to work with the laws of karma to get rid of it. And that's where you practice loving kindness, joy, purity, eating a sattvic diet and doing all the things that they teach you in yoga. But when the time comes, when you become realized it doesn't give you license to make an idiot out of yourself and that's something else we should discuss. There are many people walking around today who believe they're realized and they're doing all kinds of foul things. And they say it doesn't matter. They justify by believing, I can do anything I like because nothing exists. But even if you had that thought it shows you're not enlightened. Because if you were, 
there would be no one to think like that. Do you see? Thoughts like that don't even enter your mind. That I can do anything I want. Laughs. You're contradicting yourself, you're saying I. I still exists for you. But you're saying I can do anything I like because I don't exist. If you didn't exist, you wouldn't pose that question. As V, because it relates to the body? Robert, of course. So that's how we fool ourselves. But there are many people I used to know in other states and other countries that really used to believe that they're enlightened. And one wound up in jail, one committed suicide, because they think this gave them license to do whatever they like. And believe me, when realization comes, you become very compassionate. You become the embodiment of humility. You become a joy for others without thinking those things. It happens by itself. And there's no question about being enlightened or by not being enlightened. You don't think you're enlightened. Those words disappear. Those thoughts disappear. There's no such thing as being enlightened. That's just for the Ajani to consider being enlightened or not being enlightened. But, the point is, you do not go around committing foul deeds. I know somebody in the class. He's not here today. But, he goes to porno movies all the time, and that's neither good nor bad. But, he claims it doesn't matter because who's seen the movie? Laughter. That's how he justifies it. Though if somebody tells me that, I don't even bother to answer. We've got to be real careful. We have to be careful because this path of John Amarga does not give you restrictions or rules and regulations. It only tells you to find the eye. That's it. And everything will take care by itself. But, be real careful. If you have all kinds of bodily feelings and urges and you think you're enlightened, forget it. It's true that some of the people have read the book, The Divine Madman. I don't know if you've read it or not, but I used to lend it to people. And that's a mistake because people take it literally. They think if you're enlightened you can go around doing all kinds of things to people for the sake of their enlightenment. Don't even think of that. Because that person we read about in that book is so far advanced, we can't possibly imagine how he thinks. But, many people try to emulate him. Be careful. Any questions about that? SR. Speaking of bodily urges. Laughter. You're saying that's a sign of those, is a sign that you're not enlightened? Robert, people ask me usually, well how do you feel when you become self-realized? And I always make the statement, you become more human. Which means you expand, you become sort of omnipresent with love. Your feeling of love multiplies. Your feeling of humility increases a thousandfold and you feel as if you are the body of the whole human race. You are the body of the universe. So the urges you get are loving urges. Urges of humility, compassion, loving kindness. All the other urges are bodily urges. If you realize they go away. S. Students asks about bodily urges. It changes, it modifies them. There's a lot of controversy about that. But, you still can use your body and still have sex if you want to, but the feeling's completely different. It's beyond humanity and you cannot describe it, it's ineffable. SD, is that why my hair she I believe said that you can be married or unmarried, rich or poor and still be realized? Robert, exactly it has nothing to do with that. Though if you were married presumably you would still have bodily human-like. Robert, some would and some wouldn't. It depends. But, you said that it would be different or more transcendental. Robert, it would be totally different. SR, Robert along these lines, in particular this day for me, in that area due to meeting someone I've known for a while, and it was real interesting what happened. 
It was a very good feeling of being confined in a small space, you know what I mean. Kind of a different energy, and then all of a sudden, it just changed a couple of hours ago to this feeling of just being totally at home and secure in the universe. And I was listening to this beautiful music, and it kept saying, passing through life like a child never knowing the reason, I've never strayed far from home, something like that. It seems like that was the answer to everything was, where is home? Because those feelings had to take you out and away from where you really are. And when that sort of happened it was most peaceful and quiet that my mind's ever been, I think. Robert, that's good. A lot of release that's why I'm laughing a lot. Robert, that sounds good. But, it was like, I had been talking to Jim about it earlier because it was kind of an intense experience for me, and there's a real desire to sort of be human in a certain way. Robert, well you shouldn't really deprive yourself. SR. Yeah, but even more so, kind of more like a certain sense of wanting to be indulgent, but in a different way than ever before, you know. Like totally being one with the experience that one has, you might say, and even if they only happen in my mind, you know. And that's what seems to facilitate. It's like all of a sudden, it's like an explosion, feeling really good was that I quit judging it or trying to just stay back. Robert, that's it, yes. Yeah, you know, it's like whatever was happening, even if it was a fantasy that was reality too. Robert, that's it. What I was trying to say before is you do not think about it. SR, yeah. There are no thoughts saying should I or shouldn't I. There's just the experience. It's beyond words or thoughts. This is why I say all the time when you get to that stage it's ineffable. There are no words to describe it. Though we keep silent and we do not say anything and that describes it better. So when I say we become more human, I mean you expand. You take in the entire universe and you realize that everything is the self and I am that. But, that becomes meaningful to you. You do not use the words like I just mentioned. You just know it. You perceive that that's the way it is. But, there are no words going through your mind. There are no longer words like should I or shouldn't I, am I right or am I wrong, is this good or is this bad. Just by being you, you are an asset to the human race, to the universe, to everything. But, there are no words to describe it. There are no laws that you have to follow and no rules that you have to follow. But, yet, it's virtually impossible for you in that state to hurt anybody. You're beyond being hurt and you're beyond hurting anybody. It's a state of total humility, total compassion, and total loving kindness. SR. It didn't sound like motivation or any sense of intention too, it seems like. Yes that's true, because there is nobody there to be motivated. SR. Right. And for anybody to be hurt or affected by it. That's the ego of course. Only the ego can be affected or hurt or motivated. But, when there's no ego there's nothing to think. And the doer is gone. So whatever you do is automatic, spontaneous. It's an asset to the human race as I said and hurts nobody. So again, if you still have to think is it right or wrong, or if you still have to think am I hurting somebody, am I making the right decision, then you may know your ego is alive and well. SK, but at the same time isn't it good to go through those processes until one's ego is gone? Robert, to watch yourself, to observe yourself, to be the witness to that which is happening. And that again leads to silence. SV, otherwise you're caught up in the game again. Of course do not react to it. SR, Robert in my case there was a lot of fear of hurting somebody that was causing like a real compact, you know like memories were still really involved. 
and it seemed like what I was trying to do about it was to find somewhere where I could be safe, and then as soon as I realized that was hopeless, then the whole thing seemed to revert to a completely different. It's like the world shifted entirely. It's like the fear of being hurt, or would I hurt somebody was a memory that it was almost like living a past way. Robert, well that experience lets you know that you're half-baked. Laughter. SR, what's that? You're half-baked. Note, tape break. Tape continues with student questioning Robert's experience. SH, how old were you Robert? Robert, 14. SD, but you had other spiritual experiences even before that. Robert, yes I did. And then after that I spent the rest of my life confirming what I felt. I didn't know any names like I do now. SH, you have been bereft from the ego since you were 14. You can call it that if you like, because in order for me to sit here and talk to you I had to learn the names of these things like ego, consciousness, abidance and the self. I was just that before, but there was no name to it. Now I've given it names. SD, that was like my hair she had no formal education in religion, but he could respond and talk about the scriptures. Robert, that's right, yes, well what he did afterwards, is people gave him all the scriptures when he was in the cave. They used to bring him all kinds of books, and he glanced through them and read them and go through it. And it confirmed his feelings. SD, I mean because he'd already understood them being realized. Yes. Though he was able to talk to them. SG, but is there a need to confirm or is it just a part of the body-mind? Robert, there was no need but I used to think I was insane. I used to think there was something wrong with me because I just didn't respond. SK, you didn't then do a deliberate sadhana to get to that place because you didn't even know it existed? Robert, exactly. It happened and you didn't even know what happened? Robert, I had no idea whatsoever. SV, when you say that you thought you might be insane, of course you weren't suffering with that, you just... No, except I saw people in a different light. And they all responded to different things than I was. Though I was sort of left out. Therefore I wanted to investigate what's going on. SN, but Robert is that why some people have to do sadhana and some people don't? Robert, it depends on your karma that doesn't exist. Everybody's different. But, self-realization comes to everyone the same way basically. But, if you have to do sadhana, you have to do sadhana. As long as you believe you're the ego or the body or the mind, then you have to do sadhana. And that helps you to become quiet and still. And when you're quiet and still, realization comes of its own accord. SN People that don't have to do sadhana are reaping the fruition of their karma. You can say that. S. H. In your case you didn't have to do any sadhana. You're like a patriarch in the Zen tradition. Robert laughs. You heard of the Daya Sutra being recited on the street corners of China and that was it. Robert, that's about the size of it. Yeah, students discuss the fifth patriarch of the Zen tradition. SN. If a person has no ego, do they know that? Robert, no, because there's no one left to know. There has to be a knower to know whether you've got an ego or not. But when there's no knower, there's no ego. You're just empty. There's just plain emptiness. SN. So as long as you think that you don't have an ego? Robert, then you've got an ego. Students laugh. SR, so it's a state of not knowing yourself really? Not knowing you're even there. Robert, that's it. Like that song, a child passing through never knowing the reason. Robert, true. SV, so there's awareness, but there is no ego in that particular body-mind. 
Robert, there isn't even awareness, because who is left to be aware? There's nothing. SV, and yet you're expressing the fact that there's no ego there? Yes. SV, my mind boggles. Once again we go back to the sky is blue. Laughter. There's no sky and there's no blue if you investigate. Though if you investigate yourself, you will ultimately find that you never existed. SV, until that's discovered. Then you do the sadhana. SV, you act as if you're doing different sadhanas. Exactly that's why you have all these techniques. SN, while you're doing the sadhana, you're not affirming, in other words you're not trying to logically find it. You're actually trying to let go. Robert, you do it in reverse. You negate the world and the universe. And what's left over is your reality. SN, so it's not a matter of understanding at all. No. SN, once you try to understand it that's the problem. There has to be somebody to understand. But, if you get rid of that somebody then understanding is not necessary. SH, how can there be understanding without the one who understands? Robert, well there's nothing to understand. SH, like the witnessing without the witnesser? That's true. SH, understanding without being receptive to understanding. But, again there's nothing to understand and there's nothing to witness. There's just nothing. But, nothing is everything. SH, here we are throwing semantics all around here and catching it. Yes, that's what it amounts to. That's why the silence is the best teacher. When you get to that stage, silence. When you're questioning yourself and you get to the stage we just discussed, don't argue with yourself. Just keep still, keep quiet and you'll be amazed at what happens. SG, I keep getting to the point where I can't grasp it where it doesn't make sense. Robert, then just keep still be still. Be still and know that I am God. When you're still the I am knows itself as God. SD, being still seems to be hard Robert. Robert laughs. Stilling your mind you know. Your mind is so busy. Robert, it appears to be. But, if you use the processes I share with you, you'll get there. You can't lose with the stuff I use. Students laugh. SR, today it seems like I had a problem and I could approach this in sort of a casual way. I was down at Santa Monica as the sunset was coming, and I was walking around, and I noticed the mind was agitated. Then I sat down and started basically quietening down, and the beauty of it was unbelievable. The mind started gradually getting more quiet and quiet and quiet, but then it started again when I got up. So I came here, and I drove in the traffic, and instead of using the technique of starting with the outer, and gradually working to the inner, I quickly noticed I went into a dream world, as soon as I started thinking that everything was a dream world. And that silenced the mind, and it was like a total silence, and it stayed for about the last hour, and it was totally effortless way. And I've never seen that sort of approach before, but it was a kind of recognition that my reaction is to always go away from the silence. And as soon as I acknowledged that the silence was there, because the other way was kind of like almost, you know, stop the vibrations of things and gradually bring them to a quieter place. Robert, everyone is unique. If that process works for you, use it, that's good. I'll never tell you to change anything if it's working for you. If it quiets your mind, it's good. Anything that quiets your mind is good, any technique. But, the fastest way is through self-inquiry. SN, when you do self-inquiry, it's not really a matter of cause and effect though is it? Robert, no it goes beyond that. SN, is it karmic? Self-inquiry? SN, 
No, as I said, when you do self-inquiry, it's not whether you get a result, it's not a matter of cause and effect. You're not looking for a result. SN, but what if something transpires? Nothing really transpires. SN, nothing transpires? Laughter. You're simply asking yourself, who believes all this? Who needs anything to transpire? It all goes back to your ego. SN, but I'm saying whether it's not a matter of cause and effect, it's not a matter of, well, I do self-inquiry, therefore I get this. It's more a matter of, if self-inquiry works, I get lost as the self. Robert, it's a matter of becoming quiet. It's a matter of emptying your mind. But, through self-inquiry, it's the fastest way, when you ask yourself, who has to empty the mind? and you realize that you have no mind to empty. There never was any mind, and you become free. Do not make it complicated. Keep it as simple as possible. Just follow the eye to the source and say, I, I, if you have to, I, 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 I. If you use that method, you'll notice that the space between I, I, becomes greater and greater, and it's in that space that you have to merge with. Between the I, I, it's like when you get up in the morning before you become awake, that's realization. It's unconscious realization. But, try to catch yourself tomorrow morning. As soon as you open your eyes before you have a chance to think, in that split second you realized, that's realization. But, try to be conscious of it. And hold on to it during the day. The same thing happens before you fall asleep. The moment before you fall asleep, you're realized. If you can catch yourself and hold on to it, then you're in yourself. That's it. And you're at peace. SN, when you say, try to be conscious of it, who's conscious? You are conscious. SN, the ego. The ego, yes, you have to work with the ego mind. SN, so the ego's conscious of its non-existence. The ego's conscious of its place before you wake up or before you go to sleep, you become conscious of it. And then the ego disappears and only consciousness prevails. SD, and that moment will be perfect stillness, is that right? Robert, yes. The mind is quiescent and no thoughts have come yet. SH, Becoming conscious of the ego stills it. Robert, becoming conscious, the ego becomes conscious of the quietness and the ego disappears. You do not become conscious of the ego. SH, know that would just feed its strength in it. Yes. SU, I'd like to become more conscious of and to just stay as the I am in the midst of everyday activities. Robert, if you practice the mantra I, I, at night and in the morning, you will find that during the day, you're more calm and more peaceful. It'll happen by itself. As you, so often after I've been involved in activities, I've completely forgotten to bring everything back, I realize that I have been asleep. That I have not been able to bring it back and I can feel how different everything can be if it happens. If I'm quiet, it's not so hard to feel this. Robert, yes, of course. But never be angry at yourself. Never condemn yourself. Never think you made a mistake. Rather observe yourself and realize what you've done in your mind without condemnation and ask yourself, who wants me to experience this? I do. Who am I? And again hold on to the I. If you want to, you can imagine you're holding onto a rope. The eye is the rope. And you're climbing down the rope to its end, and that is the source of eye. Then you let go of the rope and keep quiet, and soon you will see what happens. You'll find that you stop falling and your body just disappears and you're in a space of bliss. SD, letting go must be very frightening to the ego. Robert, ah, in a way. But, the ego is the rope. Though you're letting go of the ego. SD, 
what about in the rare moments when I do reach absolute stillness? It seems what often interferes even more than thought is the sensory perception like a sound, yes sounds is the most frequent I get. You have to go beyond that. You have to inquire, to whom is this sound coming to? And again you go back to I. It comes to me. Hold on to the me. SD, so you say, who hears this? Who's distracted? Whatever comes go beyond it. By inquiring, to whom it comes? Sen, if the I were to get a glimpse of the self, if the ego were to get a glimpse of the self and feel that peace wouldn't it become inflated and think, I'm at peace, I'm at peace. Robert, no because if the ego gets a glimpse of the self it will disappear. Sn, I'm saying like without nervikalpa samadhi, but not a sahaja samadhi. In nervikalpa samadhi you feel peaceful and joyous while you're in samadhi, but when you come out of it, you become your old self again. Sn, yeah, but when you come out of it, into your old self wouldn't the ego tend to think like I experienced it therefore I am at peace. If you're inclined that way it would. But for some people it's just a passing point. They realize that they're experiencing nervi kalpa samadhi and I want to go further. Sn, like a trap or maharsha. Yes, everybody's a little different, that's why you should never compare yourself to anybody else. Never mind what gains anybody else is making, see yourself for what you are. Abide in the self, love yourself, know yourself. Never put yourself down, never condemn yourself. No matter how many mistakes you make, do not condemn yourself. That's what blasphemy is when you condemn yourself. Because yourself is really God. Therefore you realize that the ego's been making mistakes not God. And you inquire, to whom do these mistakes come? Then you go through the process again. I made the mistake again I have. Well again the I has not you. The I is the body, the I is the mind. But I am not that I, I am I am. As V, could you say that sense of I that you cling to that sense of I that you're saying to cling to? Robert, yes what about it? Is that feel kind of like love? What is it? I can't really feel it out? Robert, not really. What you cling to is your ego in the beginning. You cling to the sense of your ego and you're following it. The reason you're clinging to it is because you want to follow it to its source. It's only when you get to the source. SV, like right now, I don't know what it is, I can't seem to find it. Laughter. Then you don't have it. SV, I have this sense of love. What I'm saying is why not cling to that? You can cling to that if it's really love, then by all means still cling to it. Cling to love hold on to it. SV, it feels like love for myself even. Hold on to it and see what happens. SV, and it feels like it's very peaceful. Hold on to it and see what happens. SK, but the I is the non-self. Robert, because you're holding on to the self. You're holding on to. Other than being the self? SV, it's not even like holding on to it, it's more like it's right there. I'm really not holding on to it, it's just allowing it to be there. Robert, do you know it's there? Do I know it's there? There doesn't seem to be an I to know it's there, it's just there. Robert, then it's there that's good. That's a good sign. SH, if it's there why do you have to hold on to it? Robert, that's right. SV, there's no holding on to it. Robert, if the self is there there is never anything to hold on to. But, if it's the ego that thinks it's the self and is fooling it by imagining its love, then you have to hold on to it. SR, so your holding on is like just saying, 
don't hallucinate that it's not there anymore in a sense don't put something in its place. Robert, yes, as long as somebody feels, then you have to hold on. Though you have to hold on until the feeling goes away, and you get to the source. Laughs. SK, so you're holding on with the intention of who is experiencing it. Robert, yes. You're holding on to it with the objective of doing that process so it dissolves the ego too. Robert, yes. All the holding on, all the ropes and all the things you're holding on to, the ego, is all from the mind. It's all a projection of your mind. When you really feel love, it's indescribable. There's no mind, there's no projection. There's nothing going out and there's nothing coming in. And there's nobody left to feel anything. SK, are you really telling us what we're experiencing all the time? Robert, yes. SG, so you're doing self-inquiry and you're holding to the sense of I, and the sense of I is associated very strongly with the body and anything that concerns the body. Are you holding to that too? Robert, you're holding on to the I because you want to go to its source. If you really want to you can have that sense of the body and everything associated to it. Robert, yes that's the I. You're holding on to it, you're not concentrating on it, you're holding on to it. But, you're following it to the end, to the source. SG, what's the difference between holding on to and following it? You simply observe it. You watch the eye. You watch the eye going down, down, down in the heart. SK. The intention is to trace it to its source. Trace it to its source. And it's the source that you concentrate on, not the eye. Concentration is done on the source, which means nothing, quietness, silence and everything disappears. SH. Well that's different from holding on to the eye. Robert, you're holding on to the I, that's the ego. Sage, why not let go? Because if you let go you won't be anywhere. Sh, that's okay. No it's not okay, because if you let go of the I something else will come to take its place. Sh, like what? Another thought. Laughter. Sk, you'll think you are body in the world again. Robert. The idea is to hold on to it, follow it to the end, to the source. And then it disappears of its own accord. But do not delude yourself into thinking, I'm letting go of the I because you just made the statement, I'm letting go of the I. There has to be somebody to let go. As long as there's somebody, you're still the I. SR, when you're not doing this the forms will start to reappear with a sense of reality all their own, and that's how you know you're in your mind. Robert, exactly. And as soon as you get back to it, forms have no reality of their own, they become appearances. Robert, exactly. Things are just moving on their own, there's no doing in the moment. Robert, true. You're doing all these things to get to the source, to the substratum of existence. SF. Robert, what's the difference between the I that's attached to something and the I that's not attached to anything? Robert, the I that's not attached to anything is really consciousness, it's the I am. The I that's attached to anything is the ego. SK. The little I is, life's a bitch and then you die. Students laugh. SF thank you. True. SK, the ego is really when it's I am this or that, but when it's just I it's not the ego. Robert, right. Ramana always said, I cannot stand alone that's the ego, I am big, I am small, whatever, there's always something with the I, that you have the ego sense. Robert, yes, when the I is by itself, it's consciousness. SK, right. But the way you get rid of your problems again is to realize that they're all attached to the I. And when you transcend the I, your problems will go too. Try that tomorrow when you've got a problem, 
instead of relating to the problem relate to the I. Follow the I and you'll have no problem. SG, so you use the I as a sort of mantra? Robert, no, when you're using the mantra you're saying, I, I. But you do that after you follow the I to its source. And if other thoughts come after that, you use the mantra, I, 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 I. It will slow down your mind, it will keep you from thinking. SG, following the I to its source. Robert, to its source. At the same time, Robert, yes. SU, it's been said that the I is really that the ego is a lie and is nothing but a bundle of thoughts, and when we see that way, we're trying to watch it. Of course, I can't find the little I, so I think, okay, so I'll just watch the thoughts or sensations that there's really no entity that you can call an I. And that if you're going to watch something, all you have to watch are the thoughts or bodily sensations. But, it seems there's still a gap, there's something still watching. Robert, because you didn't ask yourself, to whom comes the thoughts? Ask yourself that question. To whom do these thoughts come to? SH, how does the little I arise in the first place? Robert, it doesn't. SH, it appears to. It appears to. That's why you call it the sense of I. SH, how does that appearance occur? It never occurs. SH, you always wash it out. Because it appears, it's an optical illusion. It's like saying, how does the body occur? We're talking about getting rid of the body. But, we're talking about a body that doesn't even exist. SF, the illusion of an identification that really cannot exist. Robert, exactly. There is no body, but it appears real. In the same instance, the small I also appears real. But, there is no small I. SN, so there's like an identity crisis. Laughter. That's true. Always think of the optical illusion that you see and compare it with that. Like the water in the desert that doesn't exist. If you look down the rail tracks, they both seem to turn into one. Ever seen that? It's an optical illusion. In the same way, the appearance of the world of the body, God, the universe, is an optical illusion. It doesn't exist. It's like a dream. Remember when you're having a dream, you will sit there arguing that it's real just like we are now. In the dream we're having a class, and we're going through the same thing as we're going through now. Only you wake up and it's all gone. But when you wake up out of this, it'll be gone too. And you'll be free. Laughter. SH, who's dreaming the dream? Robert, nobody. SK, the optical illusion of the railroads is probably the only true optical illusion that I can think of. Because there's two, but you see them as one. And everything is one in reality. So the optical illusion is true. Robert, you can say that if you like. Sage, there's nobody dreaming the dream, but the dream is being witnessed. Robert, the dream is being witnessed as an illusion. SH, there is witnessing of the dream, no witnesser, but there is witnessing of the dream. Is witnessing of the dream as long as you believe in the witness because that concept comes out of your mind. SH, there is no witness, there's just witnessing. Who's witnessing? SH, no one. Exactly, that's the answer. SK, now are you happy? SH, I was happy before. Laughter. Robert, see we like to talk about witnessing and dreams and all that stuff that's just for the sake of making conversation. SG, so you watch the thoughts and you don't let them get beyond the end of your nose. And then you go to the self-inquiry, the who's this I and who's watching themselves. Robert, yes, follow the I. 
SG, stay with the I and use it. Like follow the leader. SG, when you need to, but follow the I mostly. Follow the I mostly, and realize the whole universe is attached to the I. Therefore, when the I disappears, everything else will go also. SH, this is just a game, it's a way of just bamboozling itself, pretending it is what it isn't. Robert, you're right, that's exactly what it is. Because nothing I said is true. SH, I recognize that. Laughter. Why do we bother to listen to him? Why am I here myself? Laughter. Who knows? Laughter. SH, no, who cares? Laughter. I never try to figure it out. SR, you know Robert today it was funny because whenever I ask myself, who am I? I always feel I don't care. And I felt that you just answered that, you know the feeling of that is incredibly deep. I don't really care. Robert, but be careful about that, because in your everyday pursuits, you may not care about anything at all like somebody dying where you won't try to help. SR, so don't make that personal you're saying? Don't make it personal, right? But, in reality there's nobody to care. Who cares? Laughter. Who cares? SD, why would consciousness need to occupy itself with a game? Robert, it doesn't, that's the illusion. SK, if it doesn't then, it's not. Right, there's nothing happening. SK, Dana didn't even ask that question either, did she? True. Dana doesn't exist. He appears to exist. What are you reading, Narada? June looks up. What are you reading? SN, remember what I was reading to you that time when you were lying down in bed? Oh yeah. Would you like to read it? SN, I was deciding. Well what I was reading was, it is certain that the nature of the mind is empty. Without any foundation whatsoever. Your own mind is insubstantial like the empty sky. You should look at your own mind and see whether it is like that or not. Being without any view that decisively decides that it is empty, it is certain that self-originated primal awareness has been clear and luminous from the very beginning. Like the heart of the sun which is itself self-originated. You should look at your own mind and see whether it is like that or not. It is certain that this primal awareness, which is one's intrinsic awareness, is unceasing. Like the main channel of a river that flows unceasingly. You should look at your own mind and see whether it is like that or not. It is certain that the diversity of movements arising in the mind are not apprehensible by memories. They are insubstantial breezes that move through the atmosphere. You should look at your own mind and see whether it is like that or not. It is certain that whatever appearances occur, all of them are self-manifested. Like the images in a mirror being self-manifestations that simply appear. You should look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. It is certain that all of the diverse characteristics of things are liberated in their own condition. Like clouds in the atmosphere that has self-originated and self-liberated. You should look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. Robert, thank you. S. Can you tell us who can see it and who can't see it? S. N. Self-liberation to seeing with naked awareness. Translated by Reynolds. John Reynolds. I'll read a little more. There exists no phenomena other than that which arises from the mind. Other than the meditation that occurs, where is the one who is meditating? There exists no phenomena other than that what arises from the mind. Other than the behavior that occurs, where is the one who is behaving? There exists no phenomena other than that what arises from the mind. Other than the fruition that occurs, where is the one who is realizing the fruit? 
You should look at your own mind, observe it again and again. When you look upward into space of the sky outside yourself, if there are no thoughts occurring that are emanations being projected, and when you look inward at your own mind inside yourself, if there exists no projectionist who projects thoughts by thinking them, then your own subtle mind will become lucidly clear without anything being projected. Since the clear light of your own intrinsic awareness is empty, it is the Dharmakaya, and this is like the sun rising in a cloudless illuminated sky. Even though this light cannot be said to possess a particular shape or form, nevertheless it can be fully known. The meaning of this or whether or not it can be understood is especially significant. Finishes reading. Narada, I'll read something from the Ashtravakra. By nature my mind is empty. Even in sleep I am awake. I think of things without thinking. All my impressions of the world have dissolved. My desires have melted away. Though what do I care for money or the feeding senses, for friends or knowledge or holy books, liberation, bondage, what are they to me? What do I care for freedom? For I have known God the intimate self, the witness of all things. Without a fool, within free of thought, I do as I please and only those like me understand my ways. S.C. How can he think without thinking? Robert, there has to be somebody to think, for you to think, but when you're above in an enlightened state, a realized state the thinking is spontaneous. You only think of whatever is present in the moment. That's why I say you never think further than your nose. You think in the moment and that's it. Then the thoughts just dissolve. Sv. Robert, is that a clear translation? Robert, I don't know. It did seem like someone there saying that. The text before it sounded very transparent. Robert, it comes from a different source. But, it's pretty clear. He's trying to explain it as an ego. Whenever somebody tries to explain something, there's always the ego at work. How else can you explain it? There has to be an ego to explain it. That's why the biggest benefit we get here at Satsang is not what I say, but just by being here. Pause. If you truly wish to repent, just sit in silent meditation and see the perfect reality within. For all manners of error merely arise in erroneous thought. And like the morning dew before the rising sun can perfectly be eliminated through the benevolent light and wisdom. So let's just stay quiet for a few minutes. Long silence then Robert resumes. Peace. How is everybody feeling? Try to stay as peaceful as you are now, during your normal activities during the day. Do not take anything too seriously. Just observe the world going by and yet do not react to it. Watch everything, be alert, but leave it alone. Do not try to own anything, and do not try to give up anything. Just be yourself. Have no feeling that I am the doer. Let your body go about its business, but you stay with the eye and all will go well with you. Anybody like to say anything else? So the next time we'll meet will be Sunday at 2 o'clock, right? SK, is there ever a consideration from 9 in the morning till 12 noon? Robert, nope, never considered that. Students laugh as at this point the tape ends. Transcript 27 Eternal Happiness 25th November, 1990 Robert, it's good to be with you again. I'm really happy that we've got a small group. Not too many people here, but more seem to be coming. When Henry first invited me to his house to have this satsang, he told me, Robert will fill up the room for you. We'll have hundreds of people. And I said, Henry, we don't want hundreds of people. We want substance. We want quality, not quantity. We want a few good devotees who want to awaken in this incarnation and become free and liberated. Though Henry said, 
Well, what would happen if too many people come? So I replied, I'll know exactly what to say so they won't come back again. And that's what's been happening. Most people are seekers. They go from one movement to the next, one teacher to the next, one lecture to the next, and they never practice anything. How do they expect to get anywhere? You want to do something positive here and make something happen so that you don't have to come back again and again and play the game of life over and over again. What is it everyone really wants out of life? What is everyone looking for? What do people really want more than anything else? And the answer is happiness. Everything you do is for happiness. You get married to be happy. You get divorced to be happy. You have a job and you go to work so you can make money to bring you happiness. But, as we learn, it is never lasting. What we really want is eternal happiness. Happiness that lasts forever. Happiness that does not change. We want eternal happiness. Think about that unalloyed happiness. Happiness that never goes away. Now the question is, is there such a thing? And if there is, how do I get it? Well, the answer to the first question is yes, there is such a thing, and you get it by not allowing your mind to go out into the world. By keeping your mind in your heart. When your mind goes out into the world, it spoils it. It's like the sun. The sun is always shining. Sometimes the clouds cover the sun. But do we say there's no sun? Only the ignorant men will say there's no sun. We realize the clouds have covered the sun. And after a while the clouds will dissipate and we'll have happiness once again. For the sun will shine once again. It's exactly the same thing with happiness. We have allowed our mind to make us believe that external conditions can bring us happiness. We have to learn the hard way that's not true. External conditions can only bring us misery. The first thing we have to understand is this, that everything in this universe, galaxies, stars, planets, suns, moons, people, places, cockroaches, animals, minerals are all a manifestation of your mind, even God are all a projection of your own mind. You have invented your own gods with your mind. And it's that God that brings you misery because you look at this God as a Santa Claus. When your wishes are not fulfilled you become upset. And you blame God. Little do you know that you have created your own God in your own image. Everything, everything, is a projection of your mind. So how do you attain happiness? By allowing your mind to go back within yourself and resting in your heart. Happiness is your divine nature. Happiness is what you are. Yet you can only know this when your mind is quiet and peaceful and still. At that time it makes no difference what's going on in the world. You will be happy, blissful, peaceful. As an example, a person buys a lottery ticket, he wants to win lottery. Keeps buying lottery tickets every week. The mind has gone out, it has gone into the world and has told you that you may win the lottery. So you buy lottery tickets for years. And you're anxious, you're stressful, you're distraught, you're unhappy because you're buying lottery tickets. Your goal is to win the lottery. After 10 years of buying lottery tickets, you finally achieve your goal, you win 40 million dollars. After the excitement wears off, something strange happens to you. You feel quiet, you feel blissful, you feel happy and you have no idea what happened. You believe it's winning the money that has caused you to feel happy like this. But, it's not. What has happened is simply this, once you've achieved your goal, you become quiet. There's no goal to strive for. Therefore your heart has accepted your mind. Your mind has gone back into your heart. You're automatically happy. It has nothing to do with the money or the winnings. Now how long does this last before your ego starts playing games with you again? 
So start thinking to yourself, my relatives and my friends are only coming to see me because they want my money. I haven't paid the IRS. They'll probably take half of it, and I'll only have 20 million left. People may try to kidnap me and hold me for ransom, what am I going to do? Do you hire bodyguards? You build a fence around your home and your happiness is gone. But when you build a fence around your home and you hire bodyguards you feel happy again because you've reached another goal. The reason you feel happy again is because your mind has gone back into yourself. And yourself is naturally happy, but you believe it's because you secured yourself that's brought you happiness and so it goes. On and off like a yo-yo. You're happy when you achieve a goal and you're miserable when you're searching for something. The external world can bring you nothing but misery. We have to learn that lesson the hard way, unfortunately. Here's another example. A person wants to get married, they want a mate. They go searching and they're unhappy until they find the right mate. They go from one person to the other, one person to the other. Then, they finally go to the right bar and pick up the right person and say, this is the girl I want or this is the guy I want. And you think you're happy. Once you give up thinking and acquiring and searching, again the mind goes back into the heart. When the mind is back into the heart, you automatically stay happy. But you think it's because you found the right mate. Now how long does this happiness last? Your ego takes over again and you start thinking. I wonder if my mate has a new friend, a new boyfriend, a new girlfriend. I'm getting tired of him or her, I'll go searching for somebody else. It's getting boring living with this person and you become miserable again until you go get somebody else. When you get somebody else, you feel happy for the moment or for the day or for the week or for the month or for the year. Your mind has gone back into the heart. That is the only thing that makes you happy, because happiness cannot be found in the world. For the world is not what you think it is. The world is not real by itself, but Brahman is real. Brahman is the world. The world is only real when you realize the world is Brahman. Brahman is consciousness. What is this like? It's like a chalkboard. Imagine the chalkboard as consciousness. You draw pictures on the chalkboard. Pictures of galaxies, of pyramids, of stars, of worms, of people. Are the drawings real? The drawings are only as real as the chalkboard, because without the chalkboard you couldn't have the drawing. Though the drawings represent the universe. The chalkboard represents consciousness. Then you erase all the drawings and you draw a baby. You erase the baby, you draw the baby growing up as a young person. You erase the young person and you draw a young person growing up in their fifties and sixties. Then you erase that and you draw another person dying, same person. But what has happened to the chalkboard all this time? Nothing the chalkboard remains the same. The universe changes people change. You're born, you grow older, you die but consciousness is always the same. The problem is wrong identification. We are identifying with the images with the world with creation. We are not identifying with consciousness. When you identify with consciousness, creation becomes like a moving picture. It comes and goes but you do not react. You do not react to good things, and you do not react to bad things. They're both two sides of the same coin and they're both imposters' illusions. It's like a dream. You may say to me, Robert this sounds ridiculous, how can the world be like a dream? Well think of it this way. When you do dream. When you are dreaming, do you not project the entire universe in that dream? In that dream you have a star, you have a galaxy, you have a moon, you have a sun, you have houses, you have people, you have oceans, you have everything in the dream. Where does it come from? It's amazing how your mind unconsciously when you're dreaming can manifest all those things. 
and also you're in the dream yourself. You see yourself in the dream as a baby. You grow older, you join the army, you get into a war, you get wounded, you come home in a wheelchair and then you get married, you have children. All this is happening in the dream. Then one day there's an earthquake. Buildings are falling, the ground is opening swallowing up people, and you're screaming, and then you see me. And I'm very calm and I say, don't worry my friend, this is only a dream. But you look at me like I'm crazy. You say, what are you talking about, can't you see what's happening? The earth has opened up and it's swallowing people and you're telling me this is a dream? You must be out of your mind. Though I say, my friend be calm, it's only a dream, but you don't believe me. Then the earth opens up where you are and it swallows you up, and then a funny thing happens. You wake up. What happened to all my problems? What happened to my crippled body? What happened to the earthquake? You have awakened. It's no longer a dream. Now I am sitting here telling you that your life is like a dream and not to worry, not to fear. But, to be still and know that I am God. To understand that you are consciousness. That you are pure awareness. That you are absolute reality, that you are Parabrahman, that you are Satchitananda, but you don't believe me. You think you're mortal. You identify with your body consciousness. You identify with events in this world. And your mind is always plotting, always planning, always wanting to be bigger than you are. Thinking of something wrong and you're going to correct it. You have arrogance and belligerency. But you don't believe your true nature, and this is because your mind again has gone out into the world instead of you letting your mind rest in your heart. Here's another example. Imagine if you will a man going into the sun. And the sun is 140 degrees. Now the sun and the heat represents your mind going out into the world. You start to burn, you see a shade tree. You run underneath the shade tree and you feel comfortable, relaxed and peaceful and happy. But, after a while you forget about that and you want some more sun. So you go back out into the sun. And you're burning and sweating again. This is equivalent to you setting out your mind into the world and getting caught up in the world's events. Getting caught up in your personal problems, believing your life is important as it is. But, then you see the shade tree again and you remember how good that felt and so you go back into the shade tree and you sit beneath it, and you feel cool again, refreshed and calm and happy. But, only a fool and asshole would go back into the sun and burn and then go back into the shade and be calm. And then go out into the sun and burn. Only a fool would do that. The wise person would stand under the tree and be calm and cool. Now let's take a look at your life. How many problems do you think you have? Do you believe anything is wrong with your life because you want more of something that you're not getting? The only reason you think you have a problem is because the world is not turning the way that you want. It's wrong identification. You have to begin to identify with consciousness, with absolute reality, and not with your everyday affairs. So how do you attain happiness? How do you keep your mind from going out? Simple. You do not react to anything. You do not think further than your nose. You do not allow your thoughts to grab hold of you and tell you anything. Even if it appears right. When you see a situation good or bad, you do not react. If you win the lottery and you win 40 million dollars, you do not react. But you realize it will bring its own effects. We live in a world of duality. For every good there's a bad. For every bad there's a good. For every up there's a down. This is the way of the world. If you come into extreme what you call good, you will have to experience the equivalent which is bad, which you call bad. In reality there is no good and there is no bad. But, your mind makes it so. So the first step is, you do not react, 
you become the witness of the world unfolding. You realize that everything is the self and I am that. You witness everything in the world but you do not get involved. When I say you do not get involved, I don't mean you just stay home and sit in the bathtub and do nothing. I mean your body came to this earth to do something. And your body is under its own laws of karma. But, for whom does karma exist for you, or for your body? Only for your body. Therefore, if you identify with your body you suffer. If you identify with yourself, which is consciousness, you are always happy. Now if that gets difficult for you, you practice Atmavachara self-inquiry. When your mind starts thinking, 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 thinking about good and bad, you simply ask the question, to whom do these thoughts come? You do not answer, you simply pose the question to yourself. Everything happens within yourself. To whom do these thoughts come? The answer will eventually come to you. These thoughts come to me. I think them. I think them? I do. Who is this I? Well, what is the source of the I? You hold on to the I, but you do not concentrate on the I, you concentrate on the source. Well, what is the source of the I? Where it seems that all of my problems are attached to I. Where I say, I feel bad. I feel upset. I feel angry. I feel cheated. I feel emotional, or even I feel good. I feel happy, that's human happiness. You feel happy because somebody gave you something you like or somebody did something for you. That's just as bad as feeling depressed. I feel this and I feel that, I feel that I am a Johnny, I feel that I am not a Johnny, I feel all kinds of things. But, there's always I I I. If you investigate, you will find that everything is attached to the I. And if you get rid of the I, all of your problems, the whole world, the whole universe, God and everything related to it will disappear. And the source will be your true self which is pure consciousness, ultimate oneness, nirvana, emptiness. This is your true self. And you will look at the world as yourself. You will still see the world but you will see it differently. Nothing will ever upset you again. For you will realize that the world is yourself. How can you be upset at yourself? You have become an embodiment of divine love, bliss, pure intelligence, ultimate awareness, sat Chitananda, para Brahman, that is omnipresence. So how can you be angry or upset over anything if you are pure consciousness? You just cannot. Do you see what I'm saying? If you learn to identify yourself with consciousness, you will always be happy. If you keep identifying with world conditions or with your body or your mind, you will be miserable and you'll have short spurts of happiness when things go your way. But, then you will not trust people. You will be suspicious of everybody's motives and you will feel that there's something wrong. If you want to know whether you're a Johnny or not, ask yourself, when was the last time I saw something wrong? When was the last time something wasn't right when I had a bad thought when I believed somebody was doing something to me, or when I became angry, and that will give you a good inclination where you're coming from. What you see in yourself you see in everyone else. If you're self-realized, then you know yourself as omnipresence, and you can only see love, peace, harmony and happiness in everybody. The choice is yours. The only freedom you've got on this planet, in this universe, is to make the choice to go within and not to react to any condition. Everything else about you is preordained. Everything else about you is parabtic karma. Even when I lift my hand like this it's karmic. But, what have I got to do with my hand? I am not my hand, I am not my body, I am not my mind, I am that I am. Absolute awareness, pure intelligence, absolute reality, parabrahman nirvana. I am spaceless, I am birthless, I am deathless. 
Water cannot drown me and fire cannot burn me. That is my true nature. Find your true nature, my friends, and you'll always be happy. Um, Shanti. Now let's do a little chanting, and then we'll eat and our friend Rahul will play for us. Rahul is a great musician. I'm honored he's come today to play with us in this game called Life Before We Eat. Pause for music and eating, then Robert continues. Robert, about what I was talking about or anything else you'd like to talk about. SB, so if consciousness is all there is and that's our real nature, so this ego is the refusal of that, a non-acceptance. And the whole structure seems to be a refusal, a defending against this nothingness or this everythingness that consciousness is. Robert, yes but let me ask you, for whom is the refusal? Who refuses? SB, the ego. Get rid of the ego and the refusal will stop. Ask yourself, to whom does the ego come? And you will realize that you never had an ego, that it does not exist. SB, so ever since we were born, we're getting education that there is an ego, education is always to the ego. Robert, speak for yourself. I mean, the whole educational system in the whole of the Western world is presuming that there is this ego that needs to be educated. Robert, well never mind about the Western world, what do you think? Leave the world alone. SB, I think I've been ruined by society. Laughter. Maybe I wanted to know. Forget about that, leave the world alone. There's a greater power than you that knows how to take care of the world. Concentrate on yourself. If you understand who you are, you will understand what the world is too. And you will love the world as Brahman, as the self. SK, is it more helpful to take responsibility in that way? By acknowledging that we duped ourselves and to go on from there? Robert, do not dwell too much on the negative. Concentrate on the source which is absolute reality, pure consciousness. SK, sort of like going either way, whether we duped ourselves or the world duped us, it doesn't matter, just let go. Robert, forget about that, realize all that is attached to your personal eye. And follow the eye to the source. We will become your true self. At that time everything will take care of itself and there will be no question about that at all. SB, Robert, if consciousness is all there is and we are that and that has to be the case every moment, so in every moment the ego lives this separative consciousness, a separative ego is always created and imposing itself upon pure consciousness. Robert, why do you worry about how the ego is being created? You have no ego. Realize that you are egoless. That you are absolute intelligence. And your true nature is shining forth from you right now. Focus on that part. Remove the negatives by not thinking of them. As soon as they begin to come to you, do not react to them, do not fight them, ignore them or witness them. As they become too much for you ask, to whom do they come? and you'll get right back to the eye, and you follow the eye to the source until it demolishes itself and disappears and annihilates itself. And only absolute reality will be left. Only consciousness will be left. So do not focus too long on the other. You leave the negatives alone, just follow the eye. Because all the problems, all the negatives are attached to the eye. Get rid of the eye, and everything else will go with it, then you'll be free. SB, most people when they sit quietly, then they feel this emptiness, a great fear arises in them, then they refuse that, then they run away from that. Robert, we'll let them run away and let them do what they want, but what are you going to do? Well, I realize that that's what I've been doing. Robert, ask. To whom does the fear come? Fear of what? Ask yourself, why do I have this fear? Who is this fear? I do, who am I? 
Where does this I come from? Who is this fear? Hold on to the I with all your might, like you're holding on to a rope. And follow it down to the source, and then let go. And become the source, merge with the source of your existence. Then you will realize that you've never existed, and you will never exist. You are just pure being, absolute reality, the self. Don't worry about the others that'll take care of itself. SB, when you say, hold on to the I, and when I try to hold on to the I, I only find memory. I only find the feeling of memory even if there's no thoughts there's still this feeling of me. This feeling is a presumption of this familiarity of memory. Robert, then you have to ask yourself again, to whom does this memory come? Who feels this way? And you go back to I again. Everything is around the I. Everything is attached to the I. Memory, fears, frustrations, anger, past lives, everything has to do with the I. As soon as you dissolve the I, there's no karma, there are no past lives, there is no judgment, there's no God, there's no retribution, there's no self, there's no realization, there's only consciousness. As I, it seems to me that you have to in the beginning, since because I don't have any idea what consciousness is and I can't identify with emptiness, that I have to believe this to begin with. I mean I don't know do I? The what I have to do is believe that this is so. Robert, you should believe nothing that I say. I may be telling you a lie, why should you believe me at all? But, what you should do is to experiment with yourself. The factory of experimentation is within you. Work on yourself, find out for yourself and see what happens. Practice on yourself. Do not believe anything, but practice on yourself and find out what happens, see what happens. Then you will know, the Guru God Consciousness are all within you. You are that. Check it out, find out for yourself. Teach, what are you looking at? Robert, who? You, your eyes are very set, they're looking outward. Robert, I'm not looking at anything. S-H, no. There's nothing to look at. S-H, that sounds peaceful. There's just space, empty space. S-H, you're looking into nothingness. I'm looking into myself and I see you. S-H, yeah. That's your illusion. Laughter. But I see you as the self. I see you as me. S-H, oh that's okay. Do you like that? S-H, yeah I admire that. Robert, okay let's eat. Laughter is at this point, the tape ends. Transcript 28. Satsing. 2nd December 1990. Robert, it's good to be with you again. As long as you believe you are the body-mind phenomena, you're going to have problems and that's that. I don't care what kind of problems you may think you have, it makes no difference how severe, as long as you believe you are the body-mind phenomena, you're going to have problems. You may feel justified in having problems. You may feel it's not your fault. You may feel it's karmic. You may feel all kinds of things, but as long as you believe where you feel the body-mind, you will have problems, because this is the kind of world in which we live. A world that doesn't exist, seems real to most of us. And if we believe we are the body-mind then we believe the world is real, and we believe we have to pray to God for solutions. We do all these things and we still suffer. And suffering will only stop, not when God answers your prayers, but when you awaken to the truth of your own being. Then you're born again, so to speak, in a new reality and all is well. But you may say to me, but Robert sometimes you appear to have problems too. Your car may blow up which it does all the time, or your physical body doesn't feel too good or something is going on. My question to you is this, who sees this? There has to be a seer and an object. 
You've seen yourself. When you catch on to your awakening, the world does not change. You just see it differently. That's all. You acquire a feeling of immortality, a feeling of divine bliss, so to speak, where things no longer have the power to affect you. In other words, in the state of enlightenment, cause and effect does not exist for you. But those who are living in the world are going through their karma, and they're beholding themselves everywhere they look. For the world, remember, is only a projection of your mind. Now, what kind of a projection is it? It depends on your state, where you're coming from. We're all looking at the world, and we see something different. All we're seeing is ourselves. There are no problems. None exist. None will ever exist. The only problem that exists is what? Who can tell me? S. E. Kuwait. Students laugh. Robert, you're close. What do I always say? Why does a problem exist? It has to do with your nose. S. K. Not to let your thoughts go past your nose, right? Robert, that's right. You're allowing your thoughts to go past your nose. That is the only reason you have a problem. If you catch yourself quick before it gets past your nose, where is the problem? Problem is in your thought, only in your thought. When your mind slows down, when the thinking process slows down, where is the problem? It doesn't exist. But if you allow the thoughts to go past your nose, then there are all kinds of problems that you come up with. You believe this is wrong, and this is not right, and this is hurting me, and you become doubtful, suspicious, and apprehensive, and fearful, and so forth, because you're thinking. You may say, "How can you exist without thinking?" Quite well, thank you. Students laugh. The trees do not have to think. The grass does not have to think. The world does not have to think of itself. Everything is taken care of. There's a power that knows how to take care of everything, and will also take care of your body, so-called, if you stop thinking. But as long as you think, I am the body, then you have to take care of your body and watch it, and feed it aspirin and cold remedies and proper foods, and do all kinds of strange things with your body. But your body and your mind are not your friend. They come under a law of their own. Did your body ask you today, this morning, it was time to get up? You got up. Did it ask your permission? It does what it wants. You have nothing to do with the body or the mind. When you become depressed, does your mind ask you if it can become depressed? It does what it wants. When you become fearful, does your mind ask your permission? It does what it wants. When your body catches a cold, does it ask you if it can catch a cold? It does what it wants. But what have you got to do with those things? A lady called me this morning from Santa Cruz, and she asked me, "How long do I have to come to Satsang before I become self-realized?" Though I told her before I answer, let me ask you, what do you mean by I, and what do you mean by Satsang? And she hung up. I wonder why she did that, but it's something we can talk about, or I can talk about, since I have nothing else to do. How long do I have to come to Satsang? I. How long does I have to come to Satsang? Does I need to come to Satsang? What is this elusive I? What does it mean? How long does I have to come to Satsang? The reason you would call it I is because you misinterpreted the I. You identify the I with the body. So you're saying, "How long do I have to come to satsang?" Then, what is satsang? That means being, being with the self. Therefore, I and satsang are the same thing. What this means is satsang is your everyday experience. It's not a place you go to. It's how you live your life. I mix the separation where there is no separation. There's one whole, and you are that. But as long as you are separating I from yourself, then you always question. I feel sick. I feel happy. 
I feel depressed. I feel out of sorts. Who is this I? Where did it come from? How does it originate? What is its source? Find out. Dive deep within and find out where the I came from. A good way to do this is before you go to sleep say to yourself, I'm going to find my I when I get up this morning. Just before you wake up, before you start thinking the I presents itself as I am, as pure consciousness. Catch it then. That's the best time to catch it. As soon as you awaken in the morning, in that split second before you wake up and start thinking, before the thoughts come of the world, that is the time to catch the I am, the absolute reality. For at that moment this is exactly what you are pure awareness. And then a thought comes and covers it up. So remember this. If you ask yourself when you go to sleep, you tell yourself, Tomorrow morning as soon as I open my eyes I am going to identify with my source I am, and you will. Even if for a second it will change your life. As you keep on doing this every morning, every morning, every morning, the time between your awakening and the thought coming to you will become larger that space will expand and expand and expand until you are able to stay in the awareness. Of course at that time, there will no longer be a you. There will only be the awareness. Try it, you have to investigate. You have to intelligently dive deep within yourself and find the source of your I. Do not accept your feelings. Do not accept your thoughts. Do not watch yourself feeling miserable, and you do nothing about it or you can become the witness to it. That will help too. But, it's better to ask, why am I feeling miserable? And realize that you said why am I, feeling miserable. I, I'm identifying with my body as I. Again, a mistake. I in itself is pure harmony, joy, happiness. But, when you identify the I with your body-mind, it becomes the personal I which doesn't even exist. But, you're making it exist. You're identifying with it. Why do you want to identify with your personal I? Your personal I never existed. Why have you befriended it? Why do you keep giving it power? Why do you make it grow? Take your power back. Expose yourself. The real you and forget all this nonsense about a mind and a body and thoughts and the world and God and everything else that appears to be real. Compare yourself with no one. Be true to yourself. Never mind how much progress somebody else is making. Forget about saints and sages and other people. You are the only one that ever existed and there is no one but you. You are all the saints and the sages and the seers. You are everything. Everything is the self and you are that. Why not awaken to this? Why do you want to play games with yourself so long? By believing in reincarnation that you have to come back again and again and again and hoping to have a better life next time. There is no better life. As long as you are born of the flesh you have to suffer. This is the way of the flesh. Do not try to improve your life. You're making a big mistake. For there is no question about it, if you use positive thinking and use your mind, you may appear to improve your life. But. Remember this world in which you live, is a world of duality. For every up there is a down. For every forward there is a backward. For every good there is a bad. Therefore whatever improvement comes into your life it will last for a while, then will subside, and then you'll become miserable again. Then you will be happy again when you get what you want, and then that won't last and then you will be miserable again. You'll start sticking up for your rights and fighting for your survival. Then as you get what you want, you'll be happy again. You're like a yo-yo. You go up and down, up and down, and no matter how much I talk to you about these things, you're going to keep on doing it. So why am I talking? I don't know. I have no choice. You know, I never asked to do this. 
Strange how things turn out. Laughter. S H. Too late now. Laughter. Robert. All I know is that all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. All I know is that happiness is your true nature, that you are not what you appear to be and things are not what they appear to be. Nothing can ever happen to you. Why do you worry so much? What are you afraid of? Your life? You have no life. What you call your life is nothing. It doesn't exist. It's no thing. You worry about your hair falling out. Laughter. You worry about needing a new pair of shoes. You're getting fat. What a waste of energy. Like feeding a dead horse. We're all going to wind up in the cemetery. So what difference does it make what you do? Last week I was talking to a bodybuilder and he was telling me about his muscles. And what he does for this muscle, and what he does for that muscle, and how well he eats. So I told him, that's great, you'll be the healthiest man in the cemetery. Laughter. And that's about the gist of it, why not use your energy for constructive purposes? Now this does not have to mean that you ignore your body. Your body will always take care of itself. As a matter of fact, the more you practice your sadhana, or realizing your true identity, your body will be able to take better care of itself than you were ever able to take care of it, because it comes under a different law. It knows what to do. It will do whatever it came to this world to do, but it has absolutely nothing to do with you. When will you wake up to that fact? Stop thinking about yourself so much about getting a new job, about losing your job, about working or not working. No one is ever happy. Those people who work are miserable because they have to work. Those people who don't work are miserable because they can't find a job. And when they find a job, they join the miserable ones who can't stand the job. Where is peace? Peace is your real nature. It's within you. It is you. Look for it and you'll find it. Seek and ye shall find. Whatever you identify with, that's what you become. Therefore stop identifying with worldly things. Identify with yourself. Now how do you do this? It begins in the morning as I told you before. That's the time when your mind has been free because you've slept, you've had a semblance of peace. Being in deep sleep is an unconscious method of self-realization. You realize when you are asleep, but you are unconscious so you're not aware of it. You want to be consciously asleep. When you're consciously asleep you're awake. You're awake to yourself, to reality, to what is, to I am. When you get up in the morning, immediately before the thoughts come identify with the self. Now how do you do this? Simply say to yourself, I, I. That's all you've got to do, I, I. You're doing this before the thoughts come. Maybe in the beginning you can only do this for a couple of seconds, but that's good. Even those couple of seconds will make your day fulfilled, and you'll feel happy during the day. As time passes, as I explained before, the space will widen and you'll be able to remain longer periods in I, 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 I. Now when thoughts come simply ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? They come to me. And you hold on to the me. You do not let go. But, do not concentrate on the me, you just hold on to the me. You concentrate on the source of me like you're holding on to a rope, and you're going to its source and you let go. Letting go is the source. Total awareness. Absolute reality, I am that I am. Do not try to analyze this. Just allow it to be. As you keep doing this every morning, either watching the eye or asking, to whom do the thoughts come? You will notice a subtle change is taking place in your life. The first change you will see as you develop a semblance of peace which you never had before. You'll just not be disturbed by anything and you'll be surprised at yourself. You'll notice the things that used to make you angry no longer have the power to do that. 
you'll notice that the things you feared, for instance depression, recession, loss of memory, whatever your wife ran away with the milkman, maybe that's a good sign, but these things will no longer disturb you. You'll just feel good. You'll feel good all over. And that will turn into pure happiness. You're just happy for no reason. Can you imagine what it feels like just to be happy without interruption for no reason? It has absolutely nothing to do with the world. It doesn't mean you'll go round laughing hysterically all the time. It means you just feel happy. You hear about the war in Iraq and you're happy. There's no war in Iraq, you're still happy. You work, you're happy. You don't work, you're happy. You have possessions, you're happy. You don't have possessions, you're happy. In other words, it makes no difference what the world may seem to bring to you. You are no longer identifying with the world and its objects. You're seeing the world as yourself, or you're beginning to slowly, but surely. Everything begins to take on a projection of yourself. And since you are beginning to discover that you are pure consciousness, the world starts becoming pure consciousness also. It's like going to a movie and the screen is pure consciousness, the images are the world. Prior to your awakening you've been identifying with the images and you have no idea there's a screen. Oh you know it's somewhere in your mind there's a slight image of the screen, but you don't think of that because the images are very entertaining. You watch a love movie or a war movie or this kind of movie or that kind of movie and you get all wrapped up in the objects. But, of course, if you try to go up to the screen to grab any object, you're going to grab the screen. This is what happens when you awaken. You realize that you are the screen which is consciousness. And you realize that everything in the world, everything, the whole universe including God, is superimposed on you. It's not reality, it's a superimposition. But, you identify with the screen, which is consciousness, and you tolerate the superimposition. Yet you realize it's not you. You have nothing to do with it, and you do not identify with it. So in the same instance your body goes through all kinds of experiences, good and bad, and in between, but you are always aware that you are not the body and no body exists for you. You know in reality there is no superimposition at all. It does not exist. It appears to exist but it does not. It's like hypnosis. You're hypnotized to believe a white poodle is following you. And sure enough when you wake up out of the hypnosis, you keep looking back, you will actually see a white poodle. Your mind will actually picture the white poodle and you will believe it's real. Nobody else will see it, but you will, until the hypnosis wears off. In the same way we see people, places and things and they appear so real to us. We identify with them and we suffer accordingly. But, as you practice every morning, catching yourself between waking up and thoughts coming, little by little, slowly, but surely, you will begin to realize yourself more and more. And the day will come when you awaken. Never mind how long it takes. Do not look at time. Think of how long it takes you to be what you are now. Be yourself. Identify with your reality. Try to be by yourself at times. Be aware that the world is egoless. The world has no cause, so where is the effect? If there is no effect, if there is no cause. How could the world have a cause? Where would it come from? When you dream you can say that your dream has a cause. You are the cause because you're dreaming. But can you say that while you're dreaming? While you're dreaming and you're in the dream, you believe that the world has a cause like everyone else does. And you get involved in everyday activities in the dream. You have good experiences and you have bad experiences. And then I come along and I tell you you're dreaming. But you don't believe me. You say, I'll show you if I'm dreaming Robert, and you pinch me. And I say, oh. And you say, see, is that a dream? 
and I try to explain to you it's a dream pinch, but you don't believe it, you think it's real. Then you go across the street, and then you're walking down the street, and a car hits you, and you're bleeding all over the street. I run over and I tell you, you're dreaming, don't be too upset. It's okay. And you start cursing at me and shaking your fist at me. How can you say that? Look, I'm bleeding all over the place. Then something funny happens. You wake up. Where does the dream go? Where did the blood go? Where did the car that hit you go? Think of your personal experiences that are upsetting you right now. Think of the problems that you think you have even while I'm talking to you. Some of your minds are thinking of something else, problems, and you believe it's real. You're thinking of who you like, who you don't like, what you're going to eat for dinner tonight. All these thoughts come to you because you have not trained yourself how to deal with your thoughts, and you've got preconceived ideas. You've got concepts. As an example, you come and you look at me. You don't see me fresh and new like you see yourself, but you compare me with Krishna Merdi, or with this guy, or with Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi, or Nisargadaita, or the garbage cleaner, or with the janitor, or whoever you wish to compare me with. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Your mind becomes filled with preconceived ideas. I'm really nobody. I am nothing special. Though what you see in me is not real. You're seeing your own projections. You're seeing yourself in other words. And if you have not developed yourself and have awakened to pure consciousness, then you're seeing something worldly. And you make comparisons. You say I like. I don't like. It's good. It's bad and so forth. You've got to take control of your mind. You've got to realize your mind and your body are not your friend. They feed you the wrong information. They appear right for a while, but then, it becomes wrong again. Do not listen to your mind. Stop the thoughts before they get to the edge of your nose. That's all I've got to say. Tape break then Robert continues. Robert, a postcard from Andy Kingcart. It's an interesting card. He used to come to our classes when we were in Jeff's house. Would you like to read it? Mary, Robert, you just came to mind simultaneously the feeling of a tensionless openness as I gazed out the window at the smog-shrouded city of Taeyang below. The multifaceted pollution of Taiwan often feels like an instruction to desire to be better comes to the fore. The body-mind feels dense but I know it is just a passing cloud. Nothing changes the space. I have been reading, I am that daily, often letting go of the message the words contain to get a gradual nebulous glimpse of Maharad's vision. Whether I like it or not my ship is burning, inevitably my ship of dreams. Richard Walker spoke to me about the foreknown truth that you've related to him. It all seemed clear when he stated them. But, perhaps if you could write to me about them, they could serve an important purpose. I share this only with you in spirit always. Robert, so whoever has a tape on the four principles, would you make a copy so I can send it to him in Taiwan? I'll start reminding you about our Christmas dinner and the celebration of Ramana Maharshi's birthday which is December 30th. We're going to combine them both. So remember it's December the 30th. As I mentioned to some of you before everybody got here, People are calling me and asking me when the Thanksgiving dinner is going to be. Students laugh. Though it's December 30th for Christmas. Okay, are there any other questions you'd like to ask about anything? SR, you said one time that as long as there is a feeling, there is somebody feeling it, like I'm feeling emotions right now. So that is the sense of what the I is. It's like those things are rising that you sort of take credit for whether it's an emotion or a thought or a body feeling. Robert, that's the personal I. Right. Robert, and all the feelings and all the emotions are attached to the personal I. When you get rid of the personal I, everything else goes. 
Therefore the proper method is not trying to change your feelings or change your emotions, but rather to realize that I is experiencing my emotions and my feelings. And you follow I to the source. When you get to the source of I, the feelings and the emotions will both subside. SR, I see that as kind of an addiction. Laughs. That's what I want to be, I want to be those feelings and body sensations and all that, and it really causes me to hurt the mind that belongs to myself. Robert, do you want to be the human emotions, the human feelings? Well I thought I did until I faced that. Now I see that emptiness is so much better. Robert, see that's something interesting you said, emptiness seems so much better. Now that sounds strange to most people. How can emptiness be better than human love or human happiness? Again there are no words to describe it because it's ineffable. You have to realize what emptiness really means. Emptiness means that no thing exists in it, no human concept, no human feeling, no human entity. Where there is total emptiness, there is absolute reality. An absolute reality is total bliss, happiness and joy. And it's omnipresence. Though you not only feel it personally, but you have become the whole universe and you see it wherever you look and you hear it wherever you listen. Somebody else may be expressing some inharmony or some depression, man's inhumanity to man may still appear to be going on, yet you are seeing yourself because you have become omnipresence, and wherever you look there's the self. And the self is pure consciousness and not you, so you see that everywhere you look, that transcends all the feelings, that is something you have to experience for yourself. The one who used to feel it has been destroyed, annihilated. Therefore, there are no feelings and no sensations. But, there is unalloyed happiness, absolute reality which is beyond human explanation, for the finite can never comprehend the infinite. There are no words to make you know how you feel. Experience it for yourself and find out. SR, sort of like you don't really know that there is anything beyond until the experience really happens. Robert, that's right. And you can't really get it any other way. Robert, that's right. It's gotta happen. If it doesn't happen you'll never know. SR, someone asked are you willing to sacrifice forms of love for another to be willing to experience this, in other words give up the feelings as two separate entities when the love seems to come from the outside and it's a real challenge to even consider. Robert, well that's a wrong phraseology because you do not give up anything really. SR, maybe I'm not remembering, but the effect with me was a re-see everything kind of. Robert, well what I'm trying to say is, do not think you have to give up anything. You gain there's nothing you really give up. You just see it differently. It doesn't mean that if you're in love with somebody of the opposite sex, or the same sex whatever you prefer, that you're going to have to give somebody up. Your love will just be different. You will be more open, more omnipresent, deeper. Though you really don't give anything up, you just see it differently. You react to it completely differently. All jealousy is gone, fear is gone, emotion is gone. You no longer think of thoughts like, what if she leaves me, or what if he leaves me? What will happen then? All that is gone because you become consciousness, and you're just happy all the time and no one can ever take it away whatever they do. They can stab you, they can cut off your head. They can take away your house or your car. But, your happiness does not go away. Your happiness remains. It has nothing to do with things. So what do you think about all this? Is it worth the effort? Some people tell me I guess I just have to have a lot of faith, that's not true. As you begin to work on yourself, you see almost immediate results. As I mentioned before, your humanhood does improve in many ways, for you're no longer attending to it. 
and when you no longer attend to your humanhood, universal law comes into play. It takes care of you better than you can ever take care of yourself. Though you do see human results. And as you see results of course, it makes you jump in deeper. Until the day comes when you awaken completely and become free. Well, if you don't want to say anything, I'll play some more music. Anyone want to speak about anything or whatever or you can go to hell, whatever you feel like. SG, Robert there is something that I notice I'm aware of. As I really contemplate the truth again, I let projects that I'm very interested in doing kind of slip. Which is definitely all right except that I have great joy when I finish that project and it's manifested in a way from my past experiences, it brings me a certain amount of human pleasure. But, I get into a dilemma if I may end up just letting it slide and slide which may be called procrastination through lack of ego energy behind it, to see it through. It's a kind of a dilemma. Robert, well of course that's a human problem and I'm not really too interested in those problems because they don't exist. But, I will tell you again. If you work on yourself and you question yourself, who has these feelings? To whom do they come? And realize, I do now, that's the personal I. Follow the I thread to the source, and while you're doing those things every day the outer life will change. And you'll find the procrastination going away. If it's supposed to, or it may get worse and you'll give up the project, but something will give. Which will make you happier than you've ever been before. But, as you practice self-inquiry, things will happen to improve your humanhood, and your situation. There is a law of the universe again, that knows how to take care of every detail of your body. Karmically you came here as a body which doesn't exist. As long as you believe it does, your body came here for a specific reason. And you're going to go through that whatever it is. You don't have to think about it, you don't have to want it, you don't have to desire it. Your body will go through whatever purpose it came here to go through. Therefore center yourself on the I. Follow the I to the source and become free. Again, everything else will take of itself. I know it's difficult to understand and to realize, if I don't take care of my needs and my wants and my desires, who will? That's wrong thinking. We've been brought up to believe unless I do it it will not be done, that's erroneous. Grab a hold of that I, who has to do it and see who that I really is. It is the I that has identified with the work. When you remove the I from the work, then you become yourself and the work gets done better. Without any thought. Try it, it works. S.A. Robert, it seems to me what you're saying is that we can have our cake and eat it too. Robert, why not? It doesn't seem to work that way. Because we talked about that before about creativity and imagination, and again and again it seems to me that in order to accomplish anything, there has to be this desire. And although you say, and I know your answer, you say that you don't have to give it up, you say continue with it, you say that detachment will get you to a higher level. But in actual fact it doesn't seem to work that way. It seems that the only way to accomplish anything is to allow the desire to be kindled and to allow it to flame. Robert, okay I've heard what you said Arnold you said, it seems to me. Who is this me? Get rid of this me and see if you have the same attitude. When the me is gotten out of the way, that kind of a question would not arise. But, your work will go on even better than it did before. But get yourself out of the way your small self and see what happens. That's all you've got to do. Just watch. In a calm gentle way, get yourself out of the way. The me. S.A. Why should we want to persist with this if we accept that the teaching is true and that the reality is beyond projected world? Why bother with these things? Robert, because who accepts? Your ego and it is still your ego that's playing games with you. And your ego accepts and rejects. 
What would happen if there were no ego? You would have unalloyed happiness. And that question wouldn't come up. But you have to find out for yourself. I can lead you to the vein of gold, but you've got to do the digging for yourself. And if you work on it and see it for yourself, what will happen? You'll see what I'm saying is correct. You have to investigate sincerely. Dive deep within yourself. Awaken and then that's it. SX student asks about karma being a theater. And yet the theater exists without any apropos. It would have existed anyway. Robert, yes, it does. For your karma, so to speak, which does not exist, but you think it does, takes care of all that. Everything has been preordained before you came here. Whatever your body's supposed to do, it's going to do and whatever you're not supposed to do, you will not be able to do no matter how hard you try. The why fight? SX, the will, always responds to the will of the ego. Robert, yes, to whom comes the will? To the ego. If there is no ego there would be no will. The will is part of the ego. When the will goes everything else goes. SX, you speak of the personal I versus an impersonal I? Robert, the personal I is the ego and the will same thing. SX, and the impersonal I? Is God or yourself? The Absolute. SX, the Absolute. P. Robert, the Absolute. The real I is the same as pure intelligence, absolute reality. When you think of the real I, it's omnipresence, it's not personal. The I is the whole universe, everything. I am that. All this is the self and I am that. Seth, is there another way of saying the same thing that the personal I is that which identifies with whatever it identifies with, and the impersonal one is that which doesn't identify with anything? Robert, sure you can say that if you like. You can say anything you like just get rid of it. Laughter. S.E. Robert, I know there are a lot of Johnny types in this room, but I wish we had more chanting. Chanting is good. I went to the Hare Krishna temple last night. Great, fantastic chanting. Robert, I didn't bring the chanting tape tonight. Some people tell me they hate to chant. Students laugh. Some people love to chant. What am I going to do? S.E. Have chanting. Robert, I have to do what comes so sometimes we have chanting, sometimes we don't. But if you feel funny about those things, either for or against, ask yourself, why do I feel this way? To whom does this feeling come? And again you get back to the personal I. When you find the source of the personal I, all these needs and wants and likes and dislikes will disappear. And you'll be free. S.U. I was just wondering, if there is no God, why are we chanting, Oh God beautiful? Robert, it makes you mellow. Well, don't believe it or disbelieve it. Do you believe you're the body? S.U. Unfortunately, yes. Then there's a personal God. Don't you see, as long as you are the body, there's also God. You have created your God in your image. But, you believe in the body so there is a God, you should. You just can't say I don't believe. It's just like I say, karma doesn't exist. Reincarnation doesn't exist. The universe doesn't exist, the world doesn't exist, God doesn't exist. But as long as you feel or you identify with the body-mind phenomena, all those things do exist for you. Though you've got to pay homage to the god of karma, ish, Pharaoh, or maybe you'd like to call god Jehovah. Whatever you like to call god. It is real, because the body is real. When the body image falls away from your mind and your mind falls away, everything else goes with it. So don't fool yourself. It's not what you want. You can't say to yourself, I believe this and I don't believe that. Those are just dry words. 
It makes no difference what you believe or you don't believe. It's what you are which determines what happens to you. When you quiet your mind, your body and your mind will both disappear. So try to keep your mind quiet, keep it from thinking and everything will take care of itself. So as long as we believe that we are the body chanting music, makes you one-pointed. It mellows you out and makes you calm and cool and peaceful. Remember music soothes the savage beast. SG, just on the subject of music, say that you do have a great love of music and precondition would say you're a good performer. Just sitting in front of a piano without ambition or discipline, you would never achieve anything. There has to be some discipline and ambition to extend. I know I'm speaking for myself. Robert, at a human level you're right that's what I'm saying. As long as you believe you're the body-mind phenomena, what you're saying is real. True. S.G., well this vacant self can sit in front of a piano and I don't know what would happen. Laughter. Nothing in particular would happen. I know that you hear it within yourself. All of the wonderful conversations that your mind creates your outward expression through them. Robert, well first become yourself and then tell me what the vacant self is doing. Become yourself first and see if you want to play the piano. S.G., I just think that this is a dilemma that not only I feel, but this gentleman over here the idea that's. Robert, which gentleman is that? Laughter. I was thinking how I, and Ed, discovered Yogananda, and yoga, when I was like 17 or 18. And I got very involved in it, and then I reached a crucial point where my ambition was starting to come forth, but I knew what the truth was, but I felt I hadn't been able to decide. And I took up the Nathaniel Hill type thing. Where you have to rev up your engine of desire and focus in it and go after it, and which I did. And it brought a certain amount of. Robert, of course it would. Success. Robert, humanly it would. Yes, humanly, and I kept wanting that the rewards of the spiritual pursuit would match those that, however temporary they were, that I could achieve in the unreal world. Robert, look what you're saying though, you're saying I want this and I want that. S.G., right. Who wants and who has to have? S.G., I don't know. Find out. Laughter. Yogananda was Yogananda. You're talking about Yogananda, he's a great person, but remember he was not a Johnny. He did not teach the path of Jhana Marga. That's a different path completely, but it's a beautiful path if you want to go on that path. St. What does this jhana mean? Robert. It means knowledge, absolute knowledge. Oh, I see, I see now. Robert. Johnny. Pronounced Yanni Johnny with a G? Robert. Depends from what part of India you come from. S.G. Do you realize how tough though it is for a person who is ambitious? Students laugh. You're still trying to burn up your samskaras. Robert, you have to weigh all the factors, you have to see what's going on. If you just realize that all of your ambitions will fall by the wayside soon because you will get too old to be able to practice anymore, and you'll be in a wheelchair. SG. I can have a lobotomy if it makes me move on. Laughter. Robert, you can if you like, but when you have a lobotomy, everything goes dumb. But, here you're becoming more conscious, you're becoming your conscious self, you're finding out who you really are. But look at it this way. Does what you call God want to play the piano? Does God have to have a profession? S.G., no, no, nothing like that. So when you become that yourself, you will see who needs the rest. S.G., you know I do understand what you're saying, and I know it's the truth, it is just in those moments like Wednesday or what not, where I start looking back at the new year, thinking that if I haven't given this to really seeing that this thing that I'm doing, 
will never be manifested. Robert, as long as you're coming where you're coming from, you better get it done. You're right. But, while you're practicing your profession also practice this. SG, yeah. And see what happens. I'm not saying you have to give up anything. SG, yeah, who is to think that you could even combine the two? Practice what I tell you and then see what happens. But keep up your profession. Don't give up anything. And you'll see for yourself. You have to investigate within yourself. As I tell you every once in a while, do not believe me, why should you accept what I say? I may be a blabbering idiot. Don't accept anything I say, but find out for yourself. Experiment with yourself and see for yourself what happens. SU, student talks about practicing and doing while being human. Robert, as a human being you have to have all those things of course. SU, two students try to explain what should be done in this case. Robert, see you don't know, remember it's the Ajani that asks the question so you're coming from your viewpoint. But, practice the teaching and find out for yourself what happens and you'll be surprised. SD, a student of Maharshi asked whether to give up her studies at university and just do sadhana, and he said, your studies are for the mind and sadhana is for the mind so why do you separate them? Robert, yes exactly, there's no separation whatsoever. Your studies and anything you do is part of yourself. How can you separate yourself? You cannot. SR, you sort of think there's a reality other than what's happening here. The same questions come up. Robert. Yes. There really is no other other than the self. Robert. This is it. Students laugh. Except if you're suffering you're just not perceiving it rightly. But this is all you get. There's nothing else. But what is that I'm talking about? The it is absolute reality sat chit ananda, I am that I am. That's it. But, if you want to see something else what can I do? Note, short break in tape. Robert, is there anything to do when you awaken? Is there anything to do? SH, to bring about awakening? To bring about awakening? Is that what you asked me? SH, yeah. Robert, no, consciousness is self-contained. It is the power that knows itself. And it knows itself as that I am. When you're experiencing consciousness, everything else disappears, then you live spontaneously. You do what you have to do at the time and then go on to something else. And as I said before, the body will continue doing whatever it came here to do. But, you will not be the doer. You will realize that I am not the doer. I am consciousness. That type of awakening will come to you and everything will take of itself so you don't have to worry about a thing. Be free and happy now. Do not concern yourself over those things. Realize your true identity and be done with it. SV having to do with the gentleman's question. The question very often comes up as we have chosen the limited self. Robert, it hasn't. Yeah, I can't conceive of that because freedom can't exist whenever necessity exists. Necessity has to do with two things. Robert, that's for the human body, see catch yourself when you say I can't conceive. That's when you're supposed to catch yourself. And ask yourself who is this I that can't conceive. Because I can't conceive what does that mean? It means nothing. Who am I? In other words, don't feel because you cannot conceive at this stage of your unfoldment that it doesn't exist. But, rather find out who the I is who thinks it cannot conceive. Always go back to the I. And all the questions will stop. SV, you say follow the source of the I. No, I didn't say follow the source. I said follow the eye to the source. SV, okay that's a little vague to me you know. 
years ago when I was involved with being a shop detective. A guy would get in the car, and I would follow the car. Students laugh. Robert, well I hope it's not the same as being a detective. Laughter. SV what? I'm glad it's not the same as being a detective. Of course it's different. Okay look at this way. Whenever something comes to you that you don't understand, instead of trying to figure it out mentally, ask yourself the question, who does not understand? And the answer will come of its own volition, I don't. Then you continue in the query and you ask, who's this I that does not understand? Who is I don't? And that's the I you follow. You simply observe the I within yourself like a thread. And you follow the thread to the end, the source. When you get to the source there will be a complete revelation of your true identity and you'll be free of all questions. So whatever comes up use the same procedure. If you feel depressed or if you feel suspicious or if you feel angry, ask yourself, to whom do these things come? Then you will finally realize after doing this for a while, that all of your problems are attached to the personal I. And when you get rid of the personal I, everything else will go with it and you'll be free. So you stop trying to solve problems on the outside. Whose fault it is, and who did this to me, and who did that to me, and I'm feeling bad and this is wrong and this is right. You will know all of the time that all of these things have to do with your I, because you say, I feel bad, I feel depressed, I feel suspicious, I feel doubtful. They're all attached to the I. And all you've got to do is to witness the I. Observe it, do nothing to change it, but watch it. And watch it as it goes deeper and deeper into your heart. And one day it will just vanish and you will appear as you are. Practice and see for yourself. SC is what you're searching for or observing the sense of I. Are you feeling for it? Robert, the sense of I. Personal I. You're observing, you mustn't sit there and concentrate, right? Robert, no you do not concentrate, you just observe it and watch it. And follow it to its end. You concentrate on the source and not on the personal I. That's the observation. You witness the personal I and follow to its source and then it will disappear. SC, well what happens if you concentrate on it, does it disappear? When you concentrate on it, the personal I, it's like concentrating on an erroneous conclusion. You're concentrating on your ego, so your ego becomes stronger. Yeah, it will become stronger. Whatever you give you attention to, whatever you give your effort to, becomes stronger. Do you want to give all your effort to the source, not to the personal I, because the personal I doesn't exist? And you want to prove that by observing it in action, by watching it, by following it to the end. See, what do you mean follow? I mean by watching it. As you watch the personal I, and you go deeper within the self you will find that it comes to the end. You're following the I to its culmination, the end, it happens by itself. As you, you just watch yourself, is that what you mean you become aware of what you're doing? Robert, you become aware that I am doing. Not what you are doing actually, but what I am doing. I I and you say to yourself, I I, I and you go deeper and deeper within yourself. SN, that's not concentration? Robert, no, you're following, you're observing, you're watching. Okay. Robert, and one day that I will disappear completely. And you'll be in peace. SR. Robert, it sounds like you're saying, don't try to be the awareness, but notice that you already are. Robert, yes same thing, you don't try to become anything. You're just getting rid of that which has been bothering you for all these years and that's the personal I. See, that personal I, as far as I'm concerned, if you see a personal I in operation and looked at it, just observe it, 
It's gone, there's another one there, but it's totally different from the one before that and there's no connection between them. Robert, the eye is always the same. Therefore as I said, the whole universe, all your problems, everything is attached to I. And all you have to do is focus on the I. And follow it and then it will disappear with all your problems. Yes, that's understandable. By what I mentioned before. When you go to sleep tonight say, I am going to concentrate in the morning on my source I am. That's not the personal I, it's I am and go to sleep. When you wake up before you start to think about the world, you will remember what to do. And you will say I I to yourself. And you will see the feelings that come with that what will happen to you. SC, I did that the other night. First thing that happened was, I was arising to gratefulness. I had kind of a dream or vision. Students continues to talk about the dream. Robert, well that's a nice dream but you have to go beyond it. You have to ask yourself, to whom did the dream come? And again, I dreamt. It's I again, you go right back to your I again, don't you? Because I had the dream and you want to annihilate the I. Take out your gun and shoot it. You want to get rid of the I completely. And all the dreams will go, everything will go with it. Don't make it complicated, get rid of the I and you'll be at peace. Remember to love yourself, to pray to yourself, to bow to yourself, to kneel to yourself, because God dwells in you as you. Peace. Thanks for coming, have a great week, I love you. At this point the tape ends. Transcript 29. More on Satsang. 9th December 19, 190. Robert, I welcome you with all my heart, with all my being and with all my soul. I love each and every one of you. This is Satsang. We have two types of people that come here. One is backed as devotional people and one is John as Johnny's aspiring Johnny's knowledge. If we both respect each other's feelings, we'll get along fine. They both lead to the same goal. They both lead to self-realization. There's no difference. The difference is in the eyes of the beholder. What is satsang? Satsang is a very powerful tool. Tat means being. Tang means at the feet of being. Your real nature is being self. Self is omnipresence. Though you're sitting at the feet of the self, which is none other than yourself. This is not a metaphysical meeting. It is not a lecture. It is not a philosophy. It is a presence itself. And if you come to it often enough that's all you have to do. The words that I speak do not mean too much. It is the silence that is eloquent. And the silence is the same with all of us. Silence is the self. If you rest in silence, you become the self. Some people still come here who believe they're going to some kind of a meeting, a get-together. Though Sunday they come to this, because they have nothing better to do. Monday they go here Swami Misugananda Yogi. Laughter. Tuesday they go see Swami Nunu. Thursday they go see Professor So-and-so, and they come for entertainment. How many years have you been doing that and to what avail? My suggestion is that you pick something that appeals to you and really get into it for at least six months and see what happens. But, if you read too many books, go to various teachings, go to different meetings, you'll become totally confused and before you know it, 30 years will pass, 50 years will pass and you're no better off than you were before. Now I'll give you an example, I got a call today from a fellow in Santa Cruz. Well. I'll tell you his name Jim Vanderbilt. And he was a heavy pot user. Laughter. Now it's interesting what he told me he said, since he's come here about four or five times, he woke up this morning and he tried to smoke pot like he always does and he couldn't stand it. Laughter. He couldn't stand it. He had to throw it away. He doesn't know why. 
and he feels an inner happiness that he never felt before. I'm relating this to you to show you that just from being in satsang, everything becomes resolved in your life, everything. Your reaction to things begin to mellow out. You start minding your own business as it were. You become calm, peaceful, relaxed. But you have to intensify your desire for satsang. You have to love it and treat it as an entity, as a thing itself, as a teaching. Just being here will do all that for you. Chanting is a very important process. It makes the mind one-pointed. When the mind becomes one-pointed, you can focus on the self. And by focusing on the self, the mind becomes annihilated and you become free. Do not take the things we do here for granted. Everything is important, everything. If you get involved in it, you will see the results in a short time. But, if you just come here for amusement because you have nothing better to do, as I said before, fifty years will pass, and you'll still be running to teachers, running to India, going to different states looking for certain ways or methods of finding yourself. But in truth, there is no way and there's no method. The self is the self, just like the sun always shines. You just have to remove the clouds and the sun will shine once again like it always did. And so it is that all you've got to do is remove the ignorance, the world and all its ramifications from your mind and you will be free. Everyone is looking for happiness, peace and love and freedom from all their problems. Who doesn't want this? This is what everybody really wants, happiness, peace, love and freedom from their problems. But they make one mistake and that is they're looking to solve something. As long as you're looking to solve something or to attain anything you will never do it. For it involves the ego and the mind. It is the ego mind that needs, that wants, that wants to become, that wants to acquire. If you understand a little bit of your real nature, that you are spirit, that you are absolute intelligence, infinite wisdom. If you dwell in that, that alone will become your reality. And everything else undesirable will vanish. I'm not saying that the world will change. You will just acquire a different perception of this world in which you live. Everything will become quite neutral and you will stop fighting, you will stop trying to make things happen. Yet the average person may say, if I did not make things happen, I will get nowhere. Nothing will happen. On the contrary, it has been known by spiritual masters throughout the ages, when you become quiet, when you stop thinking too much, when you become quiescent, thoughtless, you will be lead and guided to what you have to do and everything will work out for you. Your body came to this earth for a specific reason. It will follow through no matter what you think. In other words, if you're supposed to work, you will find work no matter what happens. Even if thousands of people do not find work, you will find work. If you're not supposed to work no matter how hard you try, you will not be able to work, you will not find work. Even though there are millions of jobs available, this is all karmic, you have nothing to do with it. Your job and your mission is simply not to react to anything. I know it sounds strange especially those of you who are involved in work. You still think and feel if I do not research my work, if I do not plan, if I do not think about it, it will not get done. On the contrary, something will lead you and guide you. A mysterious power will take care of everything for you. This only happens when you understand I am not the doer. As long as you believe you are the doer, you have to struggle, you have to fight, you have to compete, and you have to straighten things out. But as soon as you realize I am not the doer, I didn't ask to be born, I didn't have to go through this position, to have the parents I had, to grow up where I grew up, this is all karmic. The same power that took care of this will take care of you now. Will put you in your right place. Will take care of your finances, your health and everything else. Your job is to focus your attention on the self. 
What is the self? The self is your real nature, that's what you are. The self is consciousness. What is consciousness? Consciousness is the power that is conscious of itself. It is self-contained, it is omnipresent. When you speak of love, of peace, of God, of joy, of happiness, of bliss, you're speaking of consciousness. These words are just other words for consciousness. Consciousness is you. The self-consciousness, they're all synonymous. They all pertain to you. Now what have you been seeing? What have you been reacting to? The mind goes out and causes problems and you try to resolve them. You cannot. For when you resolve one problem another one pops up somewhere else and there's no end to it. It's like trying to figure out what came first the seed or the tree. You never get anywhere, there's no solution. People have been trying to resolve problems since the beginning of time and the world is getting worse. There's no adequate solution in trying to resolve anything in the outside. The great secret of course is to leave the world alone, go within yourself and there you will find happiness, joy and peace. But how do you go within yourself? How do you dive deep within yourself? By asking the question, who am I? I have found this to be the fastest method there is to awakening. There are other methods but personally, I found this the fastest. All you have to do is question, who am I? You do not have to answer, you do not have to analyze anything, you do not have to come up with any solution. You simply ask the question from whence did I come? Where did the I come from? What is the source of I? Many people have been practicing jhana marga have made the mistake of concentrating on the I, and this is why you do not get anywhere. You concentrate on the source, not on the I. The I is only an illusion. His only is something that appears to be like your body. It has no momentum, it has no substance. But, yet you have to watch the I. You have to abide in the I. For it leads you to the source of existence. The source of everything. You do this by again questioning, where does the I come from? You do not answer. And you ask again, who am I? You never answer. If you answer, it is your mind playing games with you. Your ego is very powerful, it does not wish to be destroyed. It will play games with you. You simply pose the question yet you never answer. The answer will come in due time. It will reveal itself to you as you. You need patience, take your time. Do not think it is going to happen overnight. It may, it may not. Yet do not think of those things. If you're really busy working on your eye, you will not have time to find fault in the world. For the eye will take all of your attention. What do you give your attention to now? What hurts you? What bothers you? This continues simply because you are placing all of your attention, all of your focus on the thing that you think is wrong with your life or something that's disturbing you. Let me remind you, you will never resolve anything that way. It may appear that you resolve it that way, but something else will pop up. As an example, a lady is having problems with her co-workers. She can't get along with them. She says, they're doing this to me, they're doing that to me, it's not my fault. So she quits her job and she moves to San Francisco. Gets a new job. Everything is okay for the first couple of months. But, then she finds the same problem with her new co-workers. Because she has taken herself with her. Yet she does not realize this. She thinks it's the people. She thinks it's the environment. She thinks it's the economy. But, she never goes to search herself to ask herself, Why do I have this problem? Why do I perceive these things? Who is the perceiver? I am. Who am I? Who is the I that perceives these problems? Where did that I come from? 
What is its source? You abide in the eye, yet you do not concentrate on the eye. You abide in the eye, you follow the eye to the source. One day, you will awaken and you will become free. But, again do not look for a timetable. Do not try to make it happen this year or tomorrow or yesterday. It may leave it alone. Do the work that is necessary and everything will work out. Time passes very fast. For you know it, it's time to leave your body. What have you accomplished? Have you become free? If not, you have to go through the illusion of reincarnation and karma again and again and again, so it appears. Until you learn to let go, until you learn not to react to anything. Not to find fault. Not to try to make the world spin your way, but to surrender completely to yourself. Surrendering is very important. To whom do you surrender? To the source, the self. You may say something like this, Okay self, take my problems. Take my negativity, take everything that will be done. I no longer have any concern about these things. And you stop reacting towards person, place or thing. You mellow out. You become calm in the face of all adversity. It makes no difference what is facing you. You become happy, peaceful and calm. This again cannot happen by itself. It needs your help. You cannot say, I'm going to do this, and it will happen. Just like Jim, we never said he would stop smoking pot. But all of a sudden he has no liking for it again. It happened by itself. The same thing will happen in your affairs. If you do the work and work on self-inquiry, surrender, to whom does this come? Who feels upset? Who feels depressed? Who feels that others are taking advantage of me? Where do these thoughts come from? They come from me. From my past, from previous lives. I think these thoughts. Everything is my fault. Everything comes out of me. So who is me? Where did me come from? How did it get born? Does it really exist? And you go deeper and deeper, inquiring where the me came from. Who gave it birth? As you follow the me, one day something will happen. There may seem to be an explosion of light, and everything will be burnt out. All your karma. All the samskaras, everything that has ever disturbed, you will be gone and you will be free. And you will realize that all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. And there are no problems. All is well and everything is unfolding as it should. There was once a prime minister of a large kingdom. And he went to his guru who simply used to say, all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. And the Prime Minister used to wonder why he says this. And the Kuru would say, Just come here and listen to those words and repeat them to yourself. He did this often enough, enlightenment came. And he did realize all is well and everything is happening as it should. Though he went back to the kingdom and sat in his chair and gave advice to the people as he usually did. Now the head of the security force had a problem. That day he was due to get promoted to chief and he was bypassed and somebody else got promoted, so he was disturbed. He went to see the prime minister and told him his troubles. And the prime minister smiled at him and said, Don't worry, all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. And the guard got mad, he went away mumbling. How can he tell me something like this? This is ridiculous. Now the head chef had a problem because his wife ran away with one of the cooks. And he was very disturbed. He came to the Prime Minister and said, Mr. Prime Minister, what should I do? My wife ran away. I feel very bad. The Prime Minister said, Don't worry, all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. And the chef got very upset and he left. He was walking down the hall, and he bumped into the guard, and they related their stories. And they said, let's fix this guy. 
He can't tell us things like this. We have serious problems. And they were thinking of a way to get even. They were walking down the corridor and they saw the royal barber's shop. And there was the king getting his royal shave. The barber inadvertently slipped and cut the king's throat and it was deep gash. Royal blood was spilling all over the floor. Laughter. And they both looked and they said, I know what we'll do. They conceived a plan. When the king was feeling better with a bandage around his neck, they went and said, Your Majesty, we went and told the Prime Minister that you cut your royal neck and you know what he said. He said, All is well and everything is unfolding as it should. Though the king said, What? Bring him to me. So they brought the Prime Minister and the king said, Look at my neck, I'm in total pain. Do you see the cut and the bandage? What do you think of that? And the Prime Minister looked and he said, Don't worry your majesty, all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. And the king said, What? How dare you tell me something like this when I'm in pain, throw him in the dungeon. So they threw the Prime Minister in the dungeon. Now, it was Wednesday afternoon. And every Wednesday afternoon the king went hunting in the jungle with the Prime Minister. But, since the Prime Minister was in the dungeon he went hunting by himself. Now in the jungle there lived a tribe of Kali worshippers. And these Kali worshippers always sacrificed somebody to Kali. And this was the day of the sacrifice. So the chief of the Kali worshippers told the worshippers, Go out and find me somebody virtuous so we can sacrifice this person to Kali. They got on their horses and rode out. And sure enough they found the king. And they didn't care whether he was a king or what he was. They grabbed him and took him to the chief. And the chief said, Good you found somebody, undress him and bath him and let's sacrifice him. They proceeded to undress him and they saw the cut on his neck. And they showed the chief and the chief said, What? This guy is no good, he's not pure. Throw him back where he came from. And they took him back and let him go. On the way back to the kingdom the king started to think and he said, Now wait a minute, if didn't get this cut I would be dead meat. The prime minister was right and he rode back to the kingdom, to the palace and he said, Release the prime minister. Which he did and he related the story to the prime minister and he said, You were right all the time. Though the Prime Minister said, Not only that your majesty, but if I rode with you today, and you didn't throw me into the dungeon, they would have caught me also and I didn't have a cut, and they would have sacrificed me to Kali. Though by being in the dungeon my life was spared. This story shows you that when something happens to you and you try to solve it by blaming others or believing there's something wrong you are making a dreadful mistake. For if you are able to see the whole picture, Whatever happens to you is for your ultimate good. Never curse the darkness if you don't understand what's going on. This is why when things are troubling you and you have no idea why and you think you have got bad luck or people are against you or life is very hard. If you would merely go within yourself, dive deep within yourself and ask yourself, to whom does this come? Or who am I? And follow the eye to the source everything will be revealed to you. Everything will be revealed to you. And you will find unalloyed happiness, total joy and total peace. But you have to do the work. You cannot just ride through life and take things as they come. Simply begin the work of self-inquiry and everything else will take care of itself. And remember do not ask about time when it's going to happen. It will take care of itself. Remember that joke about the Zen Buddhist monk that I told you. He wanted to become a monk. So he flew to Japan and he had an interview with the head Roshi. And the Roshi gave him instructions and accepted him and he said, By the way, there is one thing I forgot to tell you. We have a vow of silence here. You can only speak three words every ten years. So he said, Okay and he went to his quarters. 
Ten years passed, and he had an interview with the Roshi. And the Roshi said, Do you have anything to say? And he said, The food sucks. And he went back to his quarters. Ten more years passed. He had an interview with the Roshi. The Roshi said, Do you have anything to say? And he said, The bed's hard. And he went back to his quarters. Ten more years passed. He had an interview with the Roshi and the Roshi said, Have you got anything to say? He said, Yes, I quit. And the Roshi said, I can't blame you. You've been bitching ever since you got here. Students laugh. That's how it is with us. We keep bitching and bitching about everything in our lives and we want to be enlightened next weekend. Laughter. What I say to you is forget about enlightenment. Forget about self-realization. Merely practice self-inquiry and come to satsang. Everything will take care of itself. Satsang is really when we sit in silence and then have question and answers. But most of you still like me to give a little talk. Though I do that to please you. Though we'll now open up for questions. Feel free to ask about anything you like about spiritual life or about your life if you like. And we'll see where we go. This is what this is all about. Everyone is coming from a different place. And you may have something you want answered that I haven't spoken about. Feel free to ask at this time. S.G. Robert, what's the difference between abiding in the eye or following it and concentrating on it? Robert. Abiding in the eye, following the eye is merely observing the eye, watching the eye, seeing the eye. Concentrating is where you put all of your energy into it and become one with it. You do that with the source. For instance, when you follow the eye, one day, you will feel something at the source of the eye. And you will watch and observe how the eye becomes abolished in its source. And you will become the source. Your feelings, your emotions will be swallowed up by the source and you will know it. You will feel a peace that you never felt before. You will feel a joy that is overwhelming. You will find unalloyed happiness in the source. But, you abide in the eye, and you follow the eye by witnessing, by watching, by observing. The eye will eventually turn into the source where you will become free. S.E. When Muktananda was in town 1980, I remember him one time, a monk was giving a talk, one of the swamis. And there was this woman in the audience that said, I've been practicing Sid. I yoga for some time now and every day I feel depressed and each day I feel more and more depressed. I can barely wake up in the morning. I can't stay awake during the day. I feel miserable. My body hurts. My head hurts. And I can barely survive from day to day and it's getting worse. I think of suicide. And she says I've been practicing and practicing for eight years. Note, break in tape as Robert continues. Robert, true that everything is no thing but all the same. You have to do something with your mind to get rid of your mind. To those people who seem to attain this effort lessly. There was a time when they did practice in a previous existence. And again let me explain. Words are hard to explain. When you have the experience, who am I? What is the source of the I? It's part of the vast experience that comes instantaneously. And as I said before, when it happens it appears as if I practice for years and years and years. But, yet I never practiced in this life. Though that experience made me realize that I had practiced before. Somewhere, somehow, I had done it all before. But, it happened now. Though sometimes you may think you're not getting anywhere. But, how much time have you given it? Eight years? 10 years, 20 years, even the last time. Remember what you call a lifetime is, but a split second in eternity. Your so-called life is here today and gone tomorrow. 
it doesn't mean anything in universal time. So keep on practicing. No matter how long it takes. Don't look at time. Just do the work. But remember not to use effort. Not to try to do anything. But simply observe. You pose the question, Who am I? and you watch. You observe. You look. You see. Then you say, Who am I? Again, you say it again and again and again. All the time you're observing, you're looking, you're watching. You are not looking for any results. You are not trying to practice anything. You are not trying to put any energy in motion. You are not trying to raise the Kundalini or work with the chakras. You are simply observing, you're watching, and you're waiting patiently. If you can do this, I can assure you that results will come. Does that make any sense? It's effortless. There is no trying, there is no effort involved. Just look, just watch, just observe. That's all you've got to do. But, again, forget about time. It makes no difference how many years you have been practicing. You're still better off than a person who never practiced. And the day will come when you get it. And everything will unfold as it should, which is right now. SM, Robert, you said something about a blast of light or something like that. Isn't that consciousness? Robert, yes. The sound go with that? Robert, it happens differently to different people. There is usually no sound, and the flash of light is not the ultimate experience. The ultimate experience is beyond light, beyond sound. But it begins like that. There's a flash of light. Everything happens at one time. And then the light subsides and there is nothing. There is a void. And the void becomes everything. It becomes the self. And then you are just aware, you know. And you know that you know. That all is well. Some people realize the self with a flash of light as the initial experience. And some people just went into the void and became ultimate reality. It happens slightly differently to different people. S.E. From the viewpoint of the Absolute we can say just as easily and either that practice leads to enlightenment or enlightenment causes the practice to precede it. Robert, well enlightenment doesn't cause any practice. For enlightenment is just enlightenment, why do you need practice? Once enlightenment comes there's nothing to do, just be. So that's the way it goes. Enlightenment does not lead to a practice. Because what you are saying is this, when you become God, does God have to practice as God? God is God and that's omnipresence. Therefore, when you find the solution, and you awaken, you become omnipresent, and there is nothing to do, until then practice. SN, but when you say practice, you mean effortless effort. Robert, effortless effort. Because I don't know what Siddha Yoga is, but I've been involved in other types of meditation, and it seems as though the central idea is, in other forms of meditation, is the idea of duality, and I feel that there is something to attain. In Advaita non-duality there is nothing new to attain you are already that. Getting rid of the idea that you are not that you are already that. And so there was an analogy in Ramana's books how he said the other practices are like trying to lead an ox with a whip. We are trying to concentrate, trying to accomplish something, trying to be something, yet we are already that. And in Advaita we are trying to lead an ox with grass. The one trying to force it, the other it follows of itself. This idea of practice when there are practices in duality or whether it's non-duality. In duality you need to gain something, but in non-duality you are already that. Robert, what you are saying is very true. Remember all of your past practices has brought you here. Though they were all necessary. You can never say, what I did before was not necessary. You wouldn't be here if weren't so, everything is necessary. 
That's what I mean when I say, all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. Everything is in its right place. You never made a mistake. Everything you did has been necessary. Regret nothing. Look for nothing. Find peace within yourself. Abide in the self and leave the world alone. Everything will come in due time. Do not look for a time again. It makes no difference how long you've practiced. I'll reiterate, you can practice 10 years, 1 year, 1 week, 20 years, 20 lifetimes, it makes no difference. Don't even think of that. Simply thinking of time does not allow you to go forward. Time keeps you back. Forget about time. Do what is necessary. Everything will take care of itself. S.V. Robert, just a comment on what this other fellow said before. Even I can tell if you are doing self-inquiry and you find yourself becoming more and more depressed and not happy I would say that would be a sign of you doing it wrong. Laughter. Robert, so what's the point? Well I asked you to comment on that. Robert, oh just to comment okay. Look at it this way. It may be wrong, but at least they're doing something and everything has been ordained. Though you were meant to do the practice wrong for a time. Laughter. Therefore you shouldn't fight it. You shouldn't say to yourself, all of these years have been wasted. I've gone astray. My teacher was a false teacher. He gave me the wrong practice. And I took 25 years of time when I could have been doing the right things. On the contrary, everything is right. No matter how it looks. And if you didn't do the practice wrong, you wouldn't be here. So that's a blessing in disguise. It's actually a blessing in disguise. That you are able to do the practice wrong so you can come here. Students laugh. There is always a reason for everything. And there are no mistakes. If you think you made a mistake, what you're saying indirectly is, God doesn't know what he is doing. Because if God is all there is, how can there be a mistake? We just perceive it wrongly. But, everything we've been through has been very necessary for our own unfoldment. Be thankful. That's another quality you should develop. Be grateful and be thankful for every experience that you go through. This will push you forward. Regret nothing. SK, through conflict there is resolution. Robert, sure. As far as people are talking about time and effortlessness, there are some paths that use time. They concentrate on doing so much practice within each and every day with effort. Robert, that's the path of karma yoga. Well, whatever yoga it is, but they do practices, spiritual practices, meditation, or whatever, and the attainment as far as I can see from my experience and from observing others, etc., is just as great because they are concentrating so hard that they are merging their mind. They are dissolving their mind through the intensity of the time they put into their practice, their quality practice. I don't know why people are cursing putting effort in unless of course the ego is the doer. That's the only drawback I can see. SG, it's all attitude. SK, yeah, if you realize that you don't have to, you can disengage it in some way. Robert, if the attainment has been obtained then why do need anything else? SK, excuse me. If you have attained what you want then that's all you need, that's good. I will never put down another path. All paths lead to the same goal. The only thing that happens with the path you're talking about is it takes longer. When you use effort it takes a longer time to achieve nothingness. Because the ultimate result of all your effort is nothing. We are trying to achieve nothingness. SK, Robert if it sits with the dynamic that's pretty good. If it works for you use it. SR, 
isn't it sort of a question of whether you want to see yourself as a practicer or one who is realized in a sense then too? It is like if you want to really be doing a practice that's always there or if you want to make up that's there too. Robert, again the ordainer, remember Ishvara. Students laugh. The ordainer has ordained what you should do in this life. And you're going to do whatever you have to do whether you like it or not. Laughter. But you have the freedom of not reacting and of going within and finding yourself. Though if you're involved in a practice that you think you have to do and nothing is going to stop you, by all means continue the practice. Until the time comes when you automatically give it up, if you have to give it up. But, everything will take care of itself and you have nothing to say about it. The we talk as if we have something to say. We talk as if we are in control. We talk as if we are going to use this practice and follow this teacher and go to this country. We have nothing to do with that. We are not the doer. Something will motivate you to practice whatever you have to practice or not to practice, whatever the case may be. Your job is just to watch, to observe, to look and not to react. If you can do that you'll be safe. SF with not to react Robert, you mean surrendering right? Robert, when you surrender you do not react that's right. SF, who is the real doer Ishvara? Really actually? The real doer is the self. Ishvara is just an intermediary. Laughter. SF, I don't think the self is the one who is doing things. The self does nothing because there is nothing to do. SF, then Ishvara, is the doer? Ishvara helps. He's the helper. He makes all your karma come true. SF, right. Because you believe in them. SH, he takes the rap as the doer because the self does nothing? Laughter. Robert, that's right exactly. Though as long you're involved in practices in doership, realize who the doer really is Ishvara. Laughter. SR, Robert, I'm looking forward to enlightenment. After that then, what do we do? Robert, what is there to do? Your body, remember, is going to do whatever it came here to do, but it has nothing to do with you. You will not be passive if that's what you mean? If you were meant to be passive, nothing can make you non-passive. Do not concern yourself about this. If himself realize then you'll see. Yes, most people think still, if they become self-realized the only thing they will be good for is go to a cave and meditate. On the contrary, you can be a garbage man or woman. You can be the president of a bank. You can be the president of the United States. You will be anything you like. It will not change things as far as your body is concerned. The only difference is in your perception. You will perceive things differently. Life will no longer have the power to disturb you in any way. It's like your master of the universe. The universe can no longer scare you. Can no longer frighten you no matter what happens. And you will have a feeling of immortality. You will feel and know that you were never born, that you do not exist, and that you do not disappear. You will just know this and act accordingly. SR, Robert, when we reach that state it seems like it really cuts the career choices. SK, you can start a new kind of employment agency. Robert, a Johnny employment agency. SE, it happens at the age of 62 or 65. Realized being employment agency. SK, we just watch. Students laugh again. Robert, see remember who is asking the question. The Johnny or the Ajani. Though from your viewpoint it appears as there is nothing to do. But, you will do plenty don't worry about that. Everything will take care of itself. SK, Robert, when you ask like what should I do or what's my purpose it's still because you identify as being a body or mind. That question normally depends what you thought you were. Robert, yes. 
If you saw you were beyond that or not that, that could not be possible. Robert, there would be no question. That's true. But, yet your body will still do something. If you were meant to get married, you will get married. If you were meant to get divorced, you will get divorced. If you were meant to travel to Italy, you will go to Italy. But, your body will still be active. Your mind will be inactive. It will be still quiet quiescent. And you'll live spontaneously. All will go well with you, because the world will no longer have the power to scare you or to frighten you in any way. S.G. Robert, when we're through with this world I assume that we don't reincarnate any more than we are just out there as a friend of Ishvara and... Robert, no. When you reach the state of enlightenment, there is no Ishvara. There is no world and there is no out there. You just see yourself as consciousness bliss. SR, but manifesting as anything. No. S, G, it looks sort of a void. No. Bliss, sat shit ananda, absolute reality, and that cannot be comprehended by the finite mind. You have to experience that state. There are no words to describe it. S, G, that means that there are no vibratory colors, sounds, or do they exist in a different? Why do you need color and sound? Who needs the color and sound? SG, I've just grown used to them. Though what you want is enlightenment according to your rules and regulations. SG, no not really, I guess there is a light-hearted way of trying to imagine what a world without anything in operation. You can't. You can't imagine it. That's virtually impossible to imagine. There is bliss, there is harmony, there is love, there is compassion and those things just happen. You have no idea that they are happening to you or from you. You become the embodiment of love, of joy, of bliss. SK, then can't these qualities that we're talking about even unimaginable by the mind as to what they really are? Robert, exactly. One cannot comprehend the infinite. The mind is only a bunch of thoughts, a conglomeration of thoughts of the past and the future. But, the mind is only for your body. It is because you have a body that you have a mind. And because you have a mind you have a body. They both go together, and they are both false. SR. Robert, these questions about what it's like later, kind of bring up a sort of a Buddhist feeling that I have into reading people like Wang Fo and Li Hai, and that in a sense what we are really trying to do is put away that what if, and what will happen later and live in the present moment. It seems like our problems are always geared toward, if I have a purpose it's in the future, if I'm going to meet somebody, you know the mind is geared toward what if. Robert, yes of course. It seems like with this awakening, that process will come to an end, and we finally for the first time what we really see right now. It seems like our problems in a sense are always, we are not seeing what's in front of us, we are always jumping ahead with our greed and our feelings. The Buddha say get rid of greed, anger and delusion. It's like we don't ever see what we are really seeing because we are not ever in the present. We are always jumping into what does this mean to me and what will happen later and when will I be fulfilled? Robert, or in the past? Yeah. Robert, we worry about the past and worry about the future. That's why we have to annihilate the mind. Get rid of it completely. S.R. We've really never seen the world in a certain sense because we are always doing that with our minds, going from the past to the future. The mind is only given to us for our physical existence. If you go beyond your physical existence who needs a mind? You become mindless and you stay happy. At this point is a tape break. Remember to love yourself, to worship yourself, to bow to yourself to pray to yourself because God dwells in you as you. Peace. At this point, the tape ends.
Transcript 30. The Ultimate Happiness. 13th December, 1990. Robert. Tape starts abruptly. And who is responsible for this? So she says, it's my boss. Though the mother says, I'll fix him. She calls the number, and she says, my daughter just told me she's pregnant and you're the father, what are you going to do about it? Though he says, well, if it's a boy I'll give him half the business. If it's a girl, I'll give her $200,000. Though the mother thinks about this, and she says, if it's a miscarriage will you give it another chance? Students laugh. S.H., that was a good deal. Robert, J. laughs at anything. S.K., he already laughed before you told the joke so it doesn't mean that much. Laughter. Robert, okay. Okay, children. S.K., now he gets down to humor. Laughs. S.H., give us the word. Robert, there is one thing I can tell you for sure. That all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. I can tell you truly nothing is wrong anywhere. Everything is happening just the way it is supposed to. If you think you've got a problem that's the mistake, thinking you've got a problem. If only you'd stop thinking. As soon as you stop thinking, everything will go right. Laughter. S.H., is it going right while you're thinking? Robert, yes, but you don't know it. Some of us don't think it is because some of us think, I've got a problem, or, I'm involved in something I can't handle, or something is bigger than I am, or, something hurts me, or I feel angry, or I feel fear, or I feel something is wrong. But I can assure you there is nothing wrong. Nothing has ever been wrong. Nothing is wrong now and nothing will ever be wrong. S.H. Hallelujah. Laughs. Robert, all that you've to do, all you've got to do is watch yourself. As soon as your mind starts thinking past your nose, grab it. Not your nose, but grab your thoughts. You can grab your nose too if you like. But... Grab your thoughts with your mind and put a stop to them any way you can either by observing your thoughts by practicing self-inquiry and asking, to whom do they come? Whatever you have to do, do not allow yourself to think. If your mind does not think you will be exceedingly happy, you will have unalloyed happiness. I can assure you, total happiness if you stop yourself from thinking. I receive many phone calls. One of the calls that is most common is, when will I experience self-realization? Repeats, this is determined by the consciousness of the person. And I have a different answer for everybody because I take you where you're at. This is why I may sound contradictory sometimes. If you ask me a personal question, I try to answer you from where you're coming from. Again, some people tell me, Robert, why don't you just speak the highest truth all the time? And some people tell me, Robert speak so that I can understand what you are talking about. Though that's the dilemma. Though I do whatever I have to do. I plan nothing. Everything is extemporaneous. I have no rehearsals. I don't write anything down. I just say what comes out of me. Though when we have a phone call, when am I going to become self-realized? Somebody tells me, I have been practicing all week now and nothing has happened. Students laugh. Some man called me yesterday telling me he had been practicing for two weeks, he took a seminar and paid $700, and he still is not self-realized. I get calls like this all the time. Though it depends what you say this determines the answer I give you. But, there is a standard answer. Think of the question. When will I, I, I become self-realized, 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 self-realized? Student laugh. I usually say this. Before I answer your question, may I ask you a question? Please tell me what do you mean by I? And what do you mean by self-realization? I usually keep silent. So I continue when I say, 
Who do you think the I is, who wants to become self-realized? You're speaking about the personal I, and the personal I can never be self-realized. The personal I is finite. Finite can never know the infinite. That's why the personal I can never become self-realized. And as long as you think you are the personal I who needs to be self-realized, there never will be a time when you become self-realized. And then the word self-realized, what does that mean? It simply means your natural state. It is not something you become. It is something you are. You wish to experience your natural state. What you want to do therefore is to awaken to your natural state, what you are now, but you've covered it up with the personal I. As long as you keep talking about, I am this, and, I am that, and, I need to be self-realized, or, I need to awaken, or, I need to do anything, it will never happen. This is also true of your problems. When you think, I have to solve a problem, I have to take responsibility, you are referring to your personal I, and you will come up with relative ideas that will pull you further into problems. They will never be solved that way. Look back at your experience and you will see what I'm saying is true. When you try to use your personal I to solve a problem, you may appear to solve it for a while. Then another one will pop up now and again, and you go through your life trying to solve problem after problem after problem. You have to understand and realize and see that intelligently. You have to look at that intelligently and realize every time you speak about yourself or any situation in the world, you are referring to your personal I. Now if you can bypass the personal I then you wouldn't have the question. For if you realize, you are not the personal I then who is left to become self-realized. No one. When the I is gotten out of the way, you become omnipresence. You become I am, not I am this or I am that just I am. Now your I am is the I am of the universe consciousness, absolute awareness, I am, is your real nature. You have to awaken to that. Do not talk about it. Do not try to convince somebody else, but to simply awaken yourself to the fact that you are I am and you've always been I am. If you can just reason that way, you wouldn't have anything to say after that. Just say to yourself right now, I am. As soon as you say, I am, all of your problems so-called are resolved, your life is resolved, everything is resolved, and you're happy just by saying, I am. Feel it. I am. Doesn't it feel beautiful? There's nothing that comes after, I am. I am is it, there's nothing else. And even if you have difficulty with this, some people say, I feel great as long as I am at satsang, but as soon as I get home the world grabs a hold of me and I get involved in problems. I get involved in worldly things. Again you're talking about your personal I. That's what you've got to look at intelligently. When you tell me, I get involved in the world, who is the I? You will never say I am gets involved in the world, because as soon as you say, I am you feel good, don't you? But when you say, I get involved in the world, you're thinking of your body, your mind and your affairs. When you say, I am, it all goes away and you become free. When you come to satsang something happens. You're not creating anything new because there's nothing to create. An awakening process takes place, just like when you're dreaming and the dream is so interesting and nice, and you awaken and you find yourself in this world. Though it is when you begin to awaken in this world. You awaken to the fourth state of consciousness and you appear to be in this world to others, but you're no longer of this world. The body may appear to be real to others, but you realize and you understand that you have no body. I can assure you, I can swear to you, I can promise you that I have no body. And yet you look at me and you say, I see the body. I see you as a body. Though I ask you, who sees? Who sees the body? I do. Who am I? 
Who am I that sees the body? Then there is silence. It is difficult for some of us to understand this, that I have no body. Now what appears to happen is when you're in my company it sats in your body consciousness begins to dissolve, simply because I understand that I am not the body. When I use the words in my company or me or I, try to remember always that I am not referring to Robert. Robert is a horse's ass. Though when I say that you're in my company, I am not referring to me, because I am nothing as Robert. But, whenever I use the terms I or me, or my, I always refer to consciousness to omnipresence. Though what I mean by this that you're in my company, you are in the company of consciousness. There's no differentiation between my consciousness and your consciousness. I see you as consciousness, all I see is consciousness. And again, it is a little difficult to understand. How I see consciousness? And people ask me, don't you see the body? Yes, I see the body, but I see it as consciousness. And I guess the only way to explain this is if you take a gigantic screen and on this screen there are pictures shown on it of bodies, of places, of mountains, of hills. The screen is aware of itself as the screen and knows that the objects are superimposed on itself. Though it is constantly aware of it being the screen, and yet, it knows there are pictures and objects superimposed on the screen. Though it is I realize myself as consciousness, but I also know that the whole world, the whole universe is also consciousness with a self. Everything is the self and I am that. That's what it means. Therefore from now on whenever you hear me declare my confession, that I am absolute consciousness, and I am pure reality, I am Satchitananda, I am ultimate oneness, I am that I am, nirvana, emptiness, this is what I am referring to. All this is the self and I am that. And the self is like a gigantic screen where there are images superimposed on the screen. But, I am aware of the consciousness and the images. I realize the images are false but I see them. But, my feelings, my thoughts, if there are any thoughts my awareness is always on consciousness. Now what does this mean? It means I can be watching a movie, I can be watching TV, I can go to the opera, I can be involved in all kinds of things, but I am not involved in anything. I am free of it. Yet to others it appears as if I am involved. This is why I am no fun to be around. People can't understand how I can stay home by myself. They want to take me someplace or be with me or feel sorry for me they say, Robert's always by himself. He should get out more often. Where would I go? Laughter. It really makes no difference where I am. Every once in a while Dana used to come and pick me up and take me to a movie. And I would make out I'm enjoying myself. And after the movie she likes to discuss it. And I don't know what happened. I have no idea what's going on. Laughter. I have no idea what's going on. People tell me about their videos and about this person and about that and about actors and actresses and about Iraq and everything else. But what have I got to do with that? I realize it's probably going on somewhere. But, it's very dim, it's like a dream. I am totally aware of consciousness. Everything else is like a little dream far away someplace. Though I can be any place. As an example, I was picked up by three people when I came. Three people arrived at the house to take me to Satsang. And while they were there, they saw people working on my carpet. My hot water heater leaked and the carpet was flooded. But, all day I was watching the goings on sitting on a chair and I was totally happy. Happiness does not leave. People can be living or dying or working or whatever they are doing. How can I be unhappy? Nobody dies. Nothing is wrong. All is well. Though how can I possibly be unhappy? It's impossible. 
though when we're at satsang something happens to you to cause you to begin to feel this way also. Now people have asked me, why should I want to be this way? Because you do nothing, you're good for nothing. You are no fun at a party and you are no fun to be around because there is nothing for me to do. Laughter. So why should you want to be this way? The main reason is this, don't you want to be God? Don't you want to be totally happy and blissful and be universal so to speak? Will you just feel and realize, I am is the universe, I am is everything that exists. I am that and I am at peace. I am totally happy, total joy. Everybody is running around with their problems trying to resolve them and solve them. And I just look, I just watch and I wonder how can you believe you've got a problem? Why do you think someone is trying to hurt you? Why do you believe someone is trying to take advantage of you? Why are you hurtable? And you don't know why. The answer is simple. Because you are identifying with the personal I. That's the only reason. Remember you cannot solve any problem by solving the problem itself. You've tried it and it doesn't work. As I've said before, when one problem is solved another one pops up somewhere else. It never ends. But when you annihilate the eye, when the mind becomes quiescent and it rests in the heart, your natural state which is called the fourth state after waking, dreaming and sleeping, ensues by itself. It comes by itself. Just like the sun that has been covered over by clouds. Only a fool would say, the sun doesn't exist because they can't see it. The clouds dissipate and the sun shines once again in all its glory and splendor. Though it is with us. We're covered with clouds of ignorance that make us believe I'm hurtable, I've been raped, someone is trying to do something to me. I don't mean raped literally, I mean in your mind. Someone is taking advantage of me, someone is trying to do this or do that to me. Those are all lies. You're doing it to yourself because you're thinking past your nose. You're allowing your thoughts to run rampant with you. Your thoughts are taking you over continuously and leading you astray. You're not putting a stop to this, you're allowing it to happen. Is it any wonder that you feel anger, frustration out of sort? Because you will not put a stop to these thoughts when they begin. This is also true with thoughts of dying or sickness or whatever. There is no such thing. Nothing exists but I am. And you should practice that form of meditation. When you inhale you say, I. You exhale you say, am. If you have to meditate, meditate on that with your breathing. The day will come when you awaken, and you will not have to do anything. But, in the meanwhile, you do the best you can. But, as you are doing the best you can, realize that consciousness is what you are, and consciousness loves you for you are its own. It will never leave you nor forsake you. If you can't do anything else, surrender to consciousness. What I mean about surrender, surrender your ego, your problems, your emotions, your fears, your frustrations, your hurts, your anger. Give it all up. Say, take it consciousness. If that's too abstract to you, give it all to me. I will take it and chew it up for you and spit it out. So when you wake up in the morning and feel out of sorts, you feel angry or frustrated, say, Okay, robber, take this from me. I'm giving it to you. And I'm happy to take it off your shoulders so that you can carry a lighter load. If that is what you have to do, do that. But by all means, do not get carried away with your emotions. Stop in the middle and watch. Watch your emotions ruling you. Watch your fears controlling you. And watch your anger popping up. Do not try to stop it, just watch, observe, look intelligently and realize who it is that is getting angry or frustrated, it's not you. It is not even your ego because there is no ego. It's not your body because there is no body. It's not your mind because there is no mind. Therefore, what is making you angry? Nothing. 
It is like the story I tell of the Zen monk who was in his quarters and he'd get angry every now and again. He would start arguments with his fellow monks, always looking for something wrong, always complaining, whining, always telling people his troubles, and he'd get real angry. So this fellow monk said, why don't you go see the Roshi, the head of the monks and tell him to help you? Though so he said, okay, and the Roshi lived about two miles down the road. Though so he went down there and he explained his position with the Roshi. So the Roshi said, okay, so here's what I'll do, take my staff and hold on to it. Now whenever you get angry my staff will remind you to come to me and I will get rid of your anger for you. So he went back to his quarters, and that night, he really got angry at some other monks. So he looked at the staff, and remembered the Roshi, so he started to run to the Roshi. And he finally got there, he was jogging all the way. So the Roshi said, what's wrong? And he said, I got angry. The Roshi said, show me your anger. Well, in the jogging the anger went away. He had nothing to show him and he said, I am not angry right now. The Roshi said, Go back to your quarters and when you get angry again come and tell me about it. The next day he got angry again. He ran to the Roshi and the same thing happened, in his running to the Roshi's anger disappeared. And the Roshi said, Where is your anger? And he said, It's gone now. This went on about twenty-five times. Finally the last time the Roshi said, Okay I'll tell you what you do now. When you get back to your quarters take my staff I gave you and when you get angry beat the living hell out of your anger with my staff. And this was so funny to the monk that he became realized he became enlightened. Because he realized he would take the staff and beat himself and his real self could never get angry. But, it was his body that appeared to be angry. And just that running back and forth twenty-five times, and the answer the Roshi gave him made him open his eyes and become enlightened. Though it is with us. Do not look at your problem as a problem. Look at it as a no thing. It doesn't exist. Again, if your ego does not exist, if your body does not exist, if your mind does not exist, how can you be angry? Where would it come from? Who gave it birth? And this is true of every other problem you believe you've got. Just by watching it like I just pointed out, it will disappear and you will awaken to your true self. Now we'll go into questions, feel free to ask anything you like. Do not be embarrassed. Ask a question about what we discussed or about what is going on in your life, for we're all one big happy family, so do not feel embarrassed to ask anything. Who's first? Long silence. Robert, well, I'll talk about something else. I was talking about all the phone calls I get in the beginning. People are still asking me, what do you think about this Swami? What do you think about this person? What's your opinion about this person and that person? Why shouldn't I go to see other teachers as well? And I really do not know what to say. You have to do what your heart tells you to do. But, I can tell you, the more people you see, the more confused you'll become. Now I don't care if you never come back here again, because I am not looking for anything. But if you do find a teacher that you seem to have an affinity with, you should stick around that teacher for a while. Because if you run from teacher to teacher, from meeting to meeting, you are going to become totally confused. Every teacher has their place. And you will be attracted to the person you have to be with for the time being. It all depends where your consciousness is. Again, I will discuss something that a couple of people have asked me to discuss. I've done this before. But, it is good to bring it up again and again every once in a while. There are three types of people who go on a spiritual path. One type is called the seeker, another is called a disciple, and the third is called a devotee. The seekers are the worst ones because they never stop seeking. 
While they're in class, they're thinking about who they're going to see tomorrow. They never stop. They run around from pillar to post. They go to India to seek a teacher. They go to Hawaii to see another teacher. They go to St. Louis when they hear about another teacher. And they're seekers. Now this is good to an extent because they're better off than the people who do nothing and think they're human. But you can be a seeker for a thousand lifetimes and it will never end. If you are a seeker that is really sincere and in your heart you truly wish to awaken, the time will come when you stop being a seeker and become a disciple. Now a disciple finds a teacher and tries to learn all they can from that teacher. But yet they still are not sure, they still have doubts. They still are interested in me, me, me. What am I getting out of this? What's in it for me? And once in a while, they will go to other teachers also. But they are still staying around one particular teacher, and they become a disciple of that teacher, but they are not that close. For if they hear about another teacher coming to town, they go see that teacher also. And of course there is confusion in their consciousness. But they are getting closer. If a disciple is really sincere in their heart, and they really have love and compassion and goodness and kind feelings towards all, they will eventually become a devotee. Now a devotee becomes the consciousness of the teacher. A devotee forgets all about him or herself. They can be in class, everyone is going wild, throwing spitballs at each other, but the devotee sees nothing but the teacher. The devotee is oblivious unto everything that is going on in the class, but only has love and good feelings to all, and is interested in the teacher's welfare and ultimately becomes enlightened, though it is devotees who awaken faster than anybody else. Think to yourself in what category are you? To be quite truthful with you, I would rather have five devotees around me than 10,000 people who are seekers. But now we'll go back to questions. Feel free to make comments. If you think I'm a dirty dog, just say so. Long silence. SN. Robert, it sounded like you were describing devotees as the Bactas. Where does that leave the Johnnies? Robert, Bactas and devotees and Johnnies are the same. A real Johnny is a devotee of the self, and the self is everywhere. So they are really a Bacta and they are a Jani. They are both the same. There is no differentiation really. SN, so you're saying actually the Johnny has a lot of love? Yes, they're supposed to or they wouldn't be a Johnny. SN, well I mean an aspiring. They should be full of love and kindness and joy and peace towards everything. SN. So really it is not too useful making that distinction? Who makes the distinction? Yeah, Johnny. The person who is not a Bacta and is not a Johnny makes the distinction. But, if a devotee even knows about these things, then they are aspiring for Jhana, they are aspiring for Bhakti, and they ultimately reach their goal because they learn to keep quiet. Not to talk too much. I think too much. Not to judge at all. But just to be quiet and watch. And they have got their eyes fixed on the teacher like a lion has its eyes fixed on a rabbit. It sees nothing but the rabbit. Everything may be going on all around the lion, but it only sees the rabbit until it catches its prey. Though a real devotee identifies totally with the teacher and finally becomes like the teacher. S.G. Robert, can all of these phases be passed through in one lifetime? Robert, yes definitely. They can all be passed through instantaneously. Like right now this moment. You just have to wake up. There is no time. Time is an illusion. SK, Robert, there are distinctions often made between a gradual path and instantaneous enlightenment. I find that throughout spiritual teachers, spiritual literature, 
and a lot of this stuff about passing through these stages. I can only talk about myself, I can't relate to it. I don't feel bad about it or good or anything, but it just doesn't make any sense to me. Robert, what can't you relate to? Well, just the idea that you pass through one stage to the next stage to the next stage. Robert, this is for the Ajani. SK, right? This is for the person who is striving. And of course, in truth, there is nothing to pass through. But, it appears that people need to understand these things so they can search in themselves and be able to see where they're coming from. And this will help them tremendously. Perhaps you don't need it. But, others do. SK, I think about the time when Ramana Maharshi went down to Paddy Muni and said something to Ramana about. I think Ramana said to them, you are the self, wake up. Or something and he said, don't they have to go through all these stages? And Ramana said, well maybe but I don't know anything else. Robert, that's right. Yeah. You know and I remember there were like two schools of thought at the ashram you know. People who believed there were gradual changes you had to go through and then there were people who believed in instantaneous enlightenment. Take break as the same student continues. It's not really the same as what you were talking about in your state, which is really, I wouldn't call happiness in a sense because it seems so far above the happiness that is the opposite to sadness. Robert, you're right. Sadness could even come into that state you are in, and it would only be some other thing that was passing through in a sense, wouldn't it? Robert, you're right. No identification. Robert, as an example, I can cry at a funeral, but I realize who's crying. I can have all kinds of sadness if I want to, but I am not really sad. You hit it right when you said that. It appears to be like that. SK, like the state of non-abiding mind, that's really the closest thing to it, isn't it? You are right, that's true. I am looking for words to describe this. But... There is always total happiness. But, it's not human happiness. There are no things involved. For most people to be happy, there has to be a person, place or thing involved in their happiness. But, in true happiness there are no things involved to make you happy. The natural state. And you abide in that state forever. SK, from the standpoint of practice, I've noticed that no matter what state comes up am I willing to ask myself, can I let this go? You know what I mean. Do I feel stuck in it, or is it that important to me that I stay in a sort of emotional state? And the real answer to that is that there is nothing you can do anyway. As it comes then it goes, and it is noticed to be that. Robert, and yet act as if there is something you can do, even though there is nothing you can do. Act as if there is something you can do. As an example, if you were passing a starving man on the road, don't say there is nothing you can do and leave him alone. Give him a piece of bread. Act as if there is something you can do. SK, but say in regard to the mind arising, emotions arising, perceptions arising, there is nothing you can do. Except watch, just watch, just observe and watch. SK, and even that, if you turn it into something you think you're doing, it is not what you are talking about. Yes. SK, in like Vipassana retreats for example you try to cultivate the mind that watches, but that couldn't be it. No it's not, it's beyond that. But you're doing that in the beginning as a procedure, a process, because that's where you're at at the time, that's what you need to do, so you can't say that's wrong or right. It's just where you're at now. Another thing to consider is this, if I were here as a visitor and having one class with you, and you never see me again, I would expound the highest truth and take off. And you would say how great that is. But, when I see you twice a week or more, I begin to know you quite well and everything I say is to help you grow because that is what needs to be said to you at that time, since I'm going to be with you. 
the people who were with Ramana as devotees, he didn't expound absolute truth to them all the time. He would talk to them like a normal person. He would inquire about their welfare, about their health, about their problems, and would give them practical advice. He wouldn't say, nothing matters because nothing exists. Laughter. They know that already, but they can't help it they've got the problems. So he would talk to them in a practical manner. S.G. Last night Robert my partner who is pregnant. Robert, your partner is pregnant. Who is responsible? Laughter. I don't know. Laughter. The child's coming in July at least that's what we think. Last night being with a pregnant woman is a great practice of not taking anything personal. Her mood changes within five minutes and last night though, she got really anxious about taking care of the child's insurance and where's the money going to come from. Working at the Bodhi Tree doesn't exactly bring in much money and I remember getting caught up in the emotions. While I was doing that I was asking, who's getting caught up in the emotions? But yet this body and emotions are getting caught up and it seems there is a part that just kind of watches it and there's a part that's kind, I don't know if it's a way of retreating or not wanting to look at what she's dragging me into. Robert, since you're living with her help her to the best of your ability. But, be impersonal. Do not become attached to it. Practice non-attachment. Yet help her all you can. Be kind gentle and do the best you can. S.G., it seemed like the most loving thing to do at the time would be to get insurance to help her fears. Well, if that's what you feel like doing, but just by being kind to her will help. Being gentle and peaceful and realize what she's going through. That alone will take care of it. But, as far as you're concerned, realize where all this is coming from. She's involved in the personal eye, and she's worried about her body and her affairs. Maybe you can help her in that way by telling her not to worry because God loves her and will take care of her and will watch her. Everything will turn out all right. That kind of advice will be helpful. S.G., a lot of the time she doesn't take that too well. Then just keep silent and say it to yourself. But, if you can become calm and peaceful something within you will tell you what to do. You will be advised by the powers that be. The more calm you can make yourself, the more peaceful you can make yourself, the more you can control your mind, the greater the answer will be. And you will know what to do and you'll do it for the good of all concerned. S.A. Robert I have something to say. I don't know whether it's a question though. Robert. Okay. I don't know if it's a statement either, but it seems to me sometimes that this is all very intellectual in spite of what you say. There's a lot of talking about the process, the asking about the I and all that kind of thing, and of course I've done a lot of reading like everybody else, and although I'm very critical of Gurdjieff, I was very interested in the idea of the dancing, of the work that was done. I mean physical work. As we know there's dancing in other systems. And sometimes I feel that it's almost more important to give attention to the body as it moves through life and as it moves through the day in certain ways, and that this is this unconscious knowledge that we're looking for, the approach to what we're looking for. That the body itself undergoes experiences that enlighten us, and this is in a different realm than our intellectual speculations. I know for example that when I dance, there's a place in Santa Monica called Dance Home, where sometimes at night you have 50 people dancing alone by themselves in a dark room with colored lights. For me this is a spiritual experience because there seems to be almost an integration of body-mind-spirit. Robert, of course the average person cannot sit home alone and think because they go crazy. So when you dance and when you become active it keeps you from going crazy from thinking. So what you're saying is true as far as that's concerned. But that's on a relative plane and you have to remember what body are you talking about. 
Body is transient, and you're not the same body you were 25 years ago. You're not the same body you were when you were 5 years old. You're a completely different body, so what body are you referring to? And pretty soon your body will become old and crippled and whatever. So will you be referring to that body? That cannot dance any longer, that has no energy, that has no power, that has to sit in bed all day when you get to be 90 years old and so forth. So what body are you referring to? Why keep your mind on your body when you can keep your mind on the self that never changes? That is imperishable. That was never born and can never die. That is permanent and that's your real nature. If you identify with that you will find eternal happiness and eternal peace. But if you identify with the body like you're doing, it will grow old and what will you do then? It will be time to die and you will be disappointed. S.A. I don't see that this is identification with the body. If anything it's a removal from the body. You're working with the body, so you have to think about your dance steps and you have to think about your dancing and having fun. The body work. S.K. Isn't it also that one shouldn't mistaken the release of endorphins in the brain to be a spiritual experience? Robert, that's true of course not. Endorphins the brain have nothing to do with the self. The self is the self. It's self-contained, it's happy, it's peaceful in its knowledge. Everything else is transitory, it comes and goes. The free choice we have is with whom shall we identify? With the body or the self? And that's your choice. If you choose the body then you come back life after life after life with other bodies, because if you identify with the body, there is not only one body, there are many bodies. It never ends. You are creating your own body, lifetime after lifetime until the time comes when you become disgusted with the body and then true spirituality begins. Another example, say you love to go dancing, and you're coming home one day from the dance, and you cross the street and a truck hits you and they have to amputate your legs. What do you think of that body? No legs and you can't dance. Now you have to stay in bed and you're only thinking of when you used to dance. You've wasted your time. I say, yes, but couldn't everything you've said about the body be applied to the mind also, because the mind, as you have said yourself, is just a tool to move beyond the mind. Robert, yes. So if that can be said of the mind, and if these attitudes can be had towards the mind, they can also be had towards the body-mind because they're both illusory. Robert, of course. But you're using the body to realize that you're not the body. You're not using it to get further involved in relative things. You use the mind and your body to get rid of the mind and the body, not to get more involved. That's why you watch yourself and you see yourself and you ask yourself, who loves to dance? Who loves to do all these things? I do. Who is this I? And we're talking about your personal I again. Everything is attached to the personal I. When you remove that idea that there's a personal I, true happiness automatically ensues and then, there's no question about it. Just like with me. I do not have to consider if dancing is more fun than being the self. There is no comparison. I don't know what to say. Dancing is for a time only. Just like you're an artist and a writer. That's great but it's for a time only. The time will come when you won't be able to do this anymore. You will be too old. Then what? You'll look back and you'll say, Ah, I used to be an artist. I used to be a great artist. And I used to be a great writer. I used to be a great dancer. But look at me now, I'm nothing. And you'll commit suicide perhaps, because you cannot do any more what you used to do. For you've been totally involved in the body consciousness. That's why I say find release now, find freedom now, so you don't have to go through this again and again and again. I say, Robert, 
how does all of this stack up with your ideas about pursuing the life that is wonderful as it is and being involved in all activities with detachment? Robert, you have no choice. The activities that you're involved in you were meant to be involved in them. And your mind will do what it has to do to make you further involved. The freedom you have got is simply to question, who am I? What is the source of I? And as you question, your involvement in life, so to speak, will become less and less, and you will become happier and happier. But, if you do not question, then you will get deeper involved and deeper involved and deeper involved and pretty soon you'll think that's your life. But, again as I said, you will grow older and older and older and then you will just drop dead one day. And you will pick up another body and repeat the whole thing over again. There is no end to it. Until you give up that concept. S.G. Robert, I have a question about two things that were already asked. One is, as you said in the beginning, was when we come to satsang we tend to pick up the feeling that's present, and at the same time when we're in the company of someone that's having intense emotions we become that. Also there was the question of gradual awakening or sudden awakening. My question is this, if we are subject to these types of emotions, is it necessary for us to work on ourselves and gradually not identify with this, or is it something that just happens suddenly, in other words do we not be upset at ourselves for identifying with emotions and realize it happens all of a sudden, or should we work on ourselves? Robert, okay to work on yourself is simply to know I am not the body or these emotions. And as you identify with your source, everything will take care of itself. You do not work on the emotions, because they will pop up somewhere else as I've said before. But, if you work on the source of your emotions, and realize that in reality, there are no emotions to begin with because there is only the self. And the more you awaken to that fact, that the self alone exists and everything else is false, then you will begin to mellow out. S. So it is gradual? It depends, no. As you keep working on yourself, you can awaken instantaneously and be free of it, or it can be gradual. It is up to you. It depends what you put into it. Everybody is different. SF, isn't there always a preliminary growth before the Johnny takes care of all these things? Robert, for some people. Some people just wake up. When you have a dream is there a preliminary before you wake up? Or do you just wake up? Everybody just wakes up. Though it is with this. As you keep abiding in the self one day, you will just awaken and be done with it, and you will be free. Though don't think of preliminaries. Focus on the self and everything will take care of itself. Then, if we don't see progress within ourselves, but we continually see ourselves get upset with the situations around us, we shouldn't let that bother us. Robert, keep observing, keep watching, and keep focusing on the self, and there will be nobody to ask who is bothered or who is not bothered by it. You only ask a question like that when your attention is more on the bothering than it is on the self. But, if you change your attention, and you put all your energy on the self, then you will see what happens. S. The question is, is that gradual? For some people. It depends how much time you give to it. Sen, we can't just turn our emotions off. Because I can relate to experiences I'm having at work, and sometimes I go to the office there is such an intensity there and people are snapping at each other, I get caught up in it. Of course I become aware, usually after the fact and then I say to myself, well is there something that I'm aware of? And gradually by abiding in myself gradually not identifying with it, or is it something that someday, I'll suddenly awaken? Robert, that's why I say in the morning when you first open your eyes, that's the time to work on yourself. And ask yourself, who am I? How did I get here? And reconcile yourself with yourself. If you do that first thing upon waking up, 
then the whole day will be good and you won't have those problems. Just don't get up and run out to work. Get up an hour early if you have to. And see yourself for what you are and realize the truth. Focus on the self. Ask yourself, who am I, and wait. Think of your source, concentrate on the source of I am, or just say to yourself, I am, I am, and then go to work. And you'll see changes, miraculous changes. SN. Well what I'm saying is when I'm in the company of other people, not when I'm alone. When I'm in the company of other people, I tend not to be in control except I get caught up in whatever they're caught up in. Robert, well that's later, but if you are in the company of yourself and you do the work on yourself, you will build up a power. SN, right. That you will carry with yourself all day long. And that won't happen. SN, the whole thing of losing your center, losing that sense of, you get lost. That's why before you go to sleep and when you wake up, that is the time to work on yourself. If you do it correctly, it will take over your life. And all will go well with you. SF. Robert, I'm still confused about this abiding in the self and you wake up. Abidance in the self, I don't think it implies knowing or being already the self and then arriving there. Robert, um. Rather than a gesture for the self such as deep self-inquiry, could mean that maybe. Or it may lead to that arriving in the self. That's natural arriving in the self. Robert, abiding in the self is knowing I am, is being I am. So when you say, I am, you are abiding in the self. SF thank you. SN, now to follow it to its source, take for instance if you find the I by self-inquiry abide in that, seems to me to be in that state is kind of stateless. Like non-existence. So to follow, what do you mean by follow it? Because it already seems like no existence? Robert, don't worry about being non-existent. Simply observe the eye and watch it going into the heart. SN, so it is not so much a following, it is just that it happens of itself. It happens of itself. SF, so Robert when I contemplate, I am. It means right then I am abiding in the self. Robert, yes it does that's the same thing. SF, when I say, I am, is this empirical person right I'm using my mind and I'm still in duality. But in this contemplation of I am does duality exist or it doesn't? Yes, you're using your mind. When you're saying, I am, I am, you are transcending the personal I, and you are opening yourself up to your own reality. SF, so abidance and self is taking place then? Yes, it is taking place right then and there. SF, thank you. SK, Robert, it's because we have the concept, we are not the self that we miss the fact that we are abiding in the self all the time, and that's what's left out in this discussion. As Ramana said, we only have the doubt we are not the self, but the truth is we have always been that. Robert, exactly. Though we only have to lose something we don't even really have. Robert, that's why we go through all these troubles and play all these games, until we realize, I am the self. And that's it. SK, and that's all you've ever been. The other is just a false mind. But, if we can't see that we have to play all these games I guess it's fun. SG, Robert, if we don't know the self and we are saying, I am, what is to keep that from becoming a parrot-like repetition? Robert, it doesn't become a parrot-like repetition if you do it with your breath. If you inhale say, I. When you exhale say am, I am. A subtle change of energy takes place within yourself, and you'll find, you will become more peaceful, more calm, and pretty soon you will lose all identification with your body-mind, and you will remain as I am. It helps. Try it. SG, as you were saying earlier, you were also talking about identifying with the self as identifying with the source. 
in my state of ignorance doing something as simple as just saying, I am, and coordinating with the breath, is the best I can do to identify with the way you're talking about. Robert, well that's one way to do it, do that. But, then you should also ask yourself who thinks they are ignorant. Who believes they're not the self? I do. Who am I? And you go right back to it again. Use the method that helps you the most. For some people just saying, I am does the trick. Other people have to work with, who am I continuously. Self-inquiry is the fastest way to wake up. SF, when contemplating I am it's self-inquiry itself, Robert. Robert, yes it is. Of course it is definitely. SF, and it is just a question of remembrance what Richard was saying, actually. Robert, yes. Romano would say we are the self, but we don't remember so we need to work on it. And when we use self-inquiry which of course takes several forms, which you have explained thoroughly and particularly I love this much, I am because I can see some movement. I do not know how to explain it. A movement of energy that's valid when I contemplate I am, so I thank you for it, thank you very very much. Robert, oom. Um. I'm glad it's working for you, but be careful about these things. Don't be like the Santa Cruz lady who called me. He's a doctor and she was operating in the emergency room. And she stopped everything and called me and said, Should I concentrate on I am while I'm operating or should I just forget about I am for now? I wonder what happened to the patient. Students laugh. S.N. Robert, when we do self-inquiry, actually that is the beginning step to find the I. When we develop a sense of abiding in the eye, there's not too much need of self-inquiry because we go straight to the abiding. Robert, self-inquiry has no beginning. If you do, who am I? It's very powerful. It sounds simple, but it's very, very powerful. All you've got to say is, who am I? Take a pause, say it again, who am I? Never answer. Keep saying, who am I? Who am I? Eventually, something will happen. SN, I'm saying if you develop a sense of self abidance you can almost watch yourself go in and out of those states, you can almost watch yourself. Now I'm identifying with the ego and what I'm saying is, self-inquiry is, to get you to that state, but once you have a feel for that, you go directly to that. Robert, if you are abiding in the self, there is no ego to watch because there is only the self. You watch the ego with the mind, not with the self. So if you abide with the self there is nothing else. You are finished. You're cooked. Everything else is of the mind. So when I say abide in the self, I mean forget everything and be yourself. There is nothing else to know at that point. Just be yourself. SF, Robert, I was unable to understand the use of the breath in connection with I am. Robert, you are unable to understand. Yes, how do you use it? Robert, you inhale you say, I you exhale you say, am, with your breath when you inhale exhale. And you will notice after a while your breathing begins to slow down and the periods between. I am is becoming longer and longer. And pretty soon you lose body consciousness and you get lost in I am itself. And you will become consciousness I am. SG, Robert, you say about the breath slowing down, depends on meditation, it happens frequently now that I seem to be aware of the body and the heart seems to stop and I am aware of not breathing. Then. I get shoved right back into the body. Robert, that's all of the mind, it all comes out of the mind. Go oh, beyond all that stuff. Do not pay attention to that. Inquire, to whom does that come? And go beyond it. And abide in the self. See, we shouldn't get lost too much in procedures and methods. Remember, in reality, procedures and methods do not exist. 
only the self exists. Though use the methods and procedures with a grain of salt. Try to stay at the source of I and be free. I notice the more we talk about it, the more we talk about procedures, you can get lost in procedures. You'll then know that I am as God. Though by keeping the mind still you become God faster. So don't contemplate procedures. Do the procedures if you have to but go beyond it fast. Leave it behind and abide in the I am. SK, Robert I think it was Nisargadita who said that the sage gives a description of reality, not a prescription. He doesn't give you something to do. You go to a doctor for that. He tells you where it's at or how it is and it's for your own recognition when you see it. Because reality is always the same, and when you see it, it's when you see it. Robert, it is interesting to note, what you are saying is true, but it's interesting to note that all these words of Nisargadaita and Ramana were given to new students every time they came. And then they go away. And then new ones would come, and they would ask the same questions and he would give the same answers. And that is how all the books were written. But what did he do with his direct disciples and the devotees? He was human to them. Do you know what I'm saying? SK, yeah. Well, I can only take your word in a way, and there was no way of knowing, but it makes total sense. Sure, this is why as I said before if I were a guest here for one time, I would fill you with the absolute, totally and completely. Because you're not going to see me for another couple of years. But, when I have to see you all of the time you're telling me about your practice and what's going on, and we have to have a dialogue which is normal. Nothing wrong with that. SG, we could still have a guest appearance. Students laugh. We could have a truth hour. Robert, I do that every time I see you. What kind of truth are you looking for? Just by being here you've got it. SF, Robert, from what I've been reading about Ramana, well actually there was not much of self-inquiry, but much of devotion. Robert, exactly. Mainly devotion to the body or to the presence of the master. Robert, yes that's true. And they were getting more out of it than what he would be teaching. Robert, you're right. This is why I tell you every once in a while the story about the devotee who used to pull his, Ramana's fan. He used to stand by Ramana and pull his fan for forty years. Then one day, he dropped dead. And Ramana looked at him and told the devotees, he's all cooked. He's not coming back again. SF, also the provision of descriptions, they give about Ramana what was his effect on them. It seems that they were all contemplating him tremendously. Yes, you're right. SF, I think that's a quality of the way to a Johnny. Robert, you're right. That's why it's a combination of Bacta and Jhana. SF, the contemplation of the master in his physical form standing near him being close to him. That's very true. SF, I think that's all part of the scene of the Johnny and his disciples or devotees. You're right. SV, God Guru Self. Robert, what's that? God Guru Self? Robert, God Guru Self is right. This is why I said before, I don't know if you were here or at. I said, I would rather have five devotees with me than five thousand lookers and seekers and searchers and disciples because the five devotees would become realized in this life. The rest are only searching looking. Though you're right, absolutely. It's hard for a westerner to understand that because a westerner's ego is very very big no matter what you say. Long silence. Um shanti 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 um shanti. Silence is the greatest teacher. Remember to love yourself, to bow to yourself, to pray to yourself, to worship yourself because God dwells in you as you. I love you. Peace. At this point the tape ends.
Transcript 31. Everything is satsang. 16th December 1990. Robert, okay welcome to the Thursday Night Icebox. It's good to see you again. What are we really here for? S.H. Good question. Laughter as Robert continues. What are we really here for? Nobody knows, nobody cares. If you think about that, you will notice that you are here for a purpose. And as long as you think there is a purpose to your life, you'll get nowhere. As far as self-realization goes, self-realization has no purpose whatsoever. Any purpose, any concept spoils it. Any preconceived idea, anything that is known spoils it. There is nothing to be gained in coming here. What I mean is this, as long as you are looking for gain of some kind the reverse will happen. When you realize that everything that you want you already have, then something begins to shine inside of you. But, as long as you believe you need something, or you have to gain something then there is always a battle going on between yourself. People have asked me they tell me that self-inquiry is too hard. I can't understand this because it's the easiest thing I can think of. But, yet for some people it's too hard, so they say. It is written in all the books that self-inquiry is for the mature soul. Which means a person who has gone through all the teachings in past lives, pranayama, yoga, all these other things, they have already experienced these things before. And now self-inquiry comes easy to them. But some people say, I can't really seem to get anything out of self-inquiry. So my question to them is, then why were you attracted to this path? If you are attracted to this path, it means that you are ready for this. But, the question I'm still getting is, sometimes I'm not in the mood to practice. Sometimes I don't feel right when I practice. Is there anything I can do before to get me in the mood to practice? And the answer is yes. If you like before you practice self-inquiry, you can pray to your favorite God. Whoever he or she may be. Then when you become devotional you will want to practice self-inquiry also. So what is something you can do before self-inquiry? Well let's see. You can take a statement such as, There is one life. That life is consciousness, and that life is all there is, and that life is my life now. Think about that. There is one life. That life is consciousness. That life is all there is, and that life is my life now. And you ask yourself, what does this mean? You see you don't have to practice self-inquiry by asking, who am I all the time? You do not have to start that way at all. You can take something like we just said and inquire to yourself of its meaning. You understand that there is one life and that life is consciousness. And you talk to yourself this way, you say, well this means there is nothing else that exists but consciousness. If only consciousness exists, where does love come from or harmony or peace or joy or bliss? You think about that. And then the answer comes, why these verities must be synonymous with consciousness. In other words, consciousness is another term for bliss or love or joy or peace. Though if you have consciousness you have the rest. And if that is all there is that must be me now. Not tomorrow or the next day or next week but right now. I must be that consciousness and consciousness must be omnipresence. Everywhere present at the same time. There is nothing else. This means that I've got no problems. There is nothing wrong anywhere. All is well. Because there is no other place for it to come from can't you see? There is no place for troubles to come from. There is no place for disharmony. There is no place for evil. But, then something inside of you says, well it exists. Look at man's inhumanity to man. Look at what is going on in the world, the homeless, the starving children of Ethiopia and so forth. Disharmony does exist. But, 
if you are inquiring in the right way in yourself, something will ask you and come to you and say, yes, but to whom does it exist? This means that it is not like you're trying to ignore these things, but you are coming from a different space. You see the world differently. You begin to realize that you are the self of all. The word self with a capital S does not mean you as yourself as an individual. When you experience the self, you are the self of all. You are the universe. You become all things. In other words, everything is taking place within you. Once you realize that you are the cause of everything in this world, something within you stops reacting. You stop reacting. You see what's going on, but you stop reacting because you become the self of all. In other words, you take the screen and its objects that are shown on the screen. You begin to understand that you are like the screen and all of the things in the world, the good, the bad and the in-between are the objects on the screen. The screen is never affected by the objects. No matter what the objects do that are shown, the screen is never affected. There may be pictures of man's inhumanity to men on the screen, murderers, rapists, lovers, hypochondriacs, all kinds of people are on the screen. Laughter. But the screen is never affected. You become somewhat like the screen. You have a great compassion, a great love, but you are no longer affected by person, place or thing. This does not mean you do not care. If you see somebody starving, it's you that's starving. Because it's all taking place within you. If somebody is hurting, it's you that's hurting. Because it is taking place within yourself. You see, everything is an outlet of your consciousness. But, there is something within you that keeps you from reacting to things. So in that sense, when somebody else asks, I can't wait to become self-realized because the world sucks. The world is terrible. I want to become realized so I do not have to put up with the world. Or there are people who say, I wish I can die so I can become self-realized and not have to deal with the world. And there are people who actually think that if you die or if you awaken you will be finished with the world. But, my friends, it's just in reverse. You see, everything is happening now. What this means is, whatever you think about the world now, you are going to think about the world after. It doesn't change. It is just like when you go to sleep. The last thing you think about when you go to sleep you usually think about when you wake up. So if you're thinking about things that are evil all over the world and then you happen to leave your body, you're simply going to take on another body and continue where you left off. Or if you believe if you awaken that will be the end of it. You can't awaken until you feel harmony first. The last step before awakening is when you no longer react to life and you begin to feel harmony, everywhere under all conditions, under all circumstances. And then you awaken. But, if you are feeling distraught and angry and upset and you are practicing to awaken you will never awaken. As long as you have those feelings, those feelings have to go first. You have to harmonize yourself with the universe. You have to reconcile yourself to the whole universe starting with the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom and the human kingdom. You have to develop a feelings of love and compassion towards everything. In other words, devotion leads to jhana. So the person who is not a devotee to life, a person who has no compassion and no love can never awaken, it's impossible. It's a prerequisite to awakening. And you have to develop these traits by yourself. Nobody can bring them to you. It's the same with satsang. People tell me they love to come to sats, and because they get rid of the world for a while. They find peace at satsang and the world's terrible. But, I say to you that wherever you go in the world that satsang too. Feelings you have with people is satsang. Your reaction to person, place or thing is satsang. Everything you do is satsang. 
The whole universe is satsang. Do not believe that only when you come here you have satsang. Everything is satsang. So to awaken you have to let go of all your prejudices, all your preconceived ideas, all your concepts and become totally free. Now when that happens, people come to me and they say, well I've done all that already and now I'm experiencing the void. I'm experiencing emptiness, so I must be self-realized? On the contrary, as long as there is somebody to experience the void they can never become self-realized. The experiencer has to go. Nobody is left to tell about it. You have to go beyond the void. And what happens when you get beyond the void? You become yourself. You become yourself just the way you are, your natural self. Words cannot explain. People also believe that when you become the self, you become indifferent. You have a, I don't give a damn, attitude about anything. Of course that's erroneous. When you become yourself, you become loving, kind, peaceful. You automatically become in love with everything. You no longer are disturbed by the world or anything else, and you become radiantly happy. It seems strange how you can be happy when all of these dastardly things are going on in the world. But remember, they're going on within yourself, not outside of yourself. And they are false images, just like the images on the screen. The images on the screen appear to be real, don't they? But if you try to grab them, what happens? You grab the screen. They're like an optical illusion. Though, the world is like that. It is like an optical illusion. It is not an optical illusion to the person who is not realized. In other words, as long as you believe that you are the body-mind phenomena, the world is real to you. And you have to take whatever action you have to take to make the world a better place in which to live. But, when you have semblance of realization the world becomes an optical illusion. Just like the mirage in the desert. You see water in the desert, and you think it is there. But, upon close investigation it is not there at all. Though the world appears to be real and everything in it appears to be real. But upon a close investigation you see it doesn't exist at all. But remember what I said, it exists to the Ajani, to the non-enlightened person. The world is very very real. Therefore do not walk around saying the world is false. For as long as you believe you are real, your body that is, to that extent is the world also real. But, once you can feel that you are not the body and that you are not the mind, then you're also not the world. Do not fool yourself. Do good works in the world. Help all you can. Then when you do get self-realized, then you'll know what you have to do at that time. So again, do not walk around telling people the world is not real, it is only a dream. Because unless you can feel that your body is also a dream, and you know that you know this, to that extent will the world be a dream. And when you wake up, again will you find that the whole universe is superimposed upon yourself. Like an optical illusion. Any questions about that? Tape break returns to student asking a question. S.H. Why would I want to superimpose the world on myself? Robert, you don't you have nothing to do with it. It's just the way it appears. S.H. Well, superimpose the appearance in the seeming self. It's all an appearance it appears that way. S.H. Yeah, why? It's just one of those things. Students laugh. S.H. I know it is one of those things. Why bother? Yeah. I can say that in reality, it doesn't exist. S.H. Yeah, you can say that. I know, but you want to understand what I'm talking about and you say, but you just said it does exist. S.H. I don't say that. But, in reality, nothing exists. But, for the sake of explaining things and talking, the universe is superimposed on consciousness. 
SH, and you are that consciousness. You are that consciousness. SH, so it is superimposed on quote, you. Yes, but in reality it's not. In real reality. SH, because there is nothing there in the first place. Exactly, so in real reality we would keep silent. But, since I have to sit here and talk like an idiot student's laugh, we have to try to explain it somehow, and that's how we explain it. But as far as I'm concerned, nothing exists. ST, if it doesn't exist, why do we need to help it? Robert, help it to what? Why do we do good works? To correct what we see if we realize that it's not there. Robert, because you do not realize it's not there. If you really realized it's not there, you wouldn't ask the question. ST, is it so that suffering exists in the mind of the sufferer? Suffering exists in the mind of the unenlightened person. So the one who is suffering believes they're suffering. The one who watches believes they're suffering. But, when that feeling is taken away and illumination comes, everything is different. ST, if the observer appears or imagines that he is at peace about someone else's suffering, is it because he feels that the recovering person has made the choice to suffer? No, as long as you imagine, you will always see suffering. And as long as you see suffering, it's your duty to help and to do good for people and help them get out of it, that's your duty. As long as you believe that you are a human being. But as soon as you realize that you are not a human being, that you are consciousness, the whole story changes completely. So it is completely different. ST. Believing that one is consciousness or knowing one is consciousness. Becoming, not believing, not knowing, but becoming. When you become it's something else completely. And when you use words to try to understand and try to explain you can't. Because the finite can never comprehend the infinite. So you have to become that yourself in order to know what's going on. But, in the interim you have to help suffering humanity, all you can until you rest apart from it. And to relieve the suffering of people. SD, so Robert are you saying then that the rules are different? Robert, of course they are. When you are unenlightened versus when you're enlightened. Robert, very much so, in reality nobody suffers. But, when you are not seeing reality, there is terrible suffering going on. Okay, it's like the experience changes, no rules per se, it's all experience. Robert, you can say that yes. You just see it differently. Everything becomes different. St, when Jesus said, I believe I don't know the Bible verse when someone said something awful to him, he said, what is that to do with you? Robert, well that's a very high statement. ST, excuse me. That's a very high statement he made he's right. But, that's in the higher sense. If the person is realized then what has that got to do with you? But if the person is not realized then it is his duty to help and to alleviate him. There are two ways to look at this of course. If Jesus was working on his disciple, who knows what he was teaching them. So maybe he didn't want the particular person to go out into the world and become worldly. He probably wanted him to stay close to Jesus. So he said, don't worry about the world, your job is with me. Hit him on that path. There are different ways to look at these interpretations of Jesus. SR. Robert, in the earlier part of what you said, you mentioned what are our attitudes toward things etc., how we see the world as an example. In order to be free is it necessary to give up all your preferences? I can give some examples. I would much rather prefer to be in a different sort of environment where there are more trees and plants and things like that for several reasons. Robert, yes. Is it necessary to give those feelings up in a sense? Robert, 
You can change your environment, but your reaction to them has to be given up. It doesn't matter where you go to live. But, as long as you see something wrong or something is bad in one place as compared to another place, it's keeping you back from final realization. SR, what about the example of say, of how pollution affects my body and things like that, that's the kind of things I have to deal with. Well that means that you believe you still have a body. And as long as you believe that you have got a body then you have to take of it. Then you're right. When you finally see that you don't have a body and you are not the body or the mind then it doesn't matter where you live. SR, would it be sort of like just giving up the feeling of providing for yourself in circumstances and just kind of letting go and letting God? Robert, again what happens is this, when we are no longer the body, the body knows what to do all by itself. Even better than when you can take care of it. So your body will do the right thing. Irrespective of what you believe. If you stop interfering with it, it knows how to take care of itself. But, if you think you have got to interfere with it, then you will pick places to live. You will go here, and you will go there, and you will buy a certain things to take care of yourself. You will do all kinds of things to take care of the body. But, when you realize, I am not the body, I am the self, then the body will do what it came here to do. Karmically your body knows what it has to do, and you can't stop it no matter how you try. So the best thing to do is say, not my will, but thine, and stop trying to make something happen. Everything will happen all by itself. SR, will that be the doership? Yes, becoming a non-doer, as long as you believe I am the doer you've got a problem. Because you will always be the doer and you will always try to improve or correct your life to no avail. But, as soon as you know that I am not the doer everything starts to happen like it is supposed to and you're happy. SR, does that include or is it exclusive of a feeling of apathy? In my case I find myself more apathetic towards things like making money and different things that I used to care about. Sometimes I care that I don't care anymore. I have an apathy towards the world, in a certain sense like it seems more beautiful one way and then in the same sense things that were part of my life before like careers and jobs all that just seem to be, can't even find the handle of where they're at. Robert, it depends on your karma of the body. I'm sure you have read the story of King Janaka, the old Indian saint who was self-realized. And yet he ruled the kingdom and did a lot of work. Your body will do what it came here to do. It has no apathy, no resentment and no love for itself. But, if your body is supposed to become a herb doctor at will. If it is supposed to become a nurse at will. If it is supposed to do no work, it will do no work. But, it has nothing to do with you. But, you will be happy. You will always be blissful and happy. And yet your body will do whatever it came here to do. So if your body is suffering a little, it will not affect you. You will not be affected. For instance, say you became enlightened and then you were arrested for a crime you didn't commit. You wind up in jail for 10 years. Your body going through its karma has absolutely nothing to do with you. And you'll be the happiest inmate that ever existed. Dude and slav. Really? Though it doesn't mean when you become enlightened your body doesn't go through anything. It just doesn't disturb you for you're not it. And that's a hard one to comprehend. Because you say, I'm looking at your body and I see it. But who sees? You are seeing a misinterpretation because the body doesn't exist at all like you think it does. So we should stop worrying about it and get on with our life. Robert sips tea, then a student takes tea bag out of cup. Robert, see even that, it doesn't belong to him, it was all preordained. Laughter. As strange as it may seem, it was all preordained. SD, by what Robert? By what? 
ST. Yes or by whom? By the self. ST. Is the self occupying itself with the tea bag? Laughter. All these things are meant to happen before. S. H. Each blade of grass. Everything is preordained. S. K. Robert, that was an interesting question of the self asked if consciousness itself is the tea bag. I had a few friends that I invited to meet you over the last month or two and one of the questions that seemed to be disturbing for them was the idea. It was an interesting question like, is there one important thing that the body is here to do, for example? It was a real fascinating question for me to kind of throw around, that question reminded me of that. Is there any big things or little things in the eyes of the self? Robert, no, there is not, and it has no purpose. But, karmically these little things are all going on. In reality they do not exist. But, karmically they appear to go on. Karmically everything is preordained. When realization comes the whole story changes. There's no coming, there is no going. S.H. It wipes out karma completely. Robert. It wipes out everything. S.E. Well there is nothing there to have karma. S.H. Right. Robert. So as long as we think we are the body-mind phenomena then preordination exists. And karma exists. And reincarnation exists. And God exists. And all the rest exists. S.G. I was once listening to him one day you were talking about how we pride ourselves in fact with free will. When we think about it the body is going on, most of its functions are going on without our conscious control. And even the thought of moving my finger, where does that thought come from? Who made that decision to do that? We don't know, we can't think it. Robert, well it's karmic. S.G., right. Everything is karmic. But, see the difficult part is to comprehend this, that in reality it doesn't exist. That's the hard part to comprehend. Because it may appear like I'm moving my finger, but I know I'm not. S.H. Nothing so whatever is occurring. Robert. Nothing is occurring. There is only consciousness and that is all there is. S.K. Some people say that is a cop-out. Laughter. Robert. Of course they do, but who says that? S.H. He's telling you, you're copping out. Laughter. S.E. Is the phenomena my hand, is that different from consciousness, or are they the same? Robert, everything is consciousness, but in appearance it's different. S.F. The appearance then it's not consciousness. Robert, yes, as long as you believe that you are the body-mind then it's real. But, it's still consciousness. Going back to the screen again. You draw a picture of a hand on the screen. It's meaningless to the screen, but it's important to the hand. S.E. This spoon does that exist or doesn't exist? Laughs. Robert, it exists as long as you believe you are the body. When you're not the body that doesn't exist. S.E. What is the nature of its existence when you don't believe it exists anymore? I mean it's an appearance. Robert, it's consciousness. No, that's just a word. Robert, explain the question. This is different from this. Touch is two objects, whether you are enlightened or not enlightened. The teacup that you're drinking out of is used to drink. This is for the tea bag and this is for the functions of images of different. For Christ's sake, stop laughing. I'm trying to make a fucking point. I'm trying to get this serious. Now how are they different or how are they the same? Robert, they appear to be different because at this point is a tape break. If you try to grab these things on the screen you grab the screen. The same thing is happening to those who believes that they're the body and the mind. 
but once they transcend the everything becomes different. But you can't see it right now because you are in control of the body and the mind. You're involved with the body and the mind. Though everything appears separate. S.E. The screen and the images on the screen in your analogy are not different. They're the same, it's all the screen. The images don't really exist. Though as long as we believe we are alive as a body everything becomes real to us, the whole world, the whole universe. And I admit, it's a difficult subject to comprehend. This is why we have to do the work and experience it for ourselves. Otherwise, like I always say, you should not believe me. Why should you accept what I say? You have to find out for yourself. SK, the person who experiences illumination, sometimes the experience is described as effulgence everywhere. They don't see form identified, there's no form anymore, it's all consciousness, and they perceive it that way and can only perceive form. But, that isn't maintained all the time throughout their whole life, maybe this for some people otherwise they couldn't see a human being in front of them or not. Robert, no, it doesn't work like that. Consciousness perceives the images. But it realizes they're not real, that's it. Whereas if you're not consciousness, you perceive the images and you believe they're real. SH, does consciousness instigate the images? Robert, no. SH, what brings them about? They don't exist at all. SH, well what brings the non-existing images about? Nothing, they don't exist, they never existed and never will exist. They don't really appear. SK, Robert are you a Johnny? Have you attained realization? Robert, who knows what I am? There is nobody left to tell. SK, then you perceive this to be a form here. I perceive that as being an object. But, then, a material object. I perceive that as being consciousness, but I see it as an object. SK, what is the difference between a state that others perceive as human beings wherein they don't even observe forms, even? They observe consciousness as such a unity that they don't even see a table or a person. Robert, if they didn't they wouldn't be in their body. As long as you have your body left you see things. SK, well you're not in your body. But you think I am. SK, I know but same with them. But, how do you know what they see? SK, I don't. So why are you saying that? SK, because it seems that when people come down from such an experience that's what they relate to other people. You're speaking of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. SK, well I don't know what I want to call it, I realize you have a certain view on what Nirvikalpa Samadhi means and I don't mean that. When you close your eyes and you shut everything out then you see nothing. But, as long as you are functioning in the world you have got to see images to function. Otherwise you wouldn't be in your body. SK, there are instances of people that I've heard personally where part of their eyes were open in such an experience. How would they survive? SK, I don't know. But I know that when they come down supposedly down from such an experience, that they perceive form. No realization doesn't come down and it doesn't go up. SK, then what is that? I don't know what you are talking about. I don't know what you're saying. If a person saw nothing, he would never get out of bed. He would be dead. ST, just for a temporary experience allegedly people have this experience? Robert, oh yes temporarily people can go into samadhi and see consciousness, sure. ST, and then come back. Robert, sure. Without dying? SK, with eyes open. Robert, yes that can happen, but it's not self-realization. SK, what is it? It's a high state of consciousness. SK, 
What if their so-called come down from only seeing effulgence everywhere, and they come down supposedly enough to see form, was the same as your outlook? It doesn't happen that way. SK, why wouldn't it happen that way? When somebody goes into Samad, he they lose the world, they lose consciousness. SK, I'm talking about with their eyes open. With their eyes open or closed. But, once they get up they have to experience the world again. SK, but what if they are standing up? They'll fall down laughter. Because they're not seeing anything, they're not feeling anything. They have to sit down or lie down. SK, I don't know why that would occur. Because they're not seeing the world like you say, they're just seeing consciousness. Because they can't function. They can't walk, they can't do anything. The body becomes totally immobile. But, Sahaja Samadhi is total realization all the time and being aware all the time of consciousness. SK, so I guess the implication I guess is that some of these people may attain that Samadhi when they come down there in non-realization anymore. Robert, but there is no such a thing as being in realization and coming down out of realization. SK, the Samadhi I'm talking about is coming out of some space of seeing, instead of only seeing effulgence as consciousness, but coming down to a state of also seeing form as consciousness. You're talking about a high state of realization, but not total realization. Total realization, you see forms as consciousness. SK, so my question is, what if those people also saw that? Then they would be self-realized. SK, right and yet at times before that occurring that all they saw was effulgence with forms, form even. As long as you see effulgence, and as long as you see form, somebody has to be the seer. If somebody is left to be the seer, you are not self-realized. SK, so as long as I have ever heard a story from someone then, they weren't totally realized. Exactly, because they can tell the story, they can relate it. SK, yet you have been able to relate stories about yours. Sure, because I'm talking to you. SK, so couldn't that be their state as well? If you're speaking of a state that they're experiencing, not what they're talking about, that's different. They can talk to you about things, but they have got to be able to see forms to do so. Can they talk to you while they're seeing nothing? SK, no. Of course not. To be able to talk to a group of people you have got to see forms. SK, the questions is, why is there a difference? How can they see just effulgence? Because they have meditated for years. In your meditation you begin to see an effulgence all the time. While you're in meditation. But, then you've got to come out of it and you become an ordinary person. SK, and yet can still perceive everything as consciousness and be totally self-realized. If you're totally self-realized you do not have to meditate to see effulgence because you're in that state all the time. If you have to meditate you are not self-realized. SK, yay, but I'm not talking about self-realization. Though the person that you're talking about is not self-realized. SH, what is being self-realized? What is it anyway? Robert, being awake. That's just a synonym. Robert, exactly, it's being awake. Awake to reality. Awake to yourself. SG, it sort of seems like we're all in this big 3D movie. And we all sort of believe it, and you're sort of saying this is just a movie we're watching. Robert, that's right. But, we're all part of the dream and you are saying we believe all these images that are floating around here. You can say we're just caught up in that. Robert, well put it this way. Take the analogy of the screen and the images. I'm aware of the screen 24 hours a day. While most people are aware of the images 24 hours a day. That's the only difference. 
SK, we're taking the images as being real. Yes. SR. Is that what Ramana said when he said the fundamentals you already know, you should notice that because you know the I was always there like he said, the fundamentals you surely know. You could never lose that after the first experience. Robert, exactly that's right. Though you're always aware of the presence of the fundamental I, and no matter what appears in front of it. Robert, doesn't matter. Doesn't obscure it or doesn't take the attention away from it? Robert, indeed. You know when you were talking J2, you mentioned something that I could think of in terms of whenever the scene appears, there's a seer they come together. Though if something is appearing it has to be appearing to someone. We sort of take it as two separate things, but the reality of seeing is that if there is a seer then there is a seeing and vice versa. They appear as really the same thing. SK, I've noticed that someone tells a story that yes they have experiences like that. Robert, well you can tell a story, but they're talking about their own personal experience. SR, if someone sees something they exist as a seer and so they identify with that. Robert, yes. SK, Robert sees form. As consciousness. SK, my question is very subtle. It's taken for granted that if someone is self-realized and as you say, you see form as consciousness. They also see form as consciousness but sometimes, who knows how or why. They don't even see form as consciousness because it turns into effulgence as consciousness. Robert, well the effulgence, the void, visions, all are projections of the mind. Consciousness is beyond the effulgence. You're speaking as if effulgence is the final state. SK, yeah right. Effulgence is not the final state. SK, so the final state is seeing these forms as consciousness. Robert, exactly. SK, that's the final state? Yes. The final state is being consciousness itself. And realize that all this is the self and I am that. SH, is that the state you are in? Robert, who knows? Who knows that's a cop-out Bob? Robert, what can I say? Give me a straight answer. Robert, I've got no idea. SR, but you are aware that what you fundamentally are is always existing. Robert, yes. SH, are you unbrokenly aware of the screen only? Robert, 24 hours a day. But, also the images that appear. Robert, I see the images, they are not reality, but they are consciousness. I see you as the screen. Oh great, you are seeing correctly, congratulations. Robert, thank you, I'm glad you are really seeing me. Laughter. This K. Robert, if you saw all of us that way strong enough maybe all of us would gain enlightenment. Laughter. Robert, well that's what satsang is all about. That's what's supposed to happen, but you are so immersed in nonsense that you keep yourself out. The as long as you have feelings of anger, feelings of indifference, feelings of I don't care, feelings of being hurt, separation, it keeps you back. But... If you come in here with an open heart, then all these things will happen immediately. SM, do you see individuals? Robert, I see individuals but I see them all as one screen. SF, so the illusion Robert, is actually the perception? Robert, yes in the perception that's correct. SF, there is no such perception there is no illusion, it's all consciousness. It's all consciousness that's right. SH, but isn't the illusion also a product of consciousness? Robert, the illusion is a product of consciousness, but is not consciousness itself. It appears as consciousness. SH, yeah. 
is an appearance. SH, yeah, but it too is consciousness. Everything is consciousness. The illusion never existed, never will exist, but appears to exist. Only consciousness is reality. S. 8. Um this is the way consciousness appears to bamboozle itself. It appears that way. S. H. Maya. Yes that's what Maya is. But, consciousness is absolute reality. S. H. Yeah well it likes to entertain itself. No. S. H. What's it up to? Nothing, you are up to something? Students laugh. S.H. Oh go on. You were seen clearly just a moment ago now you're confused? No. S.D. Robert if someone is in the state that Jay is talking about who slips in and out of samadhi. You said that was a high level of consciousness but not full realization. Is that a necessary step in the progress toward realization or does everyone go through that? Robert, no. Though you can instantly awaken? Robert, yes. Or you might go that path which you go in and out. Robert, you don't have to go that path at all. But, you did call it a high state. Robert, it's a higher state than the normal state of course. S.H., did you go that path? Robert, no. You went straight to the point. Robert, yes. Good for you, I congratulate you. Laughs. Robert, thank you, I never ask for anything. S.E., except when you wanted candy bar answers to questions on the test. Laughter. Look what trouble it got you into. Robert, I know. S.H., that's why you went to Ramana Maharshi. Robert, I went because I wanted to see what was going on, what he was up to. S.H., what was he up to? Nothing. Laughter. S.H., was it worth going to find that out? You already knew it. Of course it was a pleasure to meet someone like him. S.T., and being up to nothing is good. It's wonderful. As long as you believe you are something then you suffer accordingly, because you are part of the world. But, when you know you are no thing there is nobody there to suffer. General talk. Robert, everything is preordained. That's why you should never react. It's your reaction that keeps you back. S.H., there are no exceptions to that so it is. When you say everything is preordained. No exceptions, everything, so stop complaining. S.T. Is it preordained by our consciousness? Robert, it is preordained by your unenlightenment. S.T. So it's not preordained for you? Yet there's no form. For me there is nobody left to feel anything. S.T. But you notice it the beginning of it. As I do. I still notice it. But what have I got to do with it? Laughter. S.D. Robert, if everything is preordained then wouldn't reactions be preordained? Robert, yes they would. So how can you tell us not to react when we're predestined to react? Robert, remember the only freedom you've got? Can you remember what it is? S.D. To awaken. What's the only freedom you've got? Not to react. S.T. Not to react. Not to react. S.H. Or be the witness of the tendency to react that shows the reaction. Yes. That's the only freedom you've got. Not to react to any situation and to go within and find the self. S.D. Well wouldn't your reaction or non-reaction be a matter of predestination? Robert. Yes, but you still have the choice. S.T. I can see your point of not reacting to anything, but what if you feel like dancing? Robert, then go ahead. S.T. 
is that not reacting? It's reacting to your body mind yes, so you have to suffer the consequences. ST of dancing. You may meet somebody get married have children. ST and just feeling it's a wonderful life. Good enjoy it. ST but that's still reacting. So don't react it's up to you. You have the choice to do whatever you like as far as it goes. React or don't react that's your choice. SH who is the chooser? Robert you are. In other words consciousness is the chooser? Robert everything is consciousness. They were talking on different levels. We're mixing all the levels up. Everything is consciousness and nobody chooses, that's the ultimate. But, when we talk about karma then it appears that you choose. SH, consciousness has identified with the body-mind and is appearing to choose. No consciousness does not identify with anything. SH, there appears to be awareness. Appears yes appears to be aware. Consciousness is self-contained pure awareness. SH, well that's the ultimate. Yes, so it does nothing. SH, can you speak of absolute consciousness and relative consciousness to clarify? No we can't do that either because relative consciousness doesn't exist. SH, just a term, just a word to try to think what can't be thought. Laughter. So why think at all? S. H. Well that's a good point. That's the whole object to quiet your mind. The quieter your mind becomes the more self-realized you become. S. G. That's the greatest stuff we can do. Robert. Yes. S. M. Robert does a jowny have karma for the body? Robert. Yes that's like an electric fan. When you shut off the power to the fan the blades still keep turning until it wears out. So with Johnny's they may have a body to go through some experience until it stops and wears out and you drop it. SG, is that all subtle bodies? Ramana and Robert are still existing as? Robert, Ramana appeared to have cancer. He appeared to disappear and gone. Robert, but to whom did he appear to have cancer to? S.G., right. To the Ajani. To that example Mary is for the person who is not enlightened. Who sees? S.H., parabdic karma will have to run its course, enlightened or not enlightened. Robert, that's how it appears to the Ajani, you are right. S.H., but for the Ajani it's finished. It's finished. Nothing exists. But, for the sake of explanation, you use examples like the electric fan. You pull out the plug and it still goes around until it stops. SK, Robert if anything is appearing, then first I can make the assumption that the seer is also appearing, or the ego is appearing and I can inquire into, who is that? Is that correct? Robert, yes. As long as the world appears, the seer is also appearing to see that. Robert, yes but first you have to inquire, who sees the world? SK, right. That was my question. If the world appears, someone is seeing it. Then I can ask, who sees it? To whom does this appearance come? SK, Right. Sure. SK, and to remember that is really the freedom right, and to forget it is to fall back into being the character that's hypnotized by the world. Indeed. But, I always want to remind you to make it all very simple. It is not really complicated. Just turn within and ask the question, to whom does this come? The world in other words. To whom does it appear? It appears to me. Hold on to the me. The me is an appearance. Follow the me to its culmination, to the source, to its substratum. 
and then you will realize that the me never existed. There is no me. No pun intended. SH, the me is sort of slipping, it's not easy to hold on to. You can hold on to it briefly, but hold on all the way to its disappearance isn't so easy. Robert, yes. You hold on to it mentally to the me. You watch it in other words. You watch the me and watch it going deeper and deeper within yourself, deeper and deeper in yourself. Until the day comes when you get to the bottom of it, and you get to the source of me, and the source of me means that there never was a me. SH, it gets burnt up in consciousness. And you become I am. I am is consciousness. SK, so you can start anywhere really. As soon as there is an appearance. Robert, exactly. SH, those can all be reminders then. Everything can be a reminder? Robert, yes, so you don't have to start and ask, who am I? Whenever you feel pain of any kind, mental anguish, anger, catch yourself immediately and ask, to whom does it come? Who feels this? I do. Who am I? Where does the I come from who feels this pain? And don't answer just wait. Hold on to the I but focus on the answer, focus on the source. Then one day the I will disappear and the I am will takes its place and you'll be free. S.H. That's the whole bowl of wax. That's it. There is nothing else. Now just being in the silence makes things happen. Being in the silence is not meditation. We're not meditating on anything. We just watch, we observe. We're alert. Watch what is going on in your mind when you're quiet. Put silence. Meditation is when you have something to meditate on, like Krishna or Rama or God or Buddha. But, self-inquiry is when you watch, when you observe. When you're alert and you watch what your mind is doing. Whatever it brings up you find it and you grab a hold of it and you say, to whom does this come? And follow it all the way through. Put silence. Om um, shanti 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 om um, peace. Remember what you perceive in each other is determined by your samskaras, by your past tendencies or your past makeup. In other words what I mean when you all look at me everyone has a different opinion, a different perception. Now the perception is not good or not bad. It is all determined by where you are coming from, it is all mental in other words. It's really not real, it's a projection of your own mind. And this is always true whether you see something wrong or something right. They are just mental impressions. That's why you should not react to anything because it is all coming out of you. In other words, whatever you see is yourself. So if you become angry or if you don't like somebody or something is wrong someplace in your life, you're simply seeing a projection of yourself because there is only the self. It behooves you therefore to develop a consciousness of love and peace and then you'll have the right projection then good things can happen. Then you will be able to say anything, anything at all. At this point the tape ends. Transcript 32 Remember the reasons why you came here. 23rd December, 1990. Robert, you people are funny. When I look at this side, this side starts singing, and when I turn my head away, they stop, and this side starts. Students laugh. You only sing when I look at you. Oh well, can't have everything. Laughter. I welcome you with all my heart and with all my being. It's good to see you all here, every one of you. In 1947 I went to Ramana Ashram. After spending around three days talking with Ramana, I settled down with the devotees in the hall, and I used to sit at the right side of the hall against the wall watching all the people come in. They had devotees, disciples and seekers. The devotees were always the same. They never said much. They were immersed in the self. The devotees and the seekers quarreled with each other. 
I recall a particular Indian who was very quarrelsome with a disciple, and he used to find fault with everybody. He would go to Ramana and say, so and so was doing this, so and so was doing that. And Ramana would tell him, remember the reason of why you came here and keep silent. The reason of course was to find the self and not to interfere with anybody else. But, there were all kinds of incidents going on. Thieks came Hindus, Westerners, Buddhists, Zen Buddhists, people who were practicing Hatha Yoga. All these things were happening in front of Ramana. But, it didn't phase Ramana one bit. I recall a Westerner, I am trying to think of his name Henry Wells from Scotland. He apparently had read a lot of books about Ramana, and this was his first visit. He came into the hall and I was watching this. Ran over to Ramana and prostrated himself on his stomach and started going crazy. His feet were shaking and he was chanting. The devotees wanted to pick him up and Ramana said, let him stay. When he came out of it he told Ramana, at last I have found you. You are my father, my mother, my son, my daughter, my friend. And Ramana just smiled at him. And I said to myself, I was only 18 years old, I said to myself, someone who is this enthusiastic, let's see what happens if it lasts. The days went by, and he kept prostrating himself every day for about a month. Then he finally stopped, and he sat down like everybody else. And after about two months he started looking around the room at everybody, and he started complaining, that this wasn't right, that wasn't right. After about four months of being there he donated $40,000 to the ashram, and I'm just watching all these things going on. After about six months of being there, he started to find fault with the management. At that time Ramana's brother was managing the ashram. He started to whisper to the other disciples, of course the devotees had nothing to do with this, it was the disciples and the seekers. He started spreading rumors. He hardly ever talked to me. I guess I was too young. He was about 45 years old. When about the seventh month he came over to me one day and he asked me outside the ashram, do you think Ramana is really enlightened? Though I just smiled at him, I didn't answer and walked away. He started getting devotees to fight against each other and rebel against the rules of the ashram. On about the eighth month he saw me again and he tells me, Do you think it is right for Ramana to stand naked like this? Let's buy him some clothes and dress him up, so when Westerners come they won't be frightened. Though I told him what Ramana said, Remember the reason for why you came. And this went on. A couple of days later, I didn't see him in the hall. Second day passed and I didn't see him. The third day passed and I didn't see him. And the fourth day I inquired, what happened to him? And the house guest he was living with said, Oh Henry packed his suitcase and went back to Scotland, and nobody ever heard from him again. The point of the story is this. If you realize the reason why you came you will be interested in one thing, awakening. And that will dominate your life. Nothing else will. You will not be concerned with what somebody else is doing and you will be at peace with yourself and everybody else. Everything is preordained anyway. Everything is karmic. So what's going to happen will happen whether you like it or not. So why get insulted, why get your feelings hurt be at peace. It's interesting, this morning I was looking through a magazine and I found an article by a devotee who lived at the ashram for quite a while talking about the same subject. Mary would you like to read it? Now listen carefully to this. Can you see? Mary, yes I can see fine. All mind the business for which you have come. All events in life are shaped according to the divine plan. What is bound to happen will happen. What is not to happen cannot be brought about by any human effort. On this point Ramana was quite categoric. When Diver Raja Mudalyar questioned him as to whether only important things in one's life, 
such as major occupation or profession alone are predetermined or even trifling acts, Ramana replied, everything is predetermined. One of the purposes of birth is to go through certain experiences which have been marked out in the karmic unfoldment of this life. The whole program is chalked out. This would apparently be a dampener to all effort, for one would be puzzled as to what the responsibility of man is. Is he an automation of karmic forces? Where do his free will and effort come in? Ramana points out that there is another deeper purpose to life. That is to search and find out the truth for oneself. He would say that the only useful purpose of life is to turn within and realize there's nothing else to do. Ramana would therefore constantly din into everyone the fact that the ultimate truth is Satchit, immediately available here and now. When Natanananda asked Ramana, Is it possible for everyone to know directly without doubt what exactly is one's true nature? Prompt came the reply, Undoubtedly it is possible. The ultimate truth is so simple, Ramana would say. It is nothing more than abiding in one's own state. This is the essential message of all religions and creeds. Leaving aside the automatic course of our lives regulated by the Creator, according to His law, one's duty is to channel effort to be self-aware. Steadfastness of purpose is in treading the inner path through vigilant self-inquiry. On such inquiry as to the source of the individual, the inquirer merges in the conscious source. The inner odyssey is seldom smooth sailing. For many a delusion would wean one away. For instance, people who go to Shri Ramana Ashram to breathe its rarefied atmosphere while there, instead of surrendering to his flowing grace, they would get involved in the happenings of the ashram management. Ramana used a jovially remark of some visitors, on their first visit to Shri Ramana Ashram, they seemed to be a light. On the second visit they discovered that the ashram is not properly run. On the third visit they start giving advice. On the fourth they know best how to run the place. And on the fifth they discover that the management is not responsive. On the sixth, they suggest that the present staff should walk out leaving the ashram to them. They would thus get bogged down in things which are irrelevant for the search. When such people complained, Ramana would say, Mind the business for which you have come. This would apply, of course, not only to their visit to Shri Ramana Ashram, but also to the purpose of human life itself. One has to constantly keep before the mind's eye the liberating purpose, the only worthwhile one of freeing oneself from the karmic chain by discovering the hidden truth. Ramana would even seemingly chide if one failed to pursue one's own sadhana, but spent time thinking and talking of others. A devotee once told Ramana, I have been here for many years. People got into samadhi. I close my eyes for a minute, and my mind travels around the world. Ramana replied, Why do you think about others? Let them meditate, sleep or snore. Look to yourself. Whenever your mind goes astray, bring it back to the quest. Once Bhagwan told a devotee to wake up, look at the mirror, it shows the growth to be got rid of. Instead of wasting time, start shaving. Similarly, heaven knows when the allotted time would end. Hence, not to seek the truth by vigilant self-inquiry is truly suicidal. Many would like to blame their circumstances for their indolence and laziness and failure to pursue self-inquiry. Ramana would ask, why depend on that which is not in your hands? Go ahead with the business which is in your hands under your control, leaving aside what you cannot do anything about. Proper utilization of God given freedom of turning the mind, is what is needed all the time. As for adverse circumstances in life of which everyone has a belly full, while sympathizing, Ramana would at the same time say, you are always free not to be affected by the pleasure and pain consequent on action. 
The piece has to be taken out of the event by an attitudinal change which neutralizes it. Sometimes Ramana would advise leaving things to the sure hand of the Sat Guru and to stick single-mindedly to the effort which would make oneself aware. Ramana would say, Why don't you do what the first-class railway passenger does? He tells the guard his destination, locks the door and goes to sleep. The rest is done by the guard. If you can trust your guru as much as you trust the railway guard, it will be good enough to make you reach the destination. Again when someone pestered him for the darshan of Shri Krishna, he said, Why don't you leave the Shastrakara of Krishna to Krishna? We also have the pointed advice given by him to Ganapada Muni. Remain all the time steadfast in the heart. God will determine the future for you to accomplish the work. What is to be done will be done at the proper time. Don't worry. Abide in the heart. Life becomes meaningful if we joyously tread the inward path, remembering that ours is to do the vichara, and it is for the inner force to do the rest. Then bliss is not the end product to be found on reaching the goal, but is felt all along the homeward, heartward journey. Robert, there's another article prior previous to that before that. Mary before that? Robert, yeah. The purpose of life? Robert, yes let J read that. J, The Purpose of Life by Lucille Osborne. Wife of Robert, Arthur Osborne's wife. Those whose spiritual effort is in the right direction get progressively closer to their perfect self, become more peaceful, happier, and are increasingly liked and helped by those with whom they come into contact. Some of the negative category will attend rigorously only to externals, like clothing and pure food which will not help them much if it combines with ego centric selfish behavior and possessiveness. They will do anything to be able to possess a few more things of scarcely any importance. They do not realize the harm they do to themselves getting deeper into samsara, with all its problems and suffering, away from realizing the glorious peaceful joy in their heart. This pertains also to those in positions of power who treat the people with whom they deal without goodwill, sincerity, or even truthfulness. They will usually be disliked, have a few friends if any. Those who associate with them will either have some affinity or feel sorry for them, combined usually with reluctance to forego some convenience or other, not a particularly spiritual motive. One might say that a misguided seeker forfeits the great opportunity of gaining the greatest fortune possible for a human being. The purpose of life is to return to the source. The source is mysterious, glorious, peaceful joy which is God in everybody's heart. This is realization. We do not gain it. It is always there in the heart. Only the obstructions, the sanas have to be removed to reveal it. Robert, thank you, Jay. Any question about that before we go on? Everybody understand it perfectly? SF, just keep your eye on the ball. Right. Laughs. Okay, let's play a song and we'll carry on. After song played, Robert continues. Hello again. It's good to be with you. I talk to many people during the week, both on the telephone and in person. I speak to Zen Buddhists, Hindus, Americans, all kinds of people, and 80% tell me they're enlightened. Most of them tell me they've experienced the void. Some say they've seen lights. Some say they hear certain sounds. And they say, what do you think? So I remark, somebody has to be present to experience these things. As long as somebody is present, and somebody is present or you'll not be able to tell me about it, then there's no enlightenment. Find out who is present and hold on to that you, because you were present to experience the void. You were present to experience the light or the sound. Who is that you? Find out. Hold on to that you. Hold on to I. 
I was present to experience the void. As long as I am present I cannot possibly be enlightened because I still exist. It is like a movie theater. Well let's take rather a stage theater, stage play, where the lights shine on the players and on the audience. And when the play is over the audience and the actors both leave, but the light still shines, even though it shines on nothing. So the empty theater is the void. The light is still shining on the void as well as on the people. A better example is we see a room filled of furniture, the eyes look and they see. Then somebody turns off the light. The eyes are still there, but they don't see anything. That's how the void is compared to the seer. There has to be a seer to see the void. Who is that seer? And you find out by simply inquiring, Who am I? Where did I come from? What is the source of I that sees all these things? Remember all this phenomena is a projection of your mind. The mind appears to be very powerful. It projects voids, light sounds, images, as well as the entire universe and as well as your body and mind. It projects itself as mind. The idea is to stop the projection, and you stop the projection through self-inquiry. This is the fastest way. But whenever you have some experience, go beyond the experience because there has to be somebody to have the experience. Just like the eyes see when it's light, and the eyes are still there when it's dark, so the eye is present when you sleep, the eye is present when you dream, the eye is present when you are awake. Find out who the eye is. Dive deep within, work on yourself. Just like the article we read just before, forget about the world, forget about others, forget about your body, and inquire of the self. Find out who the self is. Who are you? Are there two eyes or one eye? There cannot possibly be two eyes because that's duality. There has to be one eye only. Find the source of that eye. Follow it diligently until you merge with the source. Then you will find that you're happier than you've ever been in your life. When you touch the source of I you have bliss, you have absolute reality, you have God. This is the most important quest you have. Nothing else is so important. Can you think of anything else that's as important? Then why do you worry so much about others? Why you get mixed up with all kinds of problems? Do your duty inquire, find the source of I. It doesn't make any difference how long it takes, think of how many incarnations you had to go through in order to be in this class today. Make yourself happy. Forget about your troubles. They don't exist. Only God exists as yourself. But, you must find it out for yourself. Do it. I don't want to keep on talking about different subjects. We've covered some very interesting topics this afternoon, and I'm sure you have many questions concerning these things. So let's talk about what we've covered and see where we go. S.R. Robert you know the emphasis is on effort because it is all happening and all predestined, but you talked about making that effort to locate the I. Robert, yes. Is it possible that that would be an unfolding destiny anyway? But the only effort that is to look, or we do have to do something, or is it illusion that we have to get involved? Robert, no, the only freedom we have is to turn within. The only freedom we have is to make the effort not to react to any condition. That's the freedom we've got, everything else is preordained. So when you are involved in any circumstance it makes no difference what it is, your freedom is not to react by realizing that the circumstance is preordained. By not reacting you put a stop to your karma. You end it once and for all and then you turn within and you become totally free. So that is the only time that we get freedom, everything else is preordained. SR. It's like we should just sit back, watch it and let it all go. I know, if you're not supposed to do that you will not be able to. If you're supposed to unfold by sitting back, you will do it. 
If you're not supposed to do it, if it's not your karma no matter how you try, you will not be able to do it. So don't worry about that question. Sen, I look at it all positively, you're just realizing it's all predestined you can go through it and enjoy it like a film that you are watching really. Robert, but again remember it's not your business, it's God's business what you are going to go through. In other words you can't say, I'm going to this and I'm going to do that. The only thing you can do is to turn within and seek reality. Everything will be taken care of for you. Everything else is ordained. SN, Robert, even if you don't react, is that also ordained? In a way, but we really have a choice. That's the freedom we have got. To react or not to react. SN, but if our own self-realization itself is preordained through the process of not reacting, then not reacting is also preordained. In a way you're right. But, your job is to think about not reacting. When you think about it, you are using your mind for the right purpose, by not reacting. SN, using the mind to turn off the mind? Yes, and let the preordainer take care of the rest. SN. So in a way it's preordained, but in a way it's not, it's real. Robert. Correct. In other words, we are not to think that turning within is also preordained. We're to turn within and forget about everything else. That's the best way not to say, well I don't have to turn within because if I'm supposed to I will. Do not think this way. Do not ask too many questions to yourself about this. But, simply turn within and do the work that's necessary and everything else will take care of itself. S.B. Robert, there's some new people here today so what do you mean by turning within? If everybody on the yogic path is turning within, and they're still all unrealized, is the ego turning in on itself or? Robert, by turning within I mean turning within on your eye. You say to yourself, who am I? Or what is the source of the I? And you hold on to the answer, the source. You hold on to it and you follow it through to the end. As you turn within this way you will know what to do to take the very next step. You will be guided and lead. But, don't get all worked up by this. Simply turn within and we can say that God will take care of the rest. And the only way you turn within is by inquiring. Who am I? What is the source of the I? And you follow the I thread to the source. If nothing happens, you keep repeating the question over and over again, Who am I? Who am I? Something will finally happen. S.B. Robert, you have said that there is always an experience or experiencing the light, sounds or void. But, when realization occurs, and there is Sat Chit Ananda, bliss is consciousness bliss. Robert, Sat Chit Ananda? New York accent. Laughter. S. H. Southern version. S. B. So who experiences on their presence? Who experiences that realization that no bliss? Robert, the mind originally experiences it. Then the mind turns within itself and the mind is totally wiped out. So there is no one to experience anything. You just become it. SK. And that's the difference between temporary realization and permanent realization? Robert. Yes, you become Satchit Ananda. You become absolute reality. SH. Is that your present condition? My present condition is nothing. I have no present condition, only what you see. What do you see? What you see is what you get. Laughter. S. H. A Johnny called Robert sitting in that chair. Then that's what you got. S. H. That's good enough I like him. Lass. Well enjoy it. Enjoy him while you can. S.H. He doesn't look like he will be around for much longer. You can never tell. S.T. That's a terrible thing to say. S.H. 
You're on your way out too, sweetheart. Students laugh. Just a matter of time. Robert, whatever you see, we have thirty or so people here today. Everyone looks at me and sees something else. And what you see is what you get. S.B. That's your appearance, Robert. That's not your essential reality. Well, who tells you to see my appearance? That's up to you. S.B. I see an unoccupied body. Well, then you are seeing yourself. That's yourself. There is only one self, and wherever you look, you see it because you are the self of all. When you look out the window, you see mountains, a lake, a tree. You're seeing yourself. That's all you can ever see yourself. Though, if you turn within and stop looking out there, or stop looking at people, you will find something else completely. You will find that you are spirit, that you are ultimate intelligence, ultimate oneness, absolute reality, nirvana. And then, when you look, you will see consciousness everywhere. When you become consciousness, then you can see consciousness wherever you look, and you will know all as well. But if you still believe you are the body-mind phenomena, wherever you look, you are going to see a body. You are going to see a healthy body, or a sick body, or all kinds of bodies. A fat body, or skinny body. A tall body, or small body. A female body, or male body. And you will see nothing but bodies because you think that you are the body. Get rid of the notion that you are the body. Experience consciousness, and you will see bliss wherever you look. S. B. Robert, can we say that going within is the same as giving up the center? Giving up the center? S. B. Giving up the me center? Oh, if you mean the me, of course. When you are going within, you are inquiring, who is me? Not who is me, but who is me? Students laugh. S. B. Most people take their center as their ego. Most people cry, who is me? All day long, laughter. But see, let most people take their center as their ego. What do you take? That's the question. Don't worry about most people. S B. Because the reason I say that because when you say go within, people tend to cling and clutch to their ego as their center because they are so identified with it. But why are you worried what people do? Let them clutch. And let them hang on, and let them do whatever they want. Laughter. S. B. Because the spiritual path I used to be on would say, "Go within, go within," and you have three thousand people going within for a hundred years, and they're just hung up with the ego. Though I think giving up the center is a more precise way of saying it. Robert, then give up the center, give it up, make it happen. S B, yeah, lay it down. Do it. Let the three thousand people do what they do. S N, Robert, when you say go within by means of self-inquiry, asking who am I? The purpose is not really to find the I, but the purpose is to quiet the mind, which can also be done by devotion or negation. So if you get caught up in the process of trying to find out who am I? Who am I? Like there is an eye that I need to find, and not trying to stop the mind and just let it manifest of itself. I think I'm missing the point. Robert, the mind appears to be very strong in some people. So the mind is another word for the eye, the personal eye. And we find the easiest way is self-inquiry. Will you find out the source of the eye or the mind? As you investigate the source of the eye. The mind becomes quieter and quieter and quieter, until it disappears altogether. Because the eye is really the mind, the personal eye. They are both the same. Self-inquiry is therefore the fastest way to quiet the mind. Found in background, the fireplace agrees with me. The fastest way to quiet the mind is to search for the eye, because the eye is the mind. And when you discover that the I is the self, there is no more mind. Then you have transcended the mind automatically. That's the easiest way. S H, the I is the self coming out and wrecking it for everybody. Robert, 
Yes, the I is really the self. The I is consciousness, but you've individualized it. Though so because you've individualized it, you've got to observe it in action and follow it to the source, which is the self. As soon as you experience the self, there is no longer any mind and there is no longer anything else but the self. S. H. It sure is simple. Why does it seem to be difficult? Laughter. To whom is it difficult? Sage got me. You make it difficult because you think it's difficult. S H. To whom are you referring? Whoever thinks it's difficult. S H. I didn't say that. Sure you did. Students laugh. S H. You're trying to confuse me. Simply look at yourself. Make it easy. Discover who you are and be done with it. Awaken and become free. S H. Then you see nothing but the self wherever you look. Everything becomes the self. Everything is consciousness. S H. Must feel pretty good. Of course. Or why would you go after it? S K. It doesn't really become the self. You just recognize what is really there, and that's the self. Robert, what's really there is the self-consciousness. Though it doesn't become the self, it's just. Robert, no, that's true indeed. Nothing becomes anything. The self has always been and always will be. Everything else is an illusion. S H, just wake up to what you already and always are. Robert, wake up! Do it. I will. Don't worry. Robert, when? Don't push me. Robert, when will you do it? What's your hurry? What's the rush? Robert, I've been waiting for you to do it and get rid of yourself. It's occurring. It's occurring. Have patience. Robert, become the nobody you really are. Laughter. Have patience. S R, Robert. I know you don't like this kind of question. Robert, sure I do. I don't care what you ask. Say that you do finally reach that point of the void and all that understanding. Can't you carry into that a curiosity as to why creation manifested in the ways it did or which appeared, even if it is an illusion? Do you sort of get behind understanding maybe with the scheme behind why it manifests into so many souls that are living in illusion the way it did? Robert, well, let me ask you a question. If you become self-realized, who is left to do that? There is nobody left to ask that kind of a question. Only the mind asks a question like that. The self has no question. S R. I'd like to come back and tell my mind what it was about. You can't. Laughter. The mind has been annihilated. There is no mind to come back to. You will understand that you are the self. You have always been the self, and that's it. S R. I understand it, but I do sort of have a curiosity before I pass into that state. Who has the curiosity? S R. My mind. And that will be wiped out, so you won't have the curiosity. Laughter. S R. Before it ends, I would like somebody to tell me, even if it is just a kind of indulging this, why it manifested in the form that it did with all the creatures and different plant forms, and it's fascinating. Who said it did? S R. Well, it's just my mind. T. As long as your mind. Is active, the world becomes real to you, and everything manifests, people, places, and things. But once the mind is gone, so is everything else, and those questions become redundant. There will be no question. S R, I understand that. I'm just curious. There'll be nobody left to ask that question. S R, then I'll never know the answer. Then, no. On the contrary, S R, there is no answer. You only want to be answered because you are not enlightened. But once self-realization ensues, you will not care a darn about these things. It will be different. S R, so until that time, 
Until that time work on yourself, go within and find out, then come and tell me. SR, put it in a temple and hide it somewhere. Laughter. You will not be interested. SR, I can imagine that in the truth of it. SV, Robert, I'd like to talk about some unexpected things that have taken place lately for me. Ever since meeting you and practicing, I find myself actually more emotional. Like watching a movie, I feel very emotionally involved in it, seeing someone suffering, have tears come to my eyes when I see someone. It's taken me by surprise, because I feel I kept going in the direction of non-duality, I shouldn't feel these things. Robert, on the contrary, those are high signs. What you're really doing is you're bringing all your samskaras up to the front. The all of our samskaras, all of our karmas, parabdic karma and everything else is inside of our sub conscious mind as dormant seeds and they sprout in many lifetimes. But, if somebody is really sincere on the path everything comes up at one time. And you start to get all of these feelings because you are getting rid of everything at once. SV, actually it doesn't feel bad, it just feels. Yes I know. It's all coming out, it's all draining out of you. So that's really a good sign. Just watch it, don't interfere with the process, watch. SV, it's interesting because in the teaching I was in before wouldn't allow any of that feeling because that's not right to have feelings, you know what I'm saying. Robert, aha. Uh -huh. I don't know where you were before, but the feelings are great, follow them, watch them, inquire, to whom they come, and see what happens. SF, Robert, to carry the same question a little further, with all these feelings that come up, would one become more greedy and more lustful? Robert, it's possible, but that's only a temporary condition. Again we have all these samskaras, these latent tendencies from past lives inside of us. And as we get into a spiritual path like this, we are making them all come up. We have to imagine it's like a shooting gallery, and you have got a gun, as one duck comes up you shoot it down. So as one thought comes up, one fear, one frustration you shoot it down by asking, to whom does it come? You get rid of that when another one will come up just as fast, you shoot that one down. It keeps going, going, going until they're all gone. So you keep inquiring, to whom does it come? To whom does it come? and your mind will become empty soon and you'll be free. SG, like in watching a movie, should one not get involved in the movie or just keep inquiring to the movie or just let yourself get involved? Robert, when you watch a movie you have no choice what's going to happen. Depending on your spiritual state, you will act anyway. If I watch a movie I see the screen which is consciousness and I realize that the movie is simply images superimposed on the screen. If I try to get up and grab the image with the movie I'll grab the screen. Though I'm already aware of the screen. While other people are aware of the figures. Though if you are aware of the figures, you still have a long way to go. But. If you are able to see through the figures, through the screen, then you are identifying with consciousness. The room is heating up. I think you're trying to roast me, Henry. Laughter. For Thanksgiving and Christmas. S. H. Sacrificial love. That's what I thought. S. M. Robert, does that apply to frustration, to resentment, to all the negative things also? Robert. It applies to everything, everything, use the same method. SK. It goes back to predetermination in a sense like some things are predetermined whatever it may be. Robert. Yes they're going to come up, it's up to you to get rid of them by inquiring to whom do they come. To whom does it come? And if that gets too difficult. Render it all to God. Give it all to God and be happy. In other words say, take all this from me God, serious. Take it off my hands. And feel free as if he did and you will be okay. 
sh about inquiry to whom do they come themes very similar to the injunction to being the witness robert it is similar to that it is similar but it's a faster method sh why is that because when you inquire to whom do they come the mind explodes within itself and it becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker faster sg it's more hectic right rather than passive yes so the mind disappears faster by asking the question but witnessing is good also sr robert some of the nanda people say they talk about the feeling of difference with what the psychological people say that there is a subconscious mind and these things are actually stored somewhere and i guess we say they're samskaras and that's the illusion in a sense that we have to penetrate that there is a storehouse of these things and it could explode at any moment robert laughs there is really no storehouse but for the sake of those who have to do something you explain that there is a storehouse of tendencies to get rid of but there is really nothing to get rid of because it doesn't exist and it never did only consciousness exists but if you want to discuss it further we tell you there is a storehouse of tendencies to get rid of open the storehouse and it will all fly out laughter but let's face it you're free already and there is nothing binding you except your own belief system stop your mind from thinking and you will be safe sr would that be a way in a certain sense seemingly speeding up the inquiry to get closer to the source of the idea you know the idea that there is a latent storehouse of the subconscious mind rather than deal with one latent tendency as if at a time as it appears to arise Robert it depends on the seeker it depends what your background has been why look at tendencies of storehouses why look at anything just go with and ask yourself to whom do they come follow the eye go to the source and be free that's all you have to do sh that's more direct robert yes go straight to the point Robert, go straight to the point. Which is yourself? SK, couldn't you skip the point of asking, to whom does this or that come? And just follow the eye. Robert, if you can do that, that's fine. You don't even have to do that. Why not just awaken? Laughter. Wake up right now. Laughter. It's up to you. It's up to each individual what path you are going to take. SB like surrender if you just give everything up there is nothing there and you don't even have to inquire right Robert that's right when you see that there is nothing there Robert that's right if you can do that do it do what you have to do but by all means do something SB and if you see that the doing is a non doing then even don't do that that's right you're doing whatever you have to do at the moment and everything changes accordingly sp if you see the doing is the undoing then you don't even do if you can see it that's good but can you see it then stay with it i'll play another song music played in the power of silence is the greatest teacher in the universe there's nothing greater than the power of silence things actually happen in the silence that would never happen anywhere else and by any other method so let's keep silent for a while and find out for ourselves silence um shanti shanti peace peace when i sit like this at home in a chair for hours people ask me if i'm meditating and the answer is no for to meditate you have to have a subject and an object and that implies duality but if there is nobody home there is no subject and there is no object so you're not meditating some people ask whether i go into samadhi who is left to go into samadhi 
There has to be somebody left over to go into samadhi. That also implies an object and a subject. Wipe out the object and the subject and you will become nobody. So what do you do? You just stay in the silence and do nothing. There's nothing to do. People always believe they've got to do something. When there is nothing to do it sounds too easy. But when you are doing something meditating going into samadhi there has to be a doer. You are not the doer. You are nobody and you are absolute reality, pure consciousness, ultimate oneness, Satchitananda, I am that I am. And this is your true nature awaken to it. Anyone have any other questions or forever hold your peace. Okay remember to love yourself, to bow to yourself, to worship yourself, to honor yourself, because God dwells in you as you. Have a happy Christmas I love you be happy. Peace. And that's all she wrote. At this point the tape ends. Transcript 33 Robert and Ramana 30th December 1990 Robert, I want to thank Shankar Ananda for coming down and helping with the music. Class ball round. This is truly an auspicious day, what a way to bring in the new year. I want to tell you that I love every one of you just the way you are. When I was 18 years old, I arrived at Turuvanamalai. In those days they didn't have jet planes. It was a propeller plane. I purchased flowers and a bag of fruit to bring to Ramana. I took the rickshaw to the ashram. It was about 8.30 a.m. I entered the hall and there was Ramana on his couch reading his mail. It was after breakfast. I brought the fruit and the flowers over and laid it at his feet. There was a guardrail in front of him to prevent fanatics from attacking him with love. And then I sat down in front of him. He looked at me and smiled and I smiled back. I have been to many teachers, many saints, many sages. I was with Nisargadayati, Ananda Mai Ma, Papa Ramdas, Neem Karali Baba and many others, but never did I meet anyone who exuded such compassion, such love, such bliss as Ramana Maharshi. There were about thirty people in the room. He looked at me and asked me if I had eaten breakfast. I said no. He spoke some Tamil to the attendant, and the attendant came back with two giant leaves, one with fruit and one with some porridge with pepper. After I consumed the food, I just lie down on the floor. I was very tired. It was time for his usual walk. He had arthritis in the legs and could hardly walk at that time. His attendants helped him to get up and he walked out the door. When he was outside he said something to his attendants and his attendants motioned for me to come. He guided me to a little shack that I was going to use while I might stay there. He came inside with me I bet you think we spoke about profound subjects. On the contrary he was a natural man. He was the self of the universe. He asked me how my trip was and where I was from, what made me come here. Then he said I should rest, so I laid down on the cot and he left. I was awakened about five o'clock. It was Ramana again, he came by himself and he brought me food. Can you imagine that? We spoke briefly, I ate and I slept. The next morning, I went into the hall. After the morning chanting there was breakfast. Then everybody sat around just watching Ramana and he'd go through his routine. He would go through the mail and read it out loud, talk to some of his devotees, and I just observed everything. His composure never changed. Never did I see such compassion, such love. Then people started to come over to him asking him questions. His replies were very succinct. They weren't like you read in a book. Apparently, what you read in a book is his reply to three or four people. They condensed it all into one question and answer. But, people usually asked a question or make a statement. If he agreed he would nod or say, yes. That's it. 
If he didn't, he would offer an explanation in maybe one or two sentences. There were foreigners at the ashram when I was there, Muslims, Catholic priests, people from all races and all nationalities. The devotees would sit around and say nothing, but the seekers and the disciples would ask questions. When I was there a week or so, two of his disciples were sort of jokingly arguing with him about something in Tamil. I asked the interpreter what they were talking about. He said Ramana's couch is covered with lice, and he refuses to let us kill them. They climb over his body and his legs and he doesn't care. He even feeds them. We want to exterminate the couch, but he won't let us. So the next day they tricked him. When he went outside for his morning walk, they sprayed his couch with Didi. When he came back, he smelled the couch and he smiled and he jokingly said, Someone has tricked me. He never got angry, never got mad. I don't think he knew what the words meant. A couple of weeks later, there was a German lady who had come to the ashram, and apparently she had made a donation of some kind, but she wasn't happy for some reason. She was complaining to Ramana, and he just kept silent. I again asked the interpreter, What does she want? The interpreter said, she wants her donation back. Laughter. She wants to go home back to Germany. So she started to argue, everything was going on in front of Ramana. She started to argue with one of the managers of the ashram and Ramana just looked. Then Ramana said in English, give her back her donation and add 50 rupees to it, which they did and she left. This was his nature. He never saw anything wrong. He never took anyone out of his love. No matter what they did, who they were, where their ego was, he understood and loved everyone just the same. We're also celebrating the birth of Jesus this month. He was never born this month, but we're celebrating it anyway. Ramana used a quote from the scriptures. Jesus and Ramana said basically the same things. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is within you. Ramana said, The self is within you. Search for it and find it, and awaken. Jesus said, Son, I am with you always and all that I have is yours. Ramana said, I can never leave you. I am always with you. His compassion never left him. Six months prior to his leaving his body, I went to Bangalore to see Papa Ram Das. I was informed that he left his body. I went back to Tiruvannamalai. But, the crowds had already started to come, thousands of people. So I climbed the hill and went into one of the caves. Stayed there for five days. When I came down the crowds were dispersed. He had already been interned. I inquired of his devotee who saw him last, what were the last words he spoke. The devotee said, while he was leaving his body a peacock flew on top of the hall and started screeching, and Ramana remarked to his devotee, has anyone fed the peacock yet? And those were the last words he spoke. Now let's talk about you. Think of the problems you believe you have. Think of the nonsense that you go on with every day. Think how furious you become, how you always want to stick up for your rights, as if you had any. The problem is, you think. If you would only stop thinking. You say, how can I function if I stop thinking? Very well, thank you. As a matter of fact, you would function much better than you do now, for you will always be taken care of. The universe loves you. It will always supply you with your needs. Forget about other people, what they do and what they don't do. Do not listen to malicious gossip. Be yourself. Understand who you really are. You are the absolute reality, unconditioned consciousness. Work from that standpoint. Do not work from your problems. Do not get lost in meaningless gossip. Understand your true reality. Be yourself. What Ramana taught was not new. Ramana simply taught the Upanishads. Who am I has been around since time immemorial. 
If a teacher always tells you they have something new to teach you, be careful, because there's nothing new under the sun. Ramana simply revised the Who Am I philosophy and made it simple for people in the 20th century. But what did he teach? He simply taught that you are not the body-mind principle. He simply taught that if you have a problem, do not feel sorry for yourself, do not go to psychiatrists, do not condemn yourself, simply ask yourself, to whom does this problem come? And of course the answer will be, the problem comes to me. Hold on to the me. Follow the me to the source, the substratum of all existence. How do you do that? How do you hold on to me? How do you hold on to I? By simply asking yourself, who am I? What am I? The same thing, what am I? Asking yourself again and again, who am I? Forget about time. Forget about space. Forget everything. Keep yourself from thinking. When the thoughts come, ask yourself, to whom comes the thoughts? Again, they come to me. Hold on to the me. I think these thoughts. Well then, who am I? Who thinks these thoughts? Who am I? An easier way to do this I have found is to simply say to yourself, I I I I, and you will notice as you do this, that the I I goes deeper, deeper, deeper within you into your heart center, right to the source. For Westerners I have found that saying I I, seems to be more helpful than who am I. Again do not look at time. Do not ask yourself, when is something going to happen? A devotee went to Ramana and said, I've been with you for 25 years, doing who am I? And nothing has happened yet, so Ramana said, try it another 25 and see what happens. Forget about time, forget about when something is going to happen. Even if nothing happens in this life you're ahead of the game. For if you've been sincere, and if you've really been working on yourself, you will come back to an environment that is conducive for your realization, and at that time, you may have realization when you're about 12 or 13 years old, because you've earned it. But, if you're like most people and go around minding everybody's business and saying, I have no time to do this. I've tried it for two hours and it doesn't work. Then you keep coming back again and again and again going through all kinds of experiences until one day, maybe 10,000 years from now you may actually get it and start working on yourself diligently, what you should be doing now. What do you do with yourself all day long? Think. From the moment you get out of bed, how does your day go? Do you think of God at all? Do you practice or do you think about your affairs and your body? Be honest with yourself. If you're not making any headway in spiritual life, it's because you're not putting anything into it. You have to realize that whatever you see in the world is only a reflection of yourself. If people are mean to you, if they abuse you, it is because you're seeing yourself as those people. In other words, you've got those qualities. I recall, going back to the story of Ramana and the German lady, when he gave her back her donation plus some more rupees. The following afternoon a devotee asked him, Ramana, why did you do that? And Ramana explained, when she gave us a donation, to whom do you think she gave it to? She gave it to herself, for there's only one self. When she took it back, she took it away from herself. When she goes back to Germany I'm sure she'll have financial problems until she learns that anything you give is only giving to yourself, for there's not two or three or four selves, there's only one self, and this includes everything you do in your life, the way you look at another person. You're simply seeing yourself. And this is why the only thing I can do for you is to love you, because I love myself and you are myself. When I say I love myself, I am not referring to Robert. When I use the word self, I'm referring to infinity, to omnipresence. It includes everything in this universe. 
Though when I love myself, I am obviously loving everyone and everything that exists. I also realize that everything that exists is a projection of my own mind, so I do not identify with the images. I identify with the source, with consciousness, with absolute reality, with ultimate oneness, with nirvana, with emptiness. While I'm talking to you I realize I'm talking to myself because again there is only one self. If you can only remember that in your dealings with others, whichever way you deal with anyone else, you're doing it to yourself. And you see now why a person like Ramana could never hate anyone or be angry, it wasn't in his nature. How do you react to life? When a person displeases you what do you do? Curse him or her become angry become violent. How do you handle it? How do you react? Be honest with yourself. It's the only way. Start from where you are. No human being is perfect. We all make mistakes. Do not feel sorry for yourself, but start from where you are. Where are you? You are consciousness. This is your true nature. Learn to love everything. Learn to see only the good. Realize there's a reason for everything. If a person displeases you, simply look the other way and forget it. Learn to stop your mind from thinking. And you do this by immediately catching yourself when you react to a condition and inquiring within yourself, who is becoming angry? Who feels out of sorts? I do. I. Realize you're dealing with the personal I, and all the anger, all the frustration, all the karma, all the samskaras are all attached to that personal I. Consequently, when you get rid of the personal I, everything else will go with it. So don't try to solve your problems. Do not try to become a better person. Do not try to run away from your life. Simply see who it is who is running, who it is who needs to be a better person. Who has all these problems? I, I, always I. Hold on to that I with all of your might, but do not concentrate on the I. You concentrate on the source which is consciousness, God. And everybody asks me over and over again, and I keep telling you. They ask me, how do I hold on to the I? By asking who am I or just saying, I, 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 I. Automatically you will notice the I going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper within your heart and one day you will become free. But, you're already free. Why not wake up right now? Why go through anything? Everybody is different. If this appears too difficult for you, if Achara appears hard, then your next best bet is to surrender completely to God. Surrender everything, your problems, your ego, your body, your mind, your work, your world. Say, here God, take it, I want no more of this. I am yours, do with me as you will. That will be done. This means you no longer have anything to worry about. If you truly surrender, you will immediately become radiantly happy. For you have given your ego to God, and what's left is God. You have no body. You have no mind. You have no work. You have no problems. It has been your ego all of the time fooling you, making you believe that something is wrong, and you've been playing hide and seek, trying to find God here, there and everywhere. That was a nice song, when all the time God was within yourself as yourself. Begin to see the truth. Begin to stand up tall. Become fearless. Become strong. Leave the world alone. It will take care of itself. There is a mysterious power that guides the world to its right destiny. It doesn't need any help from you. If you're meant to do certain work in the world, it will be done, but you have nothing to do with that. It doesn't mean that you have to leave your job or go sit in a cave or give up your life. Wherever you are right now is where you're supposed to be. Just feel, I am not the doer, and your work will go on. Do not be attached to your work. 
Do not react to any situation or any condition. Be yourself. Focus your attention on consciousness and your body will go on doing whatever it came here to do. Everything is preordained. Even when I raise my finger like this it is preordained. Do not be egotistical to believe that you have any power over everybody or anybody or that you are the doer. It's a privilege to have been born on this earth and the reason you have been born is to find your real self. Go for it, do it and become free. I don't know why I talk so much it doesn't do you any good. I always want to sit in the silence, but sometimes we have some new people and they do not understand the silence yet, so I keep on chatting. I wonder if I know what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter anyway. Any questions? Bob? SB, what is the relationship between effort and realization since only the ego is doing this effort? How can the ego doing this effort? Robert, what you call effort has been preordained. SB, self-inquiry is the ego doing effort. Self-inquiry is the ego trying to find itself as the self, so the effort is brought on through your karma so that you may become self-realized. It's a privilege to have been able to find in this life the method of self-inquiry. Therefore, it's been predestined that you should make the effort to find yourself. SB, since God or realization is something that really is like an effortless presence, how could it be? When you get on the path correctly after a while it becomes effortless. In the beginning there seems to be a little effort you have to take because you're breaking away from your old patterns and as you continue it becomes effortless, easier and easier. It becomes a pleasure. It becomes a joy and you're always doing it effortlessly. So the effort is only the beginning stages. It's not really effort, but when you break into a new habit, the old wants to still stay there and take over. So you still have to push it out as you inquire, to whom does it come? Who feels miserable? And as you keep practicing and practicing it becomes effortless, and pretty soon you do not have to do anything. It just happens by itself. You become happier and happier, more peaceful, and your life becomes a joy to others and to yourself. Nate, I'm confusing the false I with the true I is that? Robert, there's only one I, but for the sake of conversation, we say there is a personal I which is your ego. The only confusion is you are identifying with the personal I instead of the real I. The real I is absolute reality, pure intelligence, Parabrahman Sat Chit Ananda. That is the real I, and you have a choice. With whom am I going to identify with? Identify with yourself, with consciousness, and there will be no question of two eyes. But, again when you begin, it is your ego as I that you're working with. Who am I means the ego. Who is this ego? Where did it come from? Who gave it birth? Why does it exist? And then you will realize why I gave it birth by believing in it. I created my ego myself. I did all this. It begins to change. The personal I becomes weaker and consciousness becomes stronger until the personal I disappears altogether and you become free. So do not keep identifying with the personal I. Hold on to it follow it by asking, what is I? Who am I? All levels and all teachings are an emanation of the mind, for there has to be someone to experience those levels. Vichara or self-inquiry goes right to the heart of the matter. It bypasses every system, negates every system and awakens you immediately. The mind as I gives you the problem. When the mind as I goes, everything else goes with it, all of your past teachings, the world, the universe, God, reincarnation, karma. You become free of the whole mess and you awaken. Though again every system is a projection of the mind. You have to be present to do the work whereas in this teaching we get rid of the you that does the work. Though if the you is gone, there's no work to be done. 
in other words, who has to meditate. I do. There has to be somebody present for you to meditate. Instead of meditating, ask yourself, who meditates? And the answer will be, I do. Then who am I? And the light will come on and you'll be free. Once the I goes there is nobody left to do any spiritual work for you become consciousness. You become absolute reality, omnipresent, infinite. ST, so you're saying these are progressive systems? Robert, those are progressive systems and I suppose most people need those things. They're good. There's nothing wrong with these things, but the direct path is Vichara. You bypass everything. SW. In the case of the man who spent 25 years with Ramana, who isn't understanding, is he not going through stages? Robert, on the contrary he is just there. He's at peace with himself, and when the time is right for him, he'll awaken. There are no stages to go through as long as he's present. SW, that brings up this question then. If you were practicing and someone comes in here and they never heard this teaching before and they start practicing, the first thing they have to do is to recognize that they have a mind and to recognize God within. And when they recognize that, then they have a herd of horses within, a stampede. Though for a while, for Atmavachara and who am I to work, they have to slow down that stampede by working through a system. So that's a progressive stage in a way, because there are emotions involved and feelings and sensations that come up. And all of this, for a person to cut through and to evolve, they must work on those levels. Robert, how do you know? Because I went through it. Robert, so that means everybody goes through it? Well looking at the average human being, I would say absolutely. Robert, there are some people who just awaken. There are some people who go through stages. There are some people who do a lot of work. There are some people who practice meditation and mantras all day long. There are some people who do nothing and they awaken. SW. Yes, but most people like that are very few like Ramana. Ramana was an exception. Well, then learn how to do it and become like Ramana. Practice what Ramana practiced, and you too can be an exception. Why should you identify with the other? Identify with Ramana's practice. He said the same thing. Why go through the trouble to go through yoga practices? You'll come back life after life after life and keep practicing yoga. Find out who's practicing and become free. Doesn't that sound reasonable? All you have to do is to find out who's practicing. Who needs to do all these things? I do. Well, who am I? Where did I come from? I, I. Get rid of that I and you're home free. Nate, what about the identification with the body? I'm confusing the body with the thoughts. Robert, what about it? Identification? When there's pain you're just involved in the pain, can that be reality? Robert, the reality is not the pain. The body is in pain but you are not the body. Though if you stick to your true self, you will hardly feel the pain. The body take care of itself. Do not concern yourself with the body. The body will still eat, it will still go to the bathroom, it will still take a shower, it will still take care of itself, but you have absolutely nothing to do with it. You are not the body, so why identify with the pain? Identify with consciousness with the self, and then see what happens. This is why when people like Ramana and Ramakrishna were dying, especially Ramakrishna, he literally wasted away, and they used to tell him the same way they did Ramana. Master, heal yourself. We have seen you heal others. Heal yourself. And the answer would always be the same. You foolish people, what do you see? Who sees a sick body? There is nobody to be sick. What are you looking at? Change your identification. See the truth. 
That's why Jesus was able to say, I am with you always, even unto the end the world, for he realized he was consciousness, not the body, not what appears to be real. Everything that most of you are looking at right now is an appearance. It is not the truth. There is another world of reality where there is only perfection, love, bliss, joy. With whom are you identifying? The choice is yours. SB, the I seems to be such a deeply ingrained habit. It seems like the primary addiction. It seems like all other addictions come out of the addiction of I. Robert, yes. The ego addiction is the primary addiction. Robert, indeed. Correct. That's the problem is that it's so addictive. Robert, as you keep referring back to yourself and saying, Who am I? The I becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. Eventually it has to disappear, and then you're free. SP, sometimes I feel a little loosened up, abiding, and then other times it's all forgotten and it's back to the ego again. That's how it appears to work, but as you continue practicing and practicing and practicing, the day will come when you're home free. That's why I said do not look at time, even if it takes more than a lifetime. You're still ahead of the person going bowling. SB, even when you see the thoughts moving, and you see how identified you are, it's almost like the ego enjoys this. It enjoys resisting the peace, silence and intelligence. It's so used to this that it seems to like its own suffering. Robert, well are you talking from the standpoint of the ego or the self? SB, from the ego. So ask yourself, who's going through all this? Who's suffering? To whom does it come? Identify with the source, not with the ego. Do not go into all the details of what the ego does. Go into the details of what the self is, pure intelligence, absolute awareness, Sachit Ananda, Parabrahman. Speak of those things, and let the ego take care of itself. SB, it's funny the ego doesn't seem to want all that. No, you don't want all that. SB, why? Because you refuse to identify with those higher things. You keep talking about the ego over and over again as if it were a power. But, it doesn't even exist. It's a non-entity. SP, I guess I'm possessed. Students laugh. You're possessed by God. You can never get away from God no matter how hard you try. SP, I've been trying with all my might. Laughter. Maybe that's the problem, just observe and watch, stop trying. Watch your mind in action. Observe your thoughts, become the witness, and then you'll say, Ah, look what's happening to me. Am I that? Of course not. Then it will become easier for you. SB, it's really embarrassing to watch your mind, because you feel like you should be committed to a mental institution. It's total nonsense, total craziness. Robert, again, to whom is it embarrassing? It's embarrassing to the ego. The ego watches, the ego's embarrassed, and the ego fights back, but you do not react to it. Do not react. Watch, observe, and ask the question, to whom does it come? That's all you've got to do and everything else will take care of itself. SB Watching it breaks the identification. Robert, observing. It's funny when you start to forget to observe it, you melt into the identification of it so easily. You melt into the identification of the ego. That's what is wonderful about inquiry that it breaks it. Robert, don't get caught up in too many details. Make it simple, very simple, the simpler the better. Nate, I think part of the problem is, speaking for myself of course, is that I don't believe it will happen. I feel it happens just to a favored few like Jesus or Buddha or yourself. What's the sense of trying it if it's not going to happen? Robert, well if you don't feel it's not going to happen what can you do? Go see a movie. 
students laugh. You've got to realize you are greater than you think, and you've got the same power within you as everybody else does. It may appear to be asleep, but as you work on yourself, work on yourself, work on yourself, you will awaken it. And one day it will become stronger than you are and take you over completely and you'll be free. But you've got to keep on working on yourself and stop putting yourself down. That's the worst thing you can do is to put yourself down. That's blasphemy because you're putting God down. Think of yourself as a higher person, love yourself, worship yourself, bow to yourself. You are greater than you think. S.L. Robert at first when you were speaking to Bob, you said to make things simple and follow self-inquiry of who am I, and at the same time you said, don't make it like a mantra. If you keep saying I I, or who am I? I am me, well for me I got caught in a circular answer and question thing. You said not to make it like a mantra. Robert, who am I is never a mantra. You simply observe yourself, ask yourself the question, to whom do these things come? To me, then say, who am I? Or I I I I. It's not a mantra. As you keep doing it to yourself, you will awaken. SL. Even if I do the question and answer, even though I come into a circle of three questions with three answers and I kept going around and around, so it's not a mantra? Robert, no it's not. But, you can ask yourself, to whom do these things come? To whom do the three questions come? There has to be a person to experience the three questions. Get rid of that person and you'll be free. SL, would I be breaking self-inquiry if I got rid of the me with, to whom do these questions come? They come to me. Self-inquiry is only for the ego. SL, I'm like Bob then. I've got a big ego. Keep practicing. Keep practicing and you'll break it down. SN, Robert has often said when you ask yourself the question, you don't answer because when you answer, that just comes from the mind. When you ask, who am I, just rest in that feeling of I, don't answer it. SB, is consciousness observing all the self-inquiry? Robert, consciousness is self-contained. It has nothing to do with self-inquiry. Only the ego does. SB, then why do we have to do self-inquiry? Because you have to use the ego to get rid of the ego. SB, so consciousness is noticing all of the self-inquiry then. It doesn't notice anything. As you practice self-inquiry, your mind will disappear, and your true self will come forth all by itself. SB, and is my true self here now? Yes, you will awaken to it, but you don't believe it is, so you're practicing self-inquiry. SL, how do you trace it to the heart when you say that with self-inquiry you trace it to the heart? Robert, another term for the heart is consciousness, so the heart is really consciousness. You simply inquire, who am I? It takes care of itself. The I becomes weaker and weaker and disappears. S, H, your attention then should always be focused on the source. Robert, on the source. Yeah, when you hold on to the eye, that's just a way of focusing attention on the source from whence the eye arises. Robert, yes, when I say hold on to the eye, I mean you're witnessing the eye. You're watching it, you're watching where it goes. SH, from whence it arises. From whence it came from and where it goes back to. SH, when you say that consciousness or God dwells in you as you, that as you is not referring then to the ego. No, it's referring to consciousness. SH, it's redundant really. Yes. Consciousness is your true existence, and there is nothing else. Everything else we talk about, everything else we do is to make you realize that your true nature is consciousness then everything becomes redundant. But, we have to talk like this because you believe you're human. You believe you're the body. 
When will you stop believing that? Pause. Time to eat. S.H. Time is preordained. We have nothing to do with time. Robert, to whom? That was a joke. S.L. Robert, if a person believes that they're happy in this alleged consciousness that we all possibly share, I mean your students, is that the same thing as being in love with nature as being in love with life? Is that about on the same level in your eyes as going bowling? Robert, all of these things that you're referring to is a projection of your mind. You create your universe, and you create your world, and you create the trees and the bowling and everything else. So get rid of your mind and everything else will go. SL, there won't be any trees. You'll be the tree. You'll be everything you like. SL, so then it's really the ego that entertains all this beauty. You can say that yes. You bring fresh flowers into your room and then they die in a couple of days. So how can that be real? SL, even when they are so pretty. Everything you fall in love with gets old and dies. So how can you say that's real? Contact reality and you will always be happy. Okay, let's eat. Students laugh. SK, before we eat, Robert wants to hand out stuff to everybody. Robert, I do. Yeah. Laughter. S. H. Thanks for letting Robert know. Robert, where is it? What's he handing out? Prashad continues as at this point the tape ends. Transcript 34. One self, one consciousness. January 3rd, 1991. Robert, I had quite an interesting day today. I received approximately 15 phone calls from people all over the place. My doorbell rang about ten times. The dog was barking and biting everyone who comes in. My daughter was playing the stereo at full blast. And yet my body responded the way it's supposed to. But I had absolutely nothing to do with it. It didn't affect me the self one iota. Yet my body did what it had to do, took care of the calls and answered the door, quieted the dog, turned down the stereo, but I had absolutely nothing to do with it. I'm bringing this point up to show you that you can be in the most horrendous situations and be at peace. It doesn't matter what you're going through, even death. It makes no difference. The real you has absolutely nothing to do with it. You are free from the whole thing. There may be wars all around you, people fighting and stabbing each other, people quiet and peaceful. Look at both those situations the same way, with even-mindedness. Do not react to anything. Do not allow your mind to go out and respond. Do not think past your nose. Your body is going to do whatever it has to do, but you are not your body. Anything that you respond to is a product of your mind. It is your mind that becomes angry. It is your mind that becomes stubborn. It is your mind that wants to get even. It is your mind that is hurt. But, if you subdue your mind tell me where is the anger? Where is the depression? Where is the response to conditions? There isn't any. When the mind is subdued, there is only eternal peace, and that peace is the self-consciousness. Consciousness is always peaceful, always happy. It has nothing to do with conditions. All conditioning comes from the mind. Therefore I say to you, do not try to change conditions. Do not try to change situations. Simply learn how to control the mind by making it passive and quiet, and then you will find that things turn out better for you than you can possibly ever hope for. There are no problems. There is nothing wrong. Everything is unfolding as it should. Everything happens in its own time. Space and time are illusions. They really do not exist. They're stationary. Causation does not exist either. No thing has a cause therefore, no thing has an effect. 
Cause and effect are again products of your own mind. When the mind is quiet, karma ceases, samskaras are non-existent. There never was a cause for anything. But, if you feel that in a previous life you did something wrong and now you are paying the price, or if you think that you did something wrong in this life and you're paying the price, then you'll pay the price, because that's what you think. There is virtually no price to pay because nothing ever happened. If it appears to have happened to you then you have to go through the consequences of having the effect returned, or karma will come back to you, because that's what you feel, that's what you believe. It's all in your feelings and your belief system. But, if you feel as if you're born at every moment, every moment becomes brand new. Where is the effect? There's no time for any effect. There is no space in which to have the effect. Space and time and causation become one, the present moment. And if you feel like that then you can look into the future which doesn't exist and see what's happening. It all has to do with your mind. As long as you feel situations you know it's your mind that's doing it. There's a story about Buddha and the courtesan. One day Buddha and his devotees were going through a forest and they came to a town. The word spread through the town that Buddha was coming. And there was a beautiful home where there lived this courtesan, this high-class prostitute. He heard about the wonder of Buddha, how beautiful he was, and she said to herself, I must have this man. Though she sent her handmaidens out to the edge of the forest where Buddha was camping, and they beseeched him to come see their mistress. Buddha's devotees tried to chase them away. But Buddha said, No, I will go. And the devotees told him he was crazy. How come he's going with them? He said, I shall return, wait here. He went into this mansion of a home, and he saw this beautiful lady. And she looked at him and she said, I wasn't wrong. And she told the Buddha, Stay with me, I will give you riches that you never dreamed of. I will give you love that you've never known. And the Buddha smiled and he said, Not now. And she beseeched him and said, I will give you my body, and you will have love that you never experienced. I will give you my home. Stay with me and I will make you the happiest man that ever lived. And Buddha said, No, not now. And this went on for a couple of hours. Finally she got worn out and Buddha said, Thank you, and left. He went back to his devotees, didn't say anything, they traveled through the forest and left the town. Thirty years passed. The Buddha was going through the town again with his devotees. All of a sudden he remembered something and he told his devotees, Stay here and wait for me. I have to go see my beloved. So he went back to where the house used to be. It was now nothing but a shambles and he looked for the lady. He saw people laughing in the street. And there she was, a beggar with leprosy. People shunning her and spitting on her. And he came over to her and he said, My beloved, I have returned for you. Now I want you as much as you wanted me. And he kissed her on the forehead, and she was healed. She became his disciple and spent the rest of her life with the Buddha. The moral of that story, of course, is things are not the way they seem. We judge situations by the way they appear. We look at someone and we think that's the way they are. We respond to conditioning. We've been brainwashed since we were children to believe that things are supposed to be a certain way. But things are not supposed to be any way. Things just are. They have no substance, they have no reality. As you respond to conditions you are simply wasting your energy when you can be using that energy to uncover yourself, to discover your own reality. What are you doing with your life? How do you spend your days? The appearance is that your body is getting older and older, and if you're still judging by appearances you try to look younger and younger by putting creams on your face, by exercising day and night by buying the finest clothes. 
is like beating a dead horse. The so-called body is not meant to last. As soon as you were born you began to die. Therefore find out. Who was born? Who dies? Who has experiences? Who is going through this entire mess? Who needs it? Who wants it? Wake up. The question is always asked in this respect, if it's necessary to do sadhana in order to awaken. Is it necessary to spend years in yoga techniques and pranayama, breathing exercises, to sit in meditation, to think of certain things, to pray? Is all this necessary? What do you think? Who can tell me? SK, it's not necessary but it sure is helpful. Robert, that's actually a good answer. My question is therefore, to whom is it helpful? Who is getting satisfaction from sadhana? Only your ego. It is true to an extent you're subduing your ego, but you and I know many people who have been doing sadhana for a hundred years and nothing happened. As a matter of fact some of you even become worse. It's paradoxical. For some people it causes them to move ahead. But, it's still, all in relative terms, and as we all know by now, relative terms do not exist. So for whom is sadhana? Again it's for the mind and the ego. If you think it's helping by all means continue. But, remember I said, if you think it's helping. If you stop thinking, you do not have to do any sadhana. I suppose sadhana is necessary as long as you believe you are the mind and the body. Again after all, who is doing the spiritual disciplines? Does the self need to do that? Does consciousness need to do discipline? Does absolute reality need discipline? What needs discipline? The mind and the body. Therefore the more you are attached to the mind and body the more you have to do sadhana. Does that make sense? As sadly yes. Though I won't say to you, stop doing it, due to the fact that many of you have a strong connection with your body and your mind. As long as you do I suppose sadhana makes you sort of quiet for a while and gives you its own experience of a sort of peace that doesn't last too long. It causes samadhi for some people, nirvikalpa samadhi. But, if you're an aspiring jhani, what's the purpose of sadhana? You simply ask yourself, who needs to do this? I do. What is this I? This personal I, where did it come from? How did it get here? Who gave it birth? As you ask yourself these questions, that is your sadhana. That's all you need to do. But, you continue doing this 24 hours a day. That's what it means by praying without ceasing. As you meet the challenges of the day you keep asking yourself, to whom does this come? Who is feeling this condition? Who is going through this situation? Who feels emotional? As you keep doing this all day long, you will find that you become more peaceful, you become happy and your life becomes better. That's really the only sadhana you need. But, of course, if you cannot do that then you have to do whatever you have to do. Whatever helps you, that's what you have to do. I suppose that's why it says that jhana marga, atmavachara, is for the mature soul, one who can do this regularly, without reverting back to hatha yoga, or raja yoga, any of the yogas. They all have their place, but self-inquiry is the royal way. It's the shortcut. But, it's up to you. It's your choice. And of course self-inquiry is merely to quiet the mind. It's a fast method to quiet the mind. For when you ask, to whom does this come? It comes to me, and you hold on to that me by inquiring, who am I? What is I? And saying I I to yourself, I I, the mind becomes quieter and quieter. The deeper you go within yourself the quieter you become. And that's your sadhana. That's all you have to do. 
Any questions? SL, you said that you had an interesting day, but it seems that you were alluding to the phone calls and the doorbells as being annoying to you, except that you were aware that it didn't bother you because it wasn't an interruption. Robert, no, I wasn't really aware of anything. SL, was it just something that was just happening? Something was happening, and I was responding accordingly. SL, yeah. But, there was no feeling or emotion or anything. SL, I see. Card you gave us on Sunday said, be an irrepressible fountain of happiness. If a person feels that way, then is that also just the ego entertaining itself? It depends why you feel like that. Do you feel that way? SL, for no specific reason. Well that's good. That's all you need to do. If you feel like that because of a reason or because of a condition C, that card is really for the ego. When you're working out of the ego you have to force yourself to be happy, to try to be good to people, to develop loving kindness, and develop all these emotions. SL, what if it just happens to you without any purpose? Then you're advanced. That's a good sign. SL, if the doorbell ringing becomes a wonderful opportunity and the telephone ringing, when it rings, feeling like something wonderful is happening, is that practically the ego again? Well, when the doorbell rings and the phone rings, it's not supposed to feel that something wonderful is happening. You're supposed to be wonderful within to begin with and then that's just a happening that's going on. SL, what if everything seems to be a good lesson? Well, that's good for your growth then. SL, even going bowling could be good way of working on oneself. It could be. There's no question about that, but for whom? SL, right. We get back to the ego again. SL laughs. The ego goes bowling. The ego does everything. Laughter. Everything you do is the ego. When the time comes when you know with certainty beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are not the ego and you're not the body or the mind, then everything happens spontaneously. The doorbell rings, you answer the door. SL, I suppose most of us would be acutely aware of that when we're not attached to our body. Of course. When you are not identified with the body, there's nobody left to be aware. It's just a spontaneous happening. There are no words to really describe it. SL, I'm hogging all the questions here, but another thing, when you were talking about the Buddha kissing the courtesan and healing her. The healing was a good thing then, it was good for her, it was something he gave to her. It was, in other words, the appearance of her being a leper was not as good as the appearance of her being a healthy woman. Though he chose to heal her. Robert, for her it was necessary for this to happen. This was her experience. SL, it isn't necessary for everyone to be healed. No, it's not. It's neither good nor bad. Because after all, what is healed? The body which doesn't even exist. So why should you waste your time healing a body that doesn't exist? SL, if there are more lessons to be learned in this life, then a person who is well is more able to advance, and I don't understand reincarnation, but is more able to, well to get further and as you said the other night, come back with more advantages of understanding. Robert, that's how it appears. But, in reality there's no causation for existence. Though none of that is relevant. It's only relevant when your mind's on that level. SL, there really is no cause and no effect. In reality, it doesn't exist. SK, absolute reality. Robert, absolute reality, yes. SL, but on this plane as we know it, as we're making our way towards understanding. Robert, but who knows this plane? The ego. SL, I see.
Therefore, if you work on destroying the ego, there are no planes to contend with. And there's no relative world to contend with. It all goes back to the ego. The ego has to work things out. The ego has to make progress. The ego tells you you're healthy or sick. The ego gets you in trouble. So don't try to change the condition. SH, can it get you out of trouble too? Robert, when you destroy it. Laughter. SN, it is trouble. Robert, it's trouble to begin with, right? SH, the only trouble. Robert, sure, and it doesn't even exist. SL, if one is, as we are all apparently stuck in this ego. Robert, speak for yourself. Laughter. I mean the people on this side of the room. Robert, how do you know what's going on on this side of the room? Whom as we are as we appear to be in this ego life here, if we find it easy, or not even easy, but natural or whatever, to live as an irrepressible source of happiness does that point of view seem to make everything work on that level, on a good level as we see as we appear, to want things to be smooth, like the plumbing doesn't break all the time. Robert, well as far as the relative world is concerned, what you're saying is true. But, there is a happiness that is beyond plumbing, there's a happiness beyond everything. SL, well that's why we're here. The idea is to find your real happiness, to find out what is real happiness. It's unconditioned. It has nothing to do with person, place or thing. Happiness is your real nature. Your happiness. Happiness is another word for you. But, it's unconditioned. It's not replacing good for bad or bad for good has nothing to do with good and bad. Those are relative terms. Happiness is another word for absolute reality, or consciousness, for ultimate oneness, for pure awareness. That's synonymous with happiness. SL, I understand. And it's omnipresent. Though when you have the real happiness you see it in the world because the world becomes yourself and there is none other than yourself that exists. SL, but there's something beyond that just being as we are, seeing beauty, happiness, joy, peace everywhere. Who sees that? SL, even though that it's the ego seeing that, it's still all good. That's the opposite of bad. SL, pardon me. It's the opposite of bad. SL, yes. Seeing all these good things. SL, yes. Though when you see a beautiful flower, and then it fades the next day and dies, you become disillusioned. You have to go and pick another flower. SL, but it never does die because the seed in the flower is making another seed. But, as far as you're concerned there's birth and death. Just like with bodies. Old flowers die and new ones are born, just like people. So you look at that condition and you say, what does this mean? He you say that. What's the purpose to all this? Is that what life is all about? SL. Creation. For whom is creation? Creation is a bad dream. SL. Creation is a bad dream. Yes. SK, or a good dream, right? Robert, no, all creation is a bad dream. Because all of creation is birth and death. SK, has a dream. Yes. SK, that's why they don't worship Brahman anymore, they just worship Shiva and Vishnu. Correct. SL, creation is a bad dream. Robert, MMM. Because everything you see happening in the world is happening in creation. The United States is about to go to war with Iraq, that's creation. And then you fall in love and you think it's going to last forever, that's creation. But, people grow old and grow tired, they die, that's all part of creation. 
Now what is the cause of creation? The mind. When the mind slows down creation ceases and you just become yourself. So do you want to be yourself or be creation? SG. Is that mind synonymous with God? Robert, mind? That mind. Robert. Yes, synonymous with God because God is a result of mind. Everything comes out of your mind. Everything that you behold, the universe God, people, places, things, reincarnation, karma. SK, it wouldn't be God. If it's a word pointing to some kind of absolute, it would be God as Ishvara. Robert, Ishvara, personal God, that's right. It's not God used in as a word to point to that absolute. Robert, no I didn't. We talked about God. Whenever I refer to God, I'm talking about absolute reality or consciousness. So then God wouldn't be the mind. Robert, no, not in that case. But, usually when people refer to God, they refer to a personal God, which is okay as long as you believe you're the mind and body. SG, can you say that the ego does everything, and Bhagavad Gita says God is the doer that's coming from the point of the body-mind? Robert, God is the doer, yes. Comes from body-mind, that's right. SL, so God as we think of as God as the creator, is still the ego's idea, the mind thinking? Exactly, yes. SG, it's pure ego. It's pure ego. But, I don't like to call it pure ego because it sounds important. Laughter. SK, so who's the doer? There is no doer. SK, there is no doer. No doer exists. Never has existed. SK, so does the Bhagavad Gita say God is the doer? There is a point, yes. It says the personal God is the doer. Because that God is. SK, is what? Is the doer because God tells you do this and do that. You say, God made me do it. That kind of a God is a doer. SH, what is the relationship between absolute consciousness and functioning of mind, if there is any? Robert, functioning of mind? Yes, the mind, that is an offspring of consciousness in some way? Robert, I don't think so. Where does it arise from? Robert, it doesn't. Where does the appearance come from? Robert, the appearance comes from your imagination. SH, I imagine there is a mind. It's called false imagination, that you imagine there's a mind and then there's an appearance. It's like the optical illusion I always talk about, the sky is blue or the mirage in the desert. You're looking at the desert and you see tanks coming, and they're coming and you think it's false, and they blow you apart, and your troubles are over. S.G. Shankarakarya said that all is illusion, there is only Brahman, and the universe and Brahman are one. But, you don't have to come to a place of first seeing everything as an illusion. And there is a place where everything is simply the self to that extent. Robert, no you don't. Because when you come to that place when you see everything as an illusion, it's the ego who sees all that. But, if the ego is destroyed then where is the place, where is the illusion? Everything is gone with it. The ego mind invents all these things. SF, Robert, the illusion, is that there seems to be an illusion. Robert, that's the illusion, right? SL, but you said, you see the illusion, you see like pictures on the screen. Robert, sure I do. I see everybody sitting in this room. But, I see everyone as consciousness. SG, also, do you also see your body of Robert in this room too? Robert, well sure I do. Do you see that as consciousness? Robert, I see my body as consciousness. SR, 
we make the mistake of thinking that the bodies are seeing the bodies, and that's why we tend to see them as bodies. Whereas the truth is consciousness is not seeing it from a place, so it's only seeing itself. Robert, it's just a different viewpoint. That's right. In the movie you see the screen and you see the images. But, most of us forget there's a screen and we're only concerned with the images. But, the screen exists whether there are images or not. The screen always exists. In the same way consciousness exists whether you are aware of it or not. You can identify with your body and that's where all the trouble starts, or you can identify with consciousness and become free, and realize all of life is only superimposed on the screen on consciousness. S.H. And only the screen exists period. That's it. S.R. Since there is no time in a certain sense, we're always free to really make that choice. It's not like we're stuck for a long time, and then maybe someday, we'll get that choice. But it's really as long as we drop that idea that we're bound in time. Robert, that's right. It's an idea. It's a belief. That question, how long does it take? is really making the first assumption that you're stuck in that to begin with. Robert, how long does it take? When you say how long does it take, it holds you back. Right? Robert, it keeps you back from realizing. This lady said the ego sees the flower, and in a sense that's really not true. Consciousness knows in a sense, everything. It's only the reaction that seems to be ego. Robert, there is no ego and there is no flower. Right. Robert, there's only consciousness. And when there's reaction there seems to be an appearance of ego. Robert, when the mind is active everything takes place flowers, death, birth, imagination. S.H., can the mind be active if there's no ego? No. The mind and ego are synonymous. We use all these words, but they mean the same thing. SL, it seems like a person would become a vegetable. Robert, to whom does it feel like that? Oh, sure I know. Robert, you see that's your ego you're fighting. Your ego doesn't want you to do anything. It wants you to stay the way you are. Though it will tell you all these things about vegetables and everything else. Laughter. SF, Robert, when you say about the only feeling is not to react, I think this surely is, it's impossible for the Ajani not to react. Because even not reacting is reacting. I think maybe for the Johnny. Tape break question unfinished as Robert continues as tape starts abruptly. Robert, so why not start at the top and just awaken and become free of it all? SR, when we ask these questions it's like the awakening stage has to appear first to someone. When we say other people, they are in the waking state of the ego that's asking the question. The right there you've got the fact that the waking state is appearing and you're taking it to be real. Though it seems like there's the time for inquiry. Robert, of course. You should spend your hours all day long asking yourself. To whom does this come? Every time you react to any condition ask the question, To whom does it come? Even if it's a good reaction. SR, even if it's just seeing that the world is in front of your eyes ask, To whom does it come? And you should start as soon as you get out of bed. SG, I find it just as disruptive having something I wanted to come to me, and that giddiness, and the happiness, that supposed happiness for having it, I use self-inquiry on that as well as something is just as. Robert, of course. Remember happiness and unhappiness, are two sides of the same coin. Do not allow happiness to fool you, human happiness, because you know how long that lasts. Therefore work on yourself. Catch yourself. Catch yourself being humanly happy. Enjoy the happiness, 
but ask yourself, to whom does it come? And you'll realize that it's your ego being happy with itself for a while and then it will turn into something else. Remember the only thing apparent in this life is change. Everything must change. Therefore do not become disillusioned, because you won the lottery or you met someone you love very dearly or you inherited a new home or a car. Do not allow that to cause you not to work with your sadhana of self-inquiry. S.L. From your point of view, is it impossible to love one person more than another? Robert, no. You have to be able to see their development as different. Robert, who sees? Who sees? Laughs. Well, from your point of view. Robert, from my point of view, all is well. All is well. S.N., Robert, does the Johnny get angry? Robert, nope, except sometimes to teach a lesson. Though he fakes it? Robert, sometimes. S.H., he has the appearance of anger. Robert, sometimes. S.G., does he fake happiness? Does he fake the appearance of happiness? Robert, sometimes. S.N., but I'm not asking whether he faked it or not. What I'm asking is does anger come to a Johnny? Not really. Unless he fakes it. S.N., I've been reading I am that, and this Sargadetta was known getting angry a lot. I know. He used to get very angry at Balsakar. Laughter. That was the appearance. S.N., so you're saying it was an act? Yes. S.N., because someone asked him a question on that and he said, When I identify with the Gunas then anger arises. When I stop identifying with it, then anger disappears. Though he was saying, at that moment, because I was identifying with it, the anger arose. But, when I recognized the anger and discontinued identifying with it, it disappeared. Robber, he didn't mean that. If he spoke like that he wouldn't be a Johnny. S.N., well that's what he said in the book. I know. There's no emotion in a Johnny. There is no anger or happiness human unless they are putting on an act. Because the mind has been completely transcended. S.N., so he was acting? Apparently. S.N., he acted a lot. He sure did. S.N., that couldn't be understood just as his samskaras? I remember reading in Tripura Rahasya, they were talking about three types of Johnnies. One type completely destroys any kind of samskaras. Another type that hasn't occurred and that he draws from that from time to time to appear to be human I suppose. Robert, yes I recall that. But, that's only for an interpretation of a book. But, you have to understand in reality there's only one Johnny, not two or three or four. Sen, but I suppose the question really is then was Nisargad, it a coming from the level of the mind or was he a Johnny? Robert, he was a Johnny. Though regardless of all the things we hear about him, I mean I heard at one point he was really angry at this one woman because she was going to see another teacher and he was trying to throw the table at her and yelling at her, get out, get out, go and see him, don't come back, you know. Seth, did he miss with the table? Laughter. Robert, he did all of those things. But, it was all in fun. S.N. Many things in I am that can be misleading. Yes they can. S.N. If you don't read it the right way. That's why I've told you many times those books are dangerous to some people. S.L. Somebody said, an old teacher of mine that Jesus never laughed. A true? Robert. He never laughed. I wasn't there. I don't know. S.L., but if you're a Johnny and Jesus was the same, would the consciousness be the same? I've seen you laugh. No, see what you do, as you develop yourself, you have some of your personality left in your body. 
Nacelle, you have what? Some of your personality, that sort of human. That's still part of the illusion that appears to be there. Though when you see a Johnny reacting in a different way it has to do with their personality, which doesn't even exist. But, it appears to exist for your sake. And none of these quirks exist, but they appear to for your sake. SN, so from the onlooker actually the Johnny looks like anyone else? Robert, yes and they see in the Johnny what's in them. SN, but don't we see in each other also what is in us, not just the Johnny? Yes we do. The onlooker sees, wherever he looks he sees himself. SN, from the point of the view of the onlooker that the Johnny is not any different than anyone else. How is one to distinguish? That's why it is said that you must turn within yourself, and the answer will come out of yourself, and you will know. SN, but Ramana would say that you can tell because when you're in the presence of a Johnny you feel a great peace. In other words their peace becomes your peace. That's true to an extent. But, if the Johnny is walking in the marketplace and you bump into him, you will not be able to tell, usually. But, if you're in a class with a Johnny then, there's a peace yes. Then you feel peace. Sen, but what I'm saying is when people were with Nisarged, Ada, he was getting angry and carrying on, obviously he looked like anyone else. But, people felt a great peace with him, except those he chased away. Laughter. SR, a lot of people didn't feel anything around Ramana. Robert, that's right. SN, yeah, I guess that's a point. Robert, it all depends on yourself. If you work on yourself, if you go within, then you will be led to the right teacher at the right time and all will go well with you. But, if you're only doing things externally you'll make a lot of mistakes and go to the wrong places. SG, if that is also part of where you need to be at that time though too. Robert, yes. Everything is preordained. SG, right. Though why worry about these things? Turn within, find yourself, and be free. Most people go around saying who's a Johnny, who's not, who's enlightened, who's not. It's a waste of energy. Forget about all this. It doesn't matter. Find yourself. And then see if those questions come to you. SN, Robert, in the process of finding yourself the question of practice comes up. And is not Vichara itself a practice? Robert, you can call it a practice, but it's a technique for destroying the ego. And if you're practicing enough, and you call it a practice, you will see amazing results. But, we're using words it's semantics. We say this is a practice, this is a technique. It doesn't matter what you call it. We should all do it. SN, well it's not to say as if Achara is the only the only path. Oh there are many paths of course. It depends on the temperament of the devotee. SN, but it is a practice itself. So in the end if everything is predetermined, the question arises why do a practice at all, nevertheless? Because you act as if it is not predetermined. You are to act as if nothing is predetermined, even though it is. You will do what you are supposed to do. That's why we are told to stop reacting completely and to dive deep within the self and become liberated. SN, but Chanamarga is a pathless path you can say that. Of course it is. But what good are those terms if they don't mean anything? SN, well it almost seems as though you were saying that well we need to do vichara and we talked about surrender, that was another path, and witnessing. What I'm getting at is whether we should think in terms of cause and effect. If we do this that will be the cause and the effect will be self-realization. What I'm saying is that self-realization, ultimately, is something that just happens of itself. In the meantime you just pretend, well if I do this, this will happen. Robert, what you should do is to stop thinking. 
laughter. And you should do everything you can to stop your mind from thinking these things. Because all the things that you say seem important, but they have no validity to Atmavichara. The less we think the better off we are. Even about the practice. SF, that's a question I have, Robert. What is the point, if there is a point of encounter between an inquisitive quite egoic mind who wants to know everything, all the details on one side? And the other side is, you yourself have said before, don't take for granted all that I tell you. Come up with your own conclusions. The Buddha said, be a lamp unto yourself. Robert, yes. So you have to find a medium term or position between those two extremes. Robert, not really. SF, no. Because when you say you have to find, who has to find? You go right back to the ego. SF, right. All we have to do is still the mind. SF, right and any of these activities. Whatever helps us. All of the things that help us still the mind are good. SF, right. As long as they're helping us to still the mind. But, if they make us too active then we're on the wrong track. SF, trying to clarify any point to the utmost extreme, or trying to read too much. All that is feeding the ego or the mind extremely. Robert, yes. Simplicity. Keep everything simple quiet. Who doesn't want to accept Atmavichara? I mean if I don't want to accept Atmavichara as a practice, if I don't want to accept that practice, also I'm sort of resistant. And who is resisting? It's the ego I guess. Robert, of course. And then you look for other paths and you try this and you try that for a couple of months and you try something else. But, you never sit down and try to quiet the mind. You keep searching. The mind searches. The mind never wants to rest. Though so you've got to observe your mind, you've got to become the witness to your mind and keep inquiring, for whom is the mind? And then you come home free. SR, we're really looking for our questions to be extinguished and not answered. Robert, true of course. SH, when we refer to the mind we're just referring to thoughts that occur. There isn't anything such as a mind. Robert, exactly. A mind doesn't exist. SH, no. The mind is only a conglomeration of thoughts. So do not think of your mind as an entity. It's the thoughts that you have to subdue because you think too much. It doesn't really matter what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. All thinking has to stop, and then reality comes of itself. SG, when Ramana said that the mind is nothing more than a bundle of thoughts. Robert, true. There is no location for that bundle of thoughts. Robert, there's no what? There's no location. Robert, no location. I mean there isn't a bundle, it's a finite bundle that finally gets the last stick, the last thought and it's gone. Robert, that's right. Thoughts do not even exist, but they appear to exist, and that's called the personal I. So that's why we're told to follow the I. And when the I disappears, so will everything else. SK, follow the I inward to the source, not outward. Inward, yes. If you follow it outwards, you have all kinds of problems. You follow inwardly, and it becomes the I am pure reality. SR, it's funny how we take words to be so real, like the word bundle. Robert, like what? Like the idea of bundle. Funny how you give reality to these things that are just meant to be tentative descriptions. Like we miss the intention then. Robert, and the mind images all these things how they look, and makes a case out of them. SR, yes, it will. And then we have to destroy everything. SR, that's because we don't really focus on the silence. 
We focus on what comes out of it. Exactly. We still and know that I am God. Pause. See? Most of you are thinking. Why do you allow yourself to think? Catch yourself before you make up stories. Laughter. Always catch yourself before the thoughts go past your nose. And you can catch yourself by simply observing and being aware that you're thinking, becoming the witness to your thinking, or keep asking yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? But do it as often as you have to. That's why satsang is so important, because it's easier here. So if you come to enough satsangs you carry it through during the working day, and you keep remembering not to think. And the remembering becomes stronger, and stronger, and stronger, until you actually stop your thoughts. And then you're free. There's really nothing profound about this teaching. It's simple. Stop thinking. SL, so simple it eludes me. Robert, who is eluded? You can never be eluded. Never put yourself down. Watch what you say about yourself. No matter how many mistakes you make, get up again, brush yourself off, and carry on. Hell, now that is one problem I find about being old, that there were so many things in my memory that I find myself carrying. That phrase I heard somewhere and I thought it was funny, and I said, it wasn't my thought, so simple it eludes me. I think W. C. Field said it as a matter of fact. Really? Where do all these thoughts stay? There's no cause. Though they don't even exist. They appear to exist as I. That's why I tell you get rid of the I and all your thoughts will go also. Pause. There's nothing else to do but to be still. SF, Robert and the phrase I am consciousness, what I is that? Robert, the real I. I'm consciousness is simultaneously both correct. SL, and when you say to us, I love you, you were speaking from that. Robert, I'm speaking of the universal I, I, as omnipresence. Love is omnipresence. You is omnipresence. Though the I is the entire universe, the I is the self, the I is pure consciousness. SL, but when we, speaking from our ego point of view, say, we love you, it seems like in most of life, it seems a manipulative word. Well, change it. SL, well, I don't think I mean it that way. I think it comes from a ego place. Well, why even think about that? SL, pardon me? Why think about that at all? Why do you think about it at all? Stop thinking and just do it. SL, say I love you. Speak from your heart. In other words, do not think where it's coming from. You don't want to walk around all day saying, this came from here and this came from there. Simply say what you mean and forget it. SF, it's afterwards there comes a doubt. Robert, yes. You didn't mean it. Robert, of course. And there's no doubt at the time. Robert, exactly. SR. It's not the ego until that doubt comes in. Robert, that's right. It's always yourself. You are always yourself until your mind starts thinking. SR. Right. Then you lose it. SR. But even when you're like thinking of your grocery bill or you know that's not a problem. You're still yourself if everything is spontaneous. SR. Right. But, as soon as you become attached, or you start worrying about it, or fearing it, or thinking something is wrong, then you can know the ego is at work. SH, it's the manipulation of whatever occurs. Robert, the manipulation. If it occurs and it's gone, there's no problem. Robert, if it occurs and you let it go, there's no problem. It's the analyzation. Robert, Analyzation. SF, what you're saying, Robert, is that every thought is non-dual until someone is concerned themselves with the I. 
Robert, yes, exactly. All thoughts are pure. SF, non-dual. Until you start thinking about them. Thef, only when someone gets concerned with the thoughts identifying with them. Then the trouble starts. SF, identifying yourself. That's true. SF, something to the thinker. SN, so when you say don't think, you don't mean stop all your thoughts. You mean stop identifying with the thoughts that are occurring. Robert, yes. Thoughts come before the thinker comes on the picture. SD, that's very clear. Zen, so is there any point where they stop, where the thoughts do stop? Robert, the thoughts do stop, yes, and you just act spontaneously. But, they appear like thoughts, but they are no longer thoughts. For instance, if I think I'm getting up off this chair, the thought had to come to me spontaneously, but that's the end. Though I'm not really thinking about getting off the chair. I just did it. SR, that's like the end, the duration is no longer present. The thought arose, died, there was no concern. Robert, that's right. SH, there is no separation between the thought and the action. Robert, exactly. It's all one. SH1. SR, so really what happened is you lost all sense of division like there was separate thought entities. They come, they end, another one comes, it's just like, right? Robert, there's no beginning and no end. SF, so actually non-duality is the real thing, even with thoughts, and what appears to appear is the I or the one concerned with the thoughts, and that's when duality surges up. Robert, it all has to do with time and space. SF, right. Time and space are non-existent. SF, that's still the personality or ego. The ego has to do with time and space. So when time and space stops, everything is spontaneous and there's no ego, and all causation ceases. Causation has to do with time and space. SR, so memory ends too. Robert, memory ends also. SF, this is so important, Robert, because when you say that we should stop the thoughts, actually what you're implying is not to slow them, but actually let the thoughts be as they are in a non-dual way. The only thing is, don't let the I come up in between or the duality to appear in that sense. Robert, you can say that. Yes, if you just are spontaneous and you just act from your spontaneity, then you're safe. But, if you have to think about it too much, then you're caught up in it again. SF, right. SG, like sitting here, there's no need for thoughts. Robert, right. There's nothing here to do. Though there shouldn't be any thoughts. Though when the thoughts are just coming, then I catch it, and they go down, I play along the thought line. Robert, you keep catching your thoughts faster and faster. And then it all starts slowing down. SH, when you're spontaneous there's no possibility of the ego occurring. Robert, there's no ego at all. Then it's vanished. Robert, it's gone. The ego has to do with thinking. SF, excuse me, but when you try to catch the thoughts there is an observer there which is the I, Robert, or the ego trying to observe or catch the thoughts. Robert, the I, the ego, the mind are simultaneously the same. It's the same thing. So when you think it becomes the I. I think. Then I act. My mind thinks. But, when you're spontaneous there's no I to think. SF, right, but that's how it usually happens. Everything is spontaneous. The I surges almost in an atomic time immediately. Robert, I think yes. And captures the actual thought, or the thought which is occurring. Robert, that's right, yes. 
you identify with the I. But when you work on yourself and keep asking, to whom does this come? Personal I becomes weaker and weaker until it disappears. So let's practice this together. Let's become still. Now what we're going to do now is just close our eyes and watch our thoughts and catch them. As soon as you see yourself thinking ask yourself, to whom does it come? It comes to me. Hold on to the me and ask yourself, who am I? Who am I over and over again? Or you can say, I I I I. Then the thoughts will start again. Do the whole procedure over again, to whom do they come? To me. Who am I? Who is this I to whom they come? What is this I? Then some more thoughts will creep in. And you do it again and again and again until they start slowing down. And as you say, who am I, that will last longer and longer, until it stops. So let's try that. Long silence for practice. Robert, let's discuss your experiences that you've had. But, we have got some prashad. Let me hand it out for you. Take one and pass the bag around. General talk during prashad. So remember to love yourself, to bow down to yourself, to worship yourself, because God dwells in you as you. I love you all. Peace until we meet again. Have a good time. Enjoy life. Keep eating. Laughter. SM, thank you for the refreshments, Robert. At this point, the tape ends. Transcript 35. Does a sage get angry? January 6, 1991. Robert, hello. Hello. Welcome to the, what do we call ourselves? The being nobody group. Students laugh. Because when you leave here you will be nobody. If you want to be somebody you came to the wrong place. We are a bunch of nobodies. How many of you are here for the first time? Please do not be dismayed by what you hear. I am not a lecturer. I am not a philosopher. I am not a sermonizer. Is there such a word as a sermonizer? S.H. Whom? Agrees. Robert, I've heard of womanizer. S.B. Are you a womanizer? I'm not a sermonizer. S.A. One up from a womanizer. Laughs. S.F. That's it Arnold keep quiet. S.L. Very good Fred. Robert continues, we're one big happy family here. Some families aren't too happy. Laughter. Though we're one big family, so we're one big we're one. I want to thank most of you for sharing your Christmas and Chanika gifts with me. It's very unusual being in Los Angeles. In the past I never used to take anything that was given to me. But, since I got to Los Angeles things have changed. Laughter. Anyway thanks. I received a phone call this morning from somebody who isn't here now. They asked me to elaborate on the question that Glenn asked last week. Glenn's in the corner. His question was, does a realized person, a sage, a Johnny become angry? And I briefly touched on that. I was most succinct, didn't say too much about it. Somebody wanted me to elaborate on that for some reason. It's an interesting question. Humans get angry. Therefore when you've reached self-realization, do you still have feelings of anger, of rage, or outrage? A question like this is usually asked by a seeker or a disciple. A devotee couldn't care less. When you ask a question like this you're asking from the viewpoint of the Ajani, and there are different answers. It's very paradoxical. It reminds me of the time I was initiated by Paramahansa Yogananda in self-realization when I was 17, prior to going to India to see Ramana Maharshi. And during the initiation, I was on my knees and he put his hand on my head and he said, Robert, do you promise to love me no matter what I do, 
or no matter what you think you see me do. I hesitated. I said to myself, what is he going to do? Is he going to kill somebody and wants me to love him no matter what he does? But then, I also realized that I didn't have all the answers. So I said, yes. It's only by being around two or three months that I realized what he meant. He reacted differently to different people, to different personalities. It was Christmas, and he was living with the monks in Encinitas at that time. Though I recall one monk came over to him and said, Master, they called him Master, may I go visit my family at Christmas time? I'll be gone two weeks. He became very sweet and he said, Of course you can. You should see your family. They miss you. Go and have a good time and come back in two weeks. Then somebody else came and kneeled before him and he said, Master, may I go see my family during Christmas? He became outraged and started screaming at the monk and said, How dare you ask me a question like this? Why do you want to see your family? They don't want to see you. Of course you can't go. Don't ask stupid questions. Go back to your quarters. This was the dilemma, same questions, different answers. I consequently realized that he was able to read into the person. He knew exactly what was going on with each person. He couldn't possibly give the same answer to two different people. He realized the first person had a loving family, and the first person had high self-esteem, so it wouldn't matter where the person goes. Their heart is always on truth, on reality, on God. But, the second person had a low self-esteem and if he left he would be dragged by the powers of Maya back into reality, of materiality that is, the reality of materiality and he probably wouldn't even come back again. That's why he gave that answer. And so it is with the answer to the question that Glenn asked. Sometimes a sage puts on an act, fakes it for the benefit of the devotees or the disciples or the seekers. It's necessary. If you recall the incident with Jesus and the money changers, Jesus supposedly got very angry when he went to the temple and saw all of the merchants selling their wares on the steps of the temple. He overturned the table and said, How dare you do this in my father's house? And chased them all away. It appears he also got angry. But did he? When you speak of a sage, of a Johnny, supposedly they are transcendent. They've transcended. They have no ego, no personality left. So what gets angry? Is the ego that gets angry the mind? If there is no ego mind left, how can you possibly become angry? Therefore a true sage, a Johnny, can never really become angry for he doesn't have the mechanism to become angry again. It's been transcended. It's like the story of the Zen monk who came to the master and said, Master, I'm always getting angry. I can't help it. What should I do? So the master took out his sword and cut off his head and said, Let's see you get angry now. And as the story goes, he became enlightened. His head flew back on and he was realized. There is no one to become angry. Think about yourself. You have emotions, you become angry, you have all kinds of psychological symptoms. Where did they come from? Why are they there? You have to ask yourself, why do I become angry? Why do I have these emotions? Why do I allow my mind to think past my nose? I'm responsible for my own life. That's how you should talk to yourself. If I have all these negative emotions, how can I possibly function in the world? I blame others. I see the faults of others. I'm always judging. I'm always criticizing. Am I right? Even though if I appear to be right, I'm wrong. I'm wrong simply because I do not understand the universe. I usually get angry because things are not going my way. The world is not turning the way I want it to, so I criticize, I judge, for I believe things should be this way instead of that way. 
I believe people should do this instead of that. I believe this person should be this way instead of that way. Why do I believe this? This is the way you should talk to yourself. What is it that's in me that makes me this way? Is it a power? Is it a force? Is it some kind of entity? Am I possessed? Actually, who am I? Who am I with this great temper, with this anger? And as you keep inquiring, who am I? You will begin to focus on the I. Who am I? What is this I? I am always referring to I. I am angry. I am disillusioned. I have a bad temper. Why, if this I weren't here, there would be no one to experience these verities I just mentioned. Though, what is the source of I? The problem really isn't the temper or the anxiety or the depression. The problem is the I. It is the I who has this problem, not me. Subsequently, the secret is to dissolve the I, to annihilate the I. For I reason out that if the I is destroyed, there will be no one left to get this problem. So how do I dissolve the I? Simply by inquiring, where did the I come from? I wake up. I say, I slept. I had a dream. I wake up. I say, I dreamt. I'm awake. I say, now I am awake. I feel depressed. I say, I am depressed. There is always I. Reasoning will tell you that all of your troubles are attached to I. The troubles have no validity by themselves. The disappointments or the disillusionments, the anger, the temper—they have no validity. It is the I that appears to have validity. So where did the I come from? Who gave it birth? Who feels it? Again, I do. It's always I. Who am I? What is the source of the eye? By holding on to the eye and following it to the source, it will dissolve. It will disappear of its own accord. So you inquire. Whenever you have a problem, you must ask yourself: To whom does it come? It makes no difference how many problems you may have. It makes no difference what is disturbing you, how serious your particular problem may loom in your mind. The method is always the same. To whom does it come? Why it comes to me? Me is the same as I. You hold on to the me, or you hold on to the I. You do not concentrate on the I. You concentrate on the source of the I. But you hold on to the I like you're holding on to a rope. You're climbing down to the end of the rope, and every time you say to yourself. Who am I, or what is this I? You're going deeper and deeper within yourself, deeper and deeper into oblivion, into emptiness, into the void. As you repeat, "Who am I?" the space between the thoughts "Who am I?" becomes greater and greater, and you begin to identify with the space between the thoughts of "Who am I?" All of a sudden, you find a profound peace overtaking you, a peace which passeth all understanding. This is not a peace that you've known before. It's different. It's a peace that overtakes you completely, and you lose your body awareness.、It、has nothing to do with the things of the world. It's a blissful peace. You remain in that state. Included in the peace is a feeling of immortality. Without using words, you just know, I was never born, and I can never die. It's as if you just studied a course at the university for five years. You're so sure of these things. You just know that all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. There is nothing wrong anywhere. You feel wonderful. You have become yourself. You have not changed into anybody. You have become your natural self. That is your true self. This feeling never leaves you. It is always with you. Whether you work or you sleep or you do nothing, this profound peace, this love, this feeling of immortality never leaves you. The question arises: Who is born? Who dies? And the answer comes: No one. There is no cause for existence. 
existence is not real. You just know this. Whereas before you were identifying with the material world, the material world was real to you. But now you just know you have just become infinity itself. You become aware of the fact that this universe does not exist. And something tells you further that the universe exists as if in a dream that's all. When you're dreaming, you find yourself in the universe. You're flying in a plane, you're cooking, you're eating, you're killing, you're making love, you're doing all kinds of things. It's all happening in your dream. It seems so real. If anyone comes and tells you you're dreaming, you refuse to believe them because the dream appears very, very real. Then you wake up and you're back to the waking state which is just another dream. In any event, you are aware of all these things instantaneously and no one can ever tell you again that the world is real. You are unable to explain it for there are no words to describe reality. You just know. You also realize that there is nothing in all this dream world that can possibly harm you or cause you unhappiness and you look at the world as an optical illusion. It appears to be here but it's not. You consequently stop reacting to person, place or thing, for if you react you are identifying with the dream world. You don't actually stop reacting. There's something inside of you that no longer allows you to react. You have separated yourself from the relative universe. Question is, why do you want to become like this? Where it sounds to the average person like you become a babbling idiot. You're no longer part of this world. You have to ask yourself therefore, what is this world all about? This world is a world of constant change. Look at my body. I am not the same person I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I've changed completely. And I'm getting older, and the body will die sooner or later. What am I working for? Why do I do all these things I do every day? Why am I so concerned with this life and that life, and this person and that person, and the world situation? I do not understand anything. And that's the beginning of divine ignorance. You realize that you do not know what anything is. As an example you look at a tree. You do not know what a tree is. You were born into a situation where a tree was evident for you. It's just there. And people call a tree. They could have called it dog or cat but they call it a tree. Where did it come from? What came first, the seed or the tree? It's a mystery. You don't know. You look at a spider, a dog, a cat. What are they doing here? Where do they come from? What is their purpose? You have no idea what anything is and you have no idea what you are. Therefore you no longer condemn, you no longer hate, you no longer judge, you no longer find fault, you no longer try to change anybody. You leave the world alone. You leave people alone. You leave everything alone. You keep working on yourself. What are you doing with your life? How did you go through your life today? What kind of thoughts went through your mind? What kind of feelings, emotions did you have? You have to begin somewhere. Instead of identifying with your emotions, your problems begin gradually to change by asking yourself the question, Who am I? Who has these problems? It makes no difference how long it takes. Time and space do not exist. They appear to exist. We have learned that whatever you say, whatever, you do to someone else, however, you act, returns to you. Why? Because there's only one I. There is one self. There are not two or three selves. There is only one self. Therefore what I give to you, what I take from you, what I do to you, I am doing to myself. If I hate you I hate myself. The trouble is we do not see the results immediately so we think we're getting away with something. You cannot get away with anything. 
everything always comes back to you. As an example, say you're a pickpocket and you pick a person's pocket and you find a wallet with $50,000 and you say, great, look what I got, you justify it. You say that person is rich, they don't need it. I do, you move to Canada and you buy a house, you get a job. Ten years pass. This is the falsity of time and space. There appears to be time, but there's not. It's really happening instantaneously, but time appears to be real. Though ten years passed, you have a new home, new job. One day you come home. You find your house on fire. All of your personal belongings that you loved so much have all burnt up. When you take an inventory, you see that there was $50,000 worth of damage. It came back to you, but in a different way. When we understand these things we stop playing games and we get down to spiritual work. We forget about all these human traits and we begin to realize, my true nature is consciousness. I am absolute reality. I am pure awareness, ultimate oneness. This is my real nature. And even if I do not feel it right now, I am going to work on myself continuously even if it takes me 10 million lifetimes. I will work on myself diligently and do what has to be done until I become free. The rest is up to you. Now let's chant together Sri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai Ram. After the chanting Robert continues. After that talk I will ask you the question, does a sage get angry? What do you say? Different students answer. SB, it appears that way. More students guess. Robert, you're on the right track. It depends on who is doing the seeing. It depends on what you see, where you are coming from. It has nothing to do with the sage. It has to do with where you're coming from. It's like the old Buddhist question. If you see a flag blowing in the breeze, is the breeze moving the flag, or is the flag moving the breeze? What's the answer? S.E. It's your mind moving. That's it exactly. So it is with everything else. If you see a sage becoming angry it is your mind inventing all this. The whole universe is a projection of your mind, so is everything that you see. See, how about a bus is coming down the street, I'm just quoting what I've heard you stand in front of that bus. Robert, where did you hear it from? I heard it someplace I don't know. I'm sure it's classic, I'm sure everyone has heard it. Is the bus real? You know what is going to happen if you stand in front of a bus or a car. Robert, so what will happen? Well reality will wipe you out. Physically the bus will destroy you. Robert, so you say reality will wipe you out? Well let me ask you. That you are having a dream, and in that dream a bus hits you and kills you, are you wiped out? SC, I'm not talking about the dream. But, say you're having the dream. See, in the dream yes in the dream you'll be wiped out, but you will wake up the next day remembering the dream. So how about when you wake up from this? See, wake up what? From this world? See, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about physical actual reality. That is what I am talking about too. Laughter. If I came into your world, if I came into your dream, Nate. That you were dreaming the bus is about to hit you and I come into your dream and I say, Nathan, it's a dream the bus isn't really going to kill you. Though you will talk to me just like you are doing now, you will say, Robert you're crazy, look there is the bus it's about to hit me I've got to get out of the way before I get killed. And then you wake up. SC, however, you know what I'm speaking about, I don't want to start. SU, listen who told you to walk in front of the bus? SC, I'm just saying if you are walking across the street and you don't see the bus or you just see it too late and it hits you, that is what I'm saying. Robert, but if you are dreaming the same situation is taking place. 
and you are talking just like you are now. But then you wake up. I see. I'm not talking about a dream. I know what you're saying. There is an actual dream and an actual. S H. Are you sure your body is real, just as you are dreaming? S B. Are you your body? S C. If someone were to hit me. Thud. I felt that. Robber. So will you in the dream? Laughter. If I hit you in the dream, you will also feel it. And you will be talking to me exactly like you are now, but then you will wake up. So the reason for my talk today is allow you wake up and to see that this is a dream. See, okay, I'll go along with that. I'm not denying that. So why the question? S H. The question is a denial. S C. What? The question is a denial. S K. He's waking up. That's why the question arose. C. No, I'm not waking up. Not yet. Students laugh. Look, I feel like I'm making a fool out of myself. S. F. No, you're not. Not to me. We'll pursue it further then. S. F. It's very simple. You have the same feeling as what you call being awake and what you call being a dream. You are making a distinction between them. In the dream, you wake up the next morning. But if a bus hits you, if you wake up, you will be in hospital. If you wake up, Saf, no, you will wake up. You haven't woken up yet, but you will wake up. S U. So what happens to the sage if he gets hit by a bus? Laughter. S H. The body gets crushed. Nothing happens to the sage. Robert. What happens is what you believe happens. Whatever you see, that's what happens. To the sage, it's nothing, but you see something. Therefore, whatever you see, that is what you get. S H. But the body will get crushed. But the sage is not the body, obviously. Well, in reality, there is no body to get crushed. S H. Well, there will be that appearance that gets crushed. There appears to be a body to the ajani. S H. To the ajani, there is no appearance. There is no appearance at all. S H. Then he's dissolved the world. Though it depends where we are coming from, what we see. This is why when some of these sages have been dying from some of these horrible diseases, and all their disciples are screaming and crying, "Look at you! You are wasting away!" And they just laugh. There's no one to waste away. There is nobody's there. S L. Could they not have more compassion for their students, not to just waste away that way, not wanting to disturb them? Robert, they're not interested. You mean to say that sages have no compassion for their students? Their hearts would be breaking seeing them being ill. Robert, the sages realize that is how they learn by shock. S K. To some that might be more compassionate to die that way. Robert, see the realization again is there are no mistakes. It appears a mistake to you, but in reality there are no mistakes. There's no thing wrong. S L, then it's not a mistake for the pick pocket who has stolen the dollar fifty thousand. Robert, if you look at it in relative terms, it's karma for both of them. S L, oh right, of course. There is a murderer and a murdery. They're both related. S L, yes. Do they both have to go through that experience? S L. So the person who is stolen from is just as much a part of the act, exactly. But when you wake up, you realize that there is nobody acting. There is nothing going on. It's all an appearance, like you're watching a movie. The movie has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then you go home. S L. Then you go home. Laughs. So your life has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then you go home. But if you awaken before the end, you will be awake while in the body, so to speak. S B, and you are always at home. Robert, you are always home. Tape break as Robert continues. Robert, the psychiatrist can't save you. 
All the psychiatrist can do is make you normal. Laughter. Like everybody else. This is why no psychiatrist or psychologist has ever really helped anybody. They seem to help them for a while, but they've got worse problems than they've had before. The problems never stop. Why? Who can tell me? SB, as long as there is an ego, there is a problem. Robert, true, you are dealing from the viewpoint of the problem. And you cannot solve a problem that way at all. You have to deal from the viewpoint that you are consciousness. And follow the I and realize that I am that I am and all problems will dissolve. SF, you can't solve the problem because you think the problem is real. Robert, of course, so never try to solve a problem with a problem. By with a problem I mean you're trying to use your mind to solve the problem and your mind is the problem all along. When the mind becomes quiet, quiescent, still, peaceful, calm, there is no problem. It's only when the mind is active that the problems appear to come and go. Well, what do you think? SF, I'm thinking what I said to myself before. Perhaps there are different judgments to the two different dreams, dream number one equals dream and dream number two equals awake, and the same happens to each of them, and the first one there is buses coming, he knows it's a real bus, absolutely sure about it. The same feeling that this dream here. The same thing happening, but there is perhaps different bodies to it. Robert, this dream appears a little longer. S. H. It's repetitive. It seems to repeat itself. S. B. If Nate gets hit by the bus he'll say. Robert, you like to talk about buses, huh? Laughter. If Nate gets hit by the bus he'll say, I'm in pain I got hit by the bus. But who is it that is aware of the pain? Consciousness is aware of the pain. Consciousness is not the body then. Robert, well if Nathan gets hit by a bus he has no time to think about all these things. He's screaming in pain. Though it appears to be very very real. That's why you have to become realized before you get hit by a bus. Students laugh. SB, but there is something that's aware of the incredible pain. The body is in incredible pain, but there is a consciousness that is aware of that. So am I the body who is in incredible pain, or am I the consciousness who is aware of that pain? Robert, consciousness is never aware of pain. Consciousness is aware of itself as absolute reality, as Satchitananda. Pain is aware of its own pain because the pain is the ego. SB, so the pain is the body-mind then? Of course. SB, so consciousness doesn't even feel it? What does consciousness have to do with the world? SB, but it's aware of the body-mind condition. No, it's not. It couldn't be. Otherwise it would think like we do. Consciousness is free of everything. SB, so it's always transcendental? Always. SB, and the whole body-mind phenomenon is only mind-body phenomenon. The body-mind phenomenon doesn't exist at all it appears to exist. And you give it reality because you identify with it. Change your identification and it will disappear. SN. It's not that consciousness is transcendental it's all there is. Robert, that's all there is right. SU, why therefore would the sage avoid a bus? Robert, a sage acts spontaneously. SU, true but why avoid the bus? Sage doesn't avoid or does avoid, doesn't make any difference it just happens. Sage doesn't think about it. If he steps out of the way he steps out of the way. If he gets flattened he gets flat tend. Makes no difference. Laughter. SU, does it matter to get hit by the bus? It doesn't matter to the sage. SU, it doesn't matter ultimately, but what about in the moment? In the moment it doesn't matter. SU, what? 
If you are a sage there is no moment in which to be different from what you really are. S. You a real sage and no bus. To the sage nothing is happening. S. You a sage might not find themselves in a position of danger or they might have to avoid that danger. A sage doesn't think like that. To a sage nothing is happening. S. You there is no danger. Only in your mind you see danger. But a sage has no mind. S. You a sage doesn't walk on the road. Why not? Could be yes or no. Makes no difference. To your thinking a sage has certain thoughts, but a sage does not think at all. Whatever happens is fine. If it rains it rains, if it pours it pours, if it snows it snows. As you, I don't know about this, but why does a sage be the kind of person who just thought the right amount, not too much, not too little? Laughter. Robert, because you are creating the sage in your own image. As you, a sage has no room for thought. A sage appears to do everything a human being does. But, to the sage they're doing nothing, nothing is being done. It appears as if the sage is acting, but there is no action taking place. SD, so appears is a key word. Robert, appears can be a key word yes. SK, or body identification can be a key word. Robert, or body identification yes. SC, Robert, if the sage knows that the bus will destroy people and he sees it coming, he knows that the bus probably won't get out of the way, he will still deliberately walk. Robert, no. A sage doesn't know anything you said. No, I said that he knows a bus destroys a person, he can't be that unaware. Robert, a sage is completely empty. Wow, that's, that's different. Robert, well, let's look at this this way. Let's change the name of the sage to God. Call a sage God. Does God get killed by a bus? I see, you are twisting my words around, I'm sorry. I'm serious. No, let's intermingle and change the terms, sage and God, they are both synonymous. Can God get killed? Can God go in front of the bus? Though a sage has become a God. Therefore to a human being the bus appears to have flattened the sage. And the sage has become a pancake, but to the sage none of this is happening. I see, yes if you saw a bus coming would you with your instinct move you out of the way of the bus? Where you're coming from? I've got nothing to do with that. I would just do what has to be done. I see, that's what I am saying your instinct if you started walking. You see an abyss, you wouldn't walk into the abyss. Well of course not, but it isn't instinct, it's just common sense. As see, that's what I'm saying. That's what I said originally that the bus was coming, I wasn't speaking about a sage at the time I was speaking about anyone. Oh well you're calling a sage anyone, we were referring to sages. As see, Trying to say it's just common sense or instinct not to walk in front of a bus. Well a human being of course, a human being has a choice to do whatever they like. SC, a sage is a human being in that sense. To you. SC, physically he's a human being. That's how you see it. I'll go back again to the sky is blue. When the sky is blue you say it looks beautiful. But in reality there is no sky and there is no blue. It's an optical illusion. But when you look from here you say, here is a beautiful blue sky. Or when you are in the desert and you want a drink of water you see a mirage. You see an oasis. It doesn't exist but you think it's real. In the same way that's how the sage sees the world as an optical illusion. But, he knows it's an optical illusion, you don't. SG, it's sort of like being in Disneyland. Like this is one event we are in right now and if you know it's Disney, and you should enjoy it and you get hit by a bus, 
that's just another ride. Laughter. But you don't get too concerned if it happens, it happens. It's just another traction. Robert, well you can say that if you like. But, to the sage there is no coming and no going and nothing is ever happening. SC, I'm pursuing it. If someone told the sage it could destroy his physical body, and he saw this bus coming would he still persist? Robert, why would he persist? He wouldn't then because someone has told him that the bus could destroy his physical body. Robert, well why would he want to kill his physical body? You said he's an illusion, I said someone told him that the bus was an illusion, but if I told him that the bus could actually destroy him then he wouldn't, from what the knowledge he has he wouldn't walk in front of the bus. You're saying he would. Robert, no I'm not saying he would. I'm saying it would make no difference. It doesn't make any difference. SC, even if he knew what would happen, still would make no difference. It would make no difference. SK, maybe explaining the meaning of sage would be helpful at this time. Find what sage means both of you can have one understanding and get clarity by it. Robert, that's the answer. Sage is silence. Do you see what a sage is now? Space emptiness, no thing. If you define what a sage is, it's not that. SL, you said on Thursday that there was no cause and effect, and we understand through the looking glass so to speak that we're still very much aware of pictures and in question of human health which does concern us. Whether we think it's real or what our understanding of it is, well it's our value. Well most of the people have a value that it's better to be healthy than to be sick. And watching people that we know become ill and die. I suppose we try to find out why this happens to people who appear good and strong. And in my own desire to find out what happened to people who are close to me. It seemed to appear to me that down deep inside from real consciousness they had either a mindset of rage or hopelessness or feeling that life was not worthwhile. Is this cause and effect? Is there any reason to think about that? Robert, you are speaking in relative terms and that is part of the relative world. So if you are identifying with the relative world you have got to do everything you have to do to take care of your body, your health and everything else. But, that is in the relative world. SL, but is that not wise for us then Robert? Of course. As long as think you are the body and the mind you have to do everything you can to take care of yourself. Do you eat right, you exercise, you take care of yourself. But once you understand who you are everything changes. SL, but is it not so that people could one even say make themselves sick? Well of course. In the relative world you can do anything. You can make yourself sick. You can make yourself well, you can kill yourself, you can make yourself the healthiest person on earth. Whatever you like to do you do. SL, you don't need the world's greatest health insurance to realize that. It's all part of the game. It's all cause and effect. But, you have nothing to do with that. Your real self is beyond that. Your real self is beyond time and space. SL. But, even the understanding of that will affect us on the, what do we call that? The relative world. SL, the relative plane. Well first understand that and then ask me if it's so. SL, I'm sorry I lost you. That you are not real. SL, I believe that. That's not good enough. SL, is there another step? When you understand your true reality, there will be no question like that. The question is only for the Ajani or the person who does not understand. SL, there are two words that I don't understand here, they are Jani and Ajani. There are two Janis. Laughter. No. Ajani is the opposite of Jani. Jani means wisdom, infinite wisdom. The Ajani is ignorance. SL. I see now. 
General talk between students. Robert, let's listen to some more music. Music played. Feel free to continue asking questions. Whatever is on your mind. SX, Robert, can we have someone read a poetry I just saw in today's newspaper? Just a short poetry. Robert, of course, sir. Mary can read it. Would you like to read it, Mary? SX, thank you. Today's newspaper. SX, yes, today's newspaper. What could we possibly find in today's newspaper? Mary, this is called "Petition for a Nuclear Freeze" by Mary Tyler Mountain. In the brief interface of the moments, light dangling time like the poise of the dancer's heel before the final pirouette across the galaxies, we search the impervious planets of familiar signal. We probe the stars with silver shafts for some new land bridge, but stars are veiled and silent. Unseen watchers who perceive the devil's dance of nations. The great lethal video game may know it comes tomorrow. That last astounding flash in the dust. We will not have time to go with the path of Athahila Pula, Emperor of the Inca. He shall leave no students like his. To mark our fleeting presence. Only the feathers of our fiery selves summons to ashes blown on impeccable winds. From the light on the tent wall, American Indian Study Center. Robert, thank you. We have enough trouble with sat shit and end, and now we have to know how to hoop a hula. Students laugh aloud. That was nice, Frederick. S X. Bob, the reason I brought the poetry, I was reading a book, an astronomy book about the high temperatures of the stars. Something we can't even imagine to measure, and such amount of power really shake me thinking about the powers of the universe, whom we really are. Robert, yes, and that potential to understand anything around us. It sounds like we didn't really have any chance to do that one. Robert, of course, when you understand that the whole universe is an emanation of your own mind, then you will realize that you are the power. There is no power outside of you. You are that, and your whole perspective changes. This is why it's so important to find our own reality, because we are always giving something outside of ourselves credit. As being a mighty power, a mighty force, something having control over ourselves. But this is not true. The self is consciousness, and you are that, and there is no other power besides you. Mary, can I read something? Robert, of course. This is just something I just want you to read first. This is called illusion. God and I in space alone, and nobody else in view. And where are the people, O Lord? I said the earth below, and the sky overhead, and the dead whom I once knew. That was a dream. God smiled and said, a dream that seemed to be true. There were no people living or dead. There was no earth or sky overhead. There was only myself and you. Why do I feel no fear? I ask, meeting you here in this way. For I have sinned. I know full well. And there is heaven, and there is hell. And is this the judgment day? Nay, those were dreams. The great God said, dreams that have ceased to be. There are no such things as fear or sin. There is no you. You have never been. There is nothing at all but you. Loud appreciation from students. Mary, I was just giving it to Robert to see if he would like to have it. It's called Illusion by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Isn't that beautiful? I had it sent to me. Mary, I know I just love it. S H sounds just like Robert. Oh, I know it does. And can I read one other thing? Robert, sure. Now these ahead are self-themed. These are beautiful too. This is called the rules for being human. Robert, did you make enough for everybody? Yes, I made twenty-five copies of those. I didn't make the other ones because I didn't know whether Robert wanted that too. But I made twenty-five copies. The first is, you will receive a body. You may like it or hate it, but it will be yours the entire period this time around. Number two, you will learn lessons. 
you are enrolled in a full-time and formal school called life. Each day in this school you will have an opportunity to learn lessons. You may like the lessons or think them irrelevant and stupid. 3. There are no mistakes only lessons. Growth is a process of trial and error of experimentation. Failed experiments are as much as part of the process as the experiments that ultimately works. And 4. A lesson is repeated until learned. A lesson will be presented to you in various forms until you have learned it. And when you have learned it, you can then go on to the next lesson. And 5. Learning lessons does not end. There is no part of life that does not contain its lessons. If you are alive there are lessons to be learned. And 6. There is no better than here. When you there has become a here, you will simply attain another, there that again will look better than here. And 7. Others are merely mirrors of you. You cannot love or hate something about another person unless it reflects to you something you love or hate about yourself. 8. What you make of your life is up to you. You have all the tools and resources you need. What you do with them is up to you. The choice is yours. 9. Your answers lie inside you. The answers to life's questions lie inside you. All you need to do is look, listen, and trust. And number 10. You will forget all this. Appreciation from students. Robert, that's good. SB, so has the Johnny learned all the lessons, and he has no lessons? SF, no there never was any lessons. Robert, that's it what he just said. SF, Robert has these directed to the ego? Robert, to the ego. Yes, they're for the ego. They are for the ego then. Robert, if you have no ego what do you need this for? People like to play with the ego. We like to play hide and seek. We hide the ego and then we find it. And we go on like this again and again, until the ego disappears. So what have you to say? Comments questions? Pause. Is there anything else you would like to say? Or a question comment, whatever you like. SC, I'll say a comment, I've got two comments. One. I noticed that some of us have something to say, and the majority of the people apparently here, which is okay, don't say anything. The other thing after this talking about the bus incident it seems that the Johnny is in a different world than anyone else. And that it's like a woman, you are either pregnant or you're not, you are there, you're not and there is nothing that anyone, you or the ego can do. There is nothing you can do if it happens which makes me feel a little sad I guess because I was under the illusion that maybe someday things will be different. Robert, well let me say this. Anyone who has achieved any kind of spiritual knowledge whether they were born with it or just came upon them has worked for it in a previous life. Therefore don't feel there is no hope. Keep working on yourself do not look for results. Just like you have to go to the bathroom every day. You have to eat every day. Do spiritual practice every day and don't think about it. You will be surprised at what happens. SR, Robert, isn't what Nate is saying just another name for humility anyway. Robert, you can say that too of course. And that's the best quality we can have. Robert, yes. But, do not think that it's impossible to obtain freedom and liberation because it is not. I think you are under the illusion that it is impossible to obtain freedom and liberation. It's difficult for you. You can never tell. Do not think about it. Do the practice and see what happens. Everybody is the same. There is no difference. Sx student who brought poem from the newspaper questions what people can do to stop these negative situations happening in the world not very clear on tape tape break robert continues robert because when you become self-realized you become omnipresent 
Yourself is the self of the universe. There are not two selves or three selves. There's one self and when you realize your true self, you realize the whole universe is your true self. Your true self is harmony and bliss. Your true self is absolute reality. When you can see that in yourself, you will see that in everyone else and you will see a different world. One of love and peace. Though find yourself and your feelings will change accordingly. Do you follow that? S. Yeah. You are responsible for what you see. If you're seeing something you don't like the way to change it is not by changing the condition. As an example, let's say we stop the war in Iraq and there is a peaceful settlement. Three years from now there will be another conflict somewhere else. It will have the same condition. And if we stop that a couple of years later it will be something else. It never stops. You cannot change a condition, change yourself and the condition will change. SL. Is it good to love the condition? Someone said hate of Hitler is hate. Robert, I understand what you're saying. In other words, if we can really love Hitler easily, there's understanding. Robert, if you can't find yourself and understand the truth about yourself then you have to love and hate. That's natural. You can't tell a person to stop hating Hitler and to love Hitler. They can't do it, it's impossible. Don't try. SL, but what if a person actually can love? No you can't. You're just putting it on. The only thing you can do is to change yourself. SL, it is going to be difficult without that. Well tell me that when you change yourself. When you lift yourself higher you see a whole new universe. Everything becomes brand new and everything is different. Though you have to work on yourself and accordingly make the changes within yourself. It's like the question Pedro asked. Do not try to love or hate anyone. Work on yourself. Prince in the world and then see what you feel. SD, so you're saying that by working on myself my perspective will change. Robert, yes. It's a matter of perspective. Robert. Yes. SX. When you say the world, you also mean the universe and everything, the stars and... Robert. Yes, because everything is a projection of your mind. So by changing your mind, you are changing the universe. I know it sounds strange, but it's true. SL. Then with our mind, we could actually disarm it. Robert laughs. We don't look at it that way. You work on yourself and Hitler becomes a part of yourself. And you see a whole new perspective. What you cannot see now. Now you have to change people. SL, this is going to sound wildly ego denying. The reason I feel I can really love Hitler really is because I know in my earlier condition I felt such rage I actually thought of killing my mother. I mean I didn't actually do it or anything, but there were times when she would be dead. Robert, why? Well I understand my condition then because I was fearful that she would hurt me. But, now I love her I adore her I wish I could see her again. I completely understand her condition was what made her act that way. Though I believe my feelings of fear and rage must be the same kind of feelings that Hitler had I've come through that, I would wish the same for you. Robert, but he is dead. Well I mean for that kind of person. Robert, that's very commendable but if that person raped you or hurt you, you wouldn't think the same thing would you? SL my mother hurt me and I did that. Now you do. SL. Yes. But, before you didn't. SL. But now I have the same perspective of the understanding so I can say that for everything. Is your mother dead? SL. Yes. That's why you love her. But if she were alive, would you love her if she was alive? If she were alive, you probably wouldn't love her. It's easier to love somebody when they're dead. 
SL. Yeah. Laughs. But forget about all that. To yourself in reality. Go deep within yourself and expand your consciousness and become free. SL, is this not like on the card you gave us about compassion? Is that not like working on yourself to realize that? Working on yourself is commendable. But, that's the hard way to try to change your emotions. Rather see who has the emotions. Find out who has them and get rid of the eye that has the emotions and then you will be free. Pause. Robert, okay so let's practice. We call this meditation and we are going to do something with ourselves to see what happens. Make yourself comfortable. You can close your eyes to remove obstructions. Focus your attention on your breath. Become the witness to your breath. When your mind starts thinking gently go back to your breath and focus all of your energy on your breath, on your respiration. You are witnessing your breath. Ask yourself the question, who is the witness? Who is witnessing the breath? The answer comes, I am. With your respiration when you inhale say, I to yourself when you exhale say, am. I am. If your mind wanders gently bring it back. I am is the first name of God, it is you. I am that I am, it is consciousness, it is yourself. By repeating this with your respiration you become it. Gently go back to I am. Gradually the space between I and M will widen. Any further comments, questions, criticisms, answers? At this point, the tape ends. Transcript 36. It's a mystery. 10th January, 1991. Robert, what's the name of our group? Who knows? What is the answer to it? SL, the nobodies. Robert, if somebody asked what group do you attend, what do you say? SN, the John Amarga Society. Robert, that's right. That is what we call ourselves, and if they ask you what does it teach? Nothing. It's a hard job answering an ordinary person because what do we teach? Nothing. You know there are two different schools of Advaita Vedantists. And I think I'll talk about that today. One school teaches that consciousness becomes modified as the world. This has not been my experience. SN, can you explain that? Robert, yes. Laughs. People ask me also, I'll get back to you. They ask me does all this come to you when you talk? Did it take a few years to get to the place where you are at? Where does all this information come from? Through spirits? How did you acquire this? I had to think about that myself also. But really the best I can do is say that everything happened all at once. There were no periods of time. When I was 14 years old and I got absorbed into reality, everything came then and there and that's it. No thing has ever been added on. Isn't that interesting? There is no new knowledge to learn. Though back to the question. Does consciousness modify itself into the world? That has not been my experience. But, there are Advaita Vedantists that believe that. That you have to have consciousness to have the world. But, it's my experience that there is no world to begin with. We start from there. There never was a world or a universe. There will never be a universe or a world. There is only consciousness. That has been my experience. Consciousness does not modify itself into anything. Of course those people who believe that the world is sort of real can say that they have to be consciousness first and then you have the universe. But, I will insist on saying that the universe is non-existent. It's like an optical illusion. It appears to be real, but there is no substance to it. It has no causation, no ego. This of course means that everything connected with the universe does not exist. God, planets, reincarnation, karma, people, places and things are non-existent. 
and when I use the term consciousness we cannot even understand that. Or if we can explain it, it doesn't exist. How do we know there is something? It seems to me that when we learn to sit in the silence, and the mind becomes quiescent, calm, something happens. Something that is indescribable, ineffable. Something wonderful happens. We become ultimate oneness. We seem to sort of melt into something. The something has no name. But we give it a name. We call it consciousness or God or nirvana or emptiness, pure intelligence, absolute reality, infinite wisdom. We make up these names and yet, if we've never experienced that how can we possibly know what those names mean? Isn't it better if we shut up and say nothing? Yet we can't do that for we live in a world of talkers. People have to talk so it seems and some people really talk. And the more you talk the less you have to say. What's the answer? There is no answer. There never was an answer therefore stop looking for an answer. There is no solution stop looking for a solution. There is nowhere to go stop thinking you have to go someplace. There is nothing to do stop thinking you have to do something. You simply have to be yourself. How do you arrive at the self? Well here is another interesting way of getting to that. And if you get up in the morning if you feel a little depressed or out of sorts, if you do this you will start to laugh at yourself and you will feel better. It will make you happy all day. And here's what you do. As soon as you get up say to yourself, I am not my arms, I am not my legs, I am not my torso, I am not my head, I am not my bones, I am not my blood. I am not my organs of reproduction, I am not my respiration, I am none of these things. For most of these things are functioning without my knowledge. My heart beats, I didn't tell it to beat. I have to go to the bathroom, I didn't give my body permission to go to the bathroom. The body wants to eat it gets hungry. I never told my body to be hungry. It appears as if I have nothing to do with my body at all. You go further. You say to yourself, how about the world? I am not the world. The world didn't exist a few moments ago when I was asleep. Now that I am awake I think about the body, the world, God, work, food, bathroom. All these things happen when I wake up. Well if I am not those things, who am I? Who is the I that is experiencing all this? I don't know. Be honest with yourself. Don't say, oh the I is consciousness. That's the worst thing you can ever do. Is to memorize certain words or phraseologies and use them at your own time. When you ask the question, then who is experiencing the body? Who is experiencing the world? Be honest with yourself and say, I don't know. It's a mystery. Well then to whom is it a mystery too? To me. It therefore seems that if everything is a mystery to me. Me me me. If I got rid of the me there would be no mystery. Now how do I get rid of the me? Who is the me? The me is another word for I. I believe that everything is a mystery. I have nothing to do with my body or the world. So you get back to I. Who is this I? I don't know it's a mystery. There is the mystery again. So I'll ask again, for whom is the mystery for? For me. Who am I? I don't know it's a mystery. For whom is the mystery for? As you keep talking to yourself this way something wonderful is going to happen. Your question will begin to slow down and you will feel yourself becoming happy. You may even start laughing at yourself. And your mind will become quieter and quieter and quieter. You will begin to feel enormous joy. Just by doing that technique without coming to any conclusions. As you keep asking yourself, for whom is the mystery? Pretty soon you will stop saying I for me. But there will be a larger space between the question and the answer. When you say, the mystery is for me I think it's a mystery. There will be a large pause. 
and as you keep reiterating the question, the pause becomes larger and larger. Now the good news is that pause is consciousness. That pause is your reality, because you will find if you keep doing the process that in that pause there are no thoughts. There is a calmness emptiness, and you feel wonderful. I will explain the procedure again because I think it's important. You get up in the morning and you haven't been able to catch yourself between just awakening and sleeping. Where there is pure consciousness. Some of you think it's hard to catch yourself. So instead of doing that you simply look at yourself and you start saying, I am not my arms, I am not my legs, I am not my head, I am not my torso, I am not my bones or my organs or my reproduction organs or my respiration or anything else. I am not the blood, I am not the body. For whom is the body? I don't know. Then am I the world or the universe? When I was asleep a few moments ago, I did not experience the universe or the world or the body. But I do now when I'm awake. What about the rest of the things I experience or think about? God, planets, the sun, other dimensions, the world and all its manifestations, where do they come from? Well obviously I'm thinking of them so they must come from my mind. Yet who thinks? To whom do these thoughts come? They come to me. I'm thinking about my body and I'm thinking about the world. It appears that everything is attached to I. I I I. Somehow I can remove this I, I'll be free. How do I remove the I? I don't know. Who doesn't know? I don't know. What is it I don't know? How to remove the I? Well where did the I come from? It's a mystery. When you ask, where did the I come from? What you mean actually is what is the source of the I? Never, never answer that question. When you begin to attain a peace and inner joy, bliss, and your mind becomes quiet, that is the answer. The answer has no words. Then I go back to I. What is the source of I? I don't know. It's a mystery. For whom is the mystery? For me. I am experiencing this mystery. It is I. I have all these questions. Who is body conscious? I am conscious of praying to God or thinking about my past lives or believing in my body. I am doing this. Then where does the I come from? I don't know it's a mystery. Again you notice I've slowed down then you will do the same thing. Every time you say, it's a mystery, you will keep quiet for a longer span of time. Remember you do not have to come to any conclusion. After you say it about four or five times you should be able to sit in silence for at least five minutes, without any thoughts. This procedure will allow you to sit in the silence without thoughts for about five minutes. And that's quite an accomplishment. For in those five minutes you will experience a joy and a peace and a profound happiness that you never really knew existed. You no longer have to carry on the conversation. You simply leave it alone. You get up and get dressed and do your business. Go to work whatever you do yet what you have done that morning will carry you along for the day. You will notice interesting things happening during the day. You will notice that you are happier during the day than you have been in a long time. That somehow your work is getting done without you thinking about it. People that you have quarreled with, you will feel a compassion and a loving kindness towards them. You will no longer have any enemies if you had any before. You will feel a peace with the whole world. Even with the Iraq situation. Something within you will make you understand. You will not be able to explain it to anyone. That's why when someone asked me before, if I think that there is going to be a war, I didn't answer. You will realize that the answer is not sufficient for most people. But, you will know and you will be hilariously happy content at peace with the world. When you come home from work or toward the evening before you go to sleep you can do something like this. You can say, 
Now I'm going to sleep, but who is it that is going to sleep? Why it's the same I that awoke this morning. Now the eye is going to sleep. See what you're doing you are getting more accustomed to the eye, and less accustomed to the body. Now you are saying, I am going to sleep, and you are not identifying too much with your body when you say, I am going to sleep. You are referring to a separate entity now. As if there were no body. You say, now I am going to sleep. And your body will lie down and start snoring or start dreaming. But, I can assure you that you will sleep more comfortably than you have in years. You will awaken being happy. If you continue this over a period of time. Every time you wake up you are going to say, I slept and I dreamt and now I'm awake. But, I have absolutely nothing to do with the situation. I am not my body. I am not the one who dreamt, and I am not the one who slept. Then who am I? It's a mystery. A great mystery I don't know. Who doesn't know? I don't know. Who is this I? What is the source of the I? Again it's a mystery. And remember the pause. Every time you keep repeating, it's a mystery, the pause becomes greater and greater and greater. And in that pause there are no thoughts. You're beginning to get good at this now. There are no thoughts, there are no feelings, there are no emotions. There is emptiness, joy, bliss. This is what is called Parabrahman. And you will stay like that for a while, then your body will get up and go about its business. But, you remember all the time during the day that the body's business has nothing to do with you. You have absolutely nothing to do with what your body's experiencing. Therefore during the day when someone brings you bad news, I does not react. You just watch, you witness, you observe, but you no longer feel a reaction. When I say you do not react, I don't mean you are putting it on. Don't say to yourself, I'm not supposed to react, I'm not supposed to react, while you feel all torn apart inside. That's the worst thing you can do. Yet, if you have been practicing the procedure, you will really find that no matter what is brought to your attention during the day, there's no reaction, there is only a witness. And you feel good all the time. Though someone can bring you information about a death, you will have compassion, loving kindness, you will feel good. If someone brings you information that you just won the lottery and you are ten million dollars richer, you will not react. You will witness, you will observe, and you will feel good. No matter what happens in front of you there will no longer be a reaction. Just an observation by witnessing. And as you continue the procedure even the witnessing will stop. It will turn into something else. You will just know without words that all this is the self and I am that. So there put that in your pocket and smoke it. SL all this is the self and I am that. Robert, yes. Any questions? Pause. Nothing? SF, Robert, when you say that the world doesn't exist, you are talking about the materiality of the world, right? Robert, I'm talking about any world that you can conceive. SF, do you consider the world to be as a thought form and that is all we perceive? True. SF, and only consciousness exists. Yes. But what is consciousness? SF, which could appear as thought. No. SF, what I mean to say thoughts can appear to be, but they are not only consciousness is. The only consciousness exists, but the trouble we have is we use that word too loosely. What we should do is to say to ourselves, what is consciousness? We've all read in the books that only consciousness exists, but now we want our own personal experience. So instead of voicing that only consciousness exists, we should ask ourselves the question, what is consciousness? And again you tell yourself, it's a mystery. I don't know. You have to be honest. Do you see why it takes so many people to become self-realized? 
because they memorize all these cliches, all these phraseologies. I am absolute reality. I am this, I am that, and they know the word consciousness. You'd be better off if you knew nothing of those things. But the way to handle it is to ask yourself, well, what is consciousness? What am I talking about? And of course you don't know. Of course nobody knows what consciousness is. So you ask yourself or you tell yourself, it's a mystery I don't know. But you continue you say, who doesn't know? I don't know. You're always going back to I. Who is this I that doesn't know? It's a mystery. For whom is the mystery? For me. Who am I? I don't know. Same procedure, same space. So the space is actually consciousness. But you will feel it. You will feel something that is beyond human understanding. But you will feel something. SR. Robert, sometimes it feels like the mind almost throws up false signals or tries to block the seeing of this. Robert, that's called the ego. And so the procedure in doing that would be more or less the same as what you are talking about. Robert, the same procedure for everything. It seems that the more I feel the deep space that I am, the more there is going to be a message that tries to say no, that's something to be afraid of, and you should go back to a solid world, etc., etc. Robert, then ask, for whom is this message? Who is receiving this message? I am. Who am I? It's a mystery space. If you did this often enough, things will happen definitely. But, I'll bet that 90% of us are not practicing. We are just waiting for something to happen. Maybe something will happen, I don't know. It's a mystery. Laughs. You've got to do something with your life while you are waiting. So you might as well do the procedure. SG, isn't it predetermined whether we're going to do something or not? Robert, it's better than pulling weeds. S.H., who is determining what they're going to do? Robert, no one. There is no determiner. There is a terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Students laugh. But, there is no one to determine anything. You don't think of those things. You should always think, where does the I come from who thinks about these things? That's the important question. And when you say to yourself, it's a mystery, there will automatically be a space. And again you will start to feel that space is bliss, as joy, as happiness, as peace, as the self. And you will know. And you will know that you know. SF, don't fight it. Lass. Sometimes George is just walking the street and just gets so high for no reason whatsoever and the only way I can explain it to myself is tell him I'm not on drugs, it just is. Robert, you must be doing something right. Sometimes I just sit in bed, it's just a lot of fun and I put on a deadly serious, pedantic face and a deadly serious one is asking, what is this fun? And the answer comes, enjoyment and I put on a demonstrator's face and I ask, what's enjoyment and again it said, just being myself. Robert, you hear that Jay? He's in bed all day like you. Laughter. SL, what was that? No, Jay has trouble getting out of bed. SL, oh. Laughter. There is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with anything. All is well. SG, there is always that cliche of following your conscience. When I hear that I feel like I'm doing something wrong, like I hear this voice coming and I ask, and where did that voice come from? And it's still from that I, the conscience. There really is no conscience. Follow your conscience. Robert, it's like there is no devil. Right. Robert, conscience is something you make up. SK, the man in the head. Robert, what? The man in the head. Robert, 
Oh yes. SG, the good thoughts and the bad thoughts come from the same place. Robert, from no place. So that's the way it is. SL, Robert, is it all love? Robert, you can say that sure. Did you say that? Yes, I'm kidding. Laughs. Robert, it depends what you mean by love. What kind of love? SG, what does that mean when you use that word God is love? I never quite got to understanding it. Robert, well that's something you learn from the Bible. But, nobody really has an understanding of what it means. God, love, reality, consciousness, absoluteness, they are all synonymous. But, you have to ask yourself, what do these terms mean to me? Who hears these terms? I do. And go right back to I, and you go through this same procedure. SL, to date came up while I was practicing that phrase, it's all love, and I really felt that it was so how far can that be taken? Like a rose, a 57 Chevrolet, and the atom bomb, it's all love. Robert, so you don't really feel that because you still have confusion about the atom bomb and the Chevrolet. SL, I am embarrassed to say so, but it's all right. Is it all right? Everything is all right. SL, everything is all right. So the atom bomb is all right? I'm not asking you to accept that. I'm asking you to find out for yourself. Yes. It's all right. But don't accept it blindly. SL, I don't. Find out for yourself. Don't believe me, why should you? Find out for yourself. SF, so Robert, all what's left to do is just accept your ignorance, living in mystery and practice self-inquiry. Robert, yes. That's it, I mean that is, all the rest is just a waste of time. Robert, you can say that, sure, yes. Laughter. You're right. Think of all the things we did today that was a waste of time. We got angry, we got upset, we didn't get our way and we got mad at someone or when we were thinking of something that made us angry. Or we reacted to somebody. Think of today, just today. All the wasted time. You watch soap operas all day. Think how you wasted your time. SL, it's possible while, if you say a person is wasting his time, it's possible to practice the technique while we're even wasting our time. Wondering who is walking down the street, who is opening the door, who is washing the lettuce. Robert, it's very possible, but it is harder. Especially for beginners, because you are going to think more about the lettuce than you are going to think about self realization. You will get involved in your task. SL, to the contrary, when you first said the body will take care of itself, I felt well away from that, but today the body was really opening the refrigerator and crushing the garlic. Your body was crushing the garlic? SL, ah. Uh, you mean you crush garlic with your body? Laughter. S, a very picturesque idea, Robert. Laughs. I can just see you. SL, like stomping on grapes or just throwing myself against the garlic. Laughs. But that's it though, isn't it? Body is really taking care of itself. Always does. SL, and we can watch. Yes. SL, and watching is fine. If you can do it, that's good. At this point is a tape break. SF, if you are watching a sunset, it just kind of pulls you in without you even thinking about it. What would that be? Robert, that would be getting pulled into the sunset without thinking about it. Laughter. It would be an interesting state. SF, oh, okay. But, it comes out of your mind. SL, what is speaking in tongues? Is there any connection with your condition with that? Robert, how many tongues do you have to speak? Laughter. 
SL. No, I've heard people say, this is what Christians say, that this is a gift from God and a connection with God and all this. Well let them enjoy themselves. Allow them to speak in tongues. Leave them alone. SL, I wondered if it had anything to do with this bliss. No. SL, sort of a verbal bliss. No. Why if you have bliss would you want to speak in tongues? You would want to shut up and keep still. Laughter. That's really funny. You can see a Johnny walking down the street blah 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 blah. Students laugh. Leave the world alone. Let people do what they have to do. There are all kinds of people in the world doing all kinds of things. Let them be. Just love them and let them alone and you do what you have to do. SL, well I'm still up for roller coaster rides and things like that, and if it were sort of a firmer roller coaster ride I'd be interested to know what it was like. Robert, well whatever you feel you have to do you have to do. Student laughs. See this isn't the type of satsang where I give you rules and regulations and I say, you can do this but you cannot do this. You can do that but you are not supposed to do that. You do what you feel you have to do until the time comes when you no longer need to do it. If you practice this procedure you will slow down. In other words the more you practice the more blissful you become. The world cannot give you that bliss. So why would you want to get involved in the world? You become bliss yourself. SL, a lot of things are hangovers from when we were kids, and we feel that exhilaration and if we don't really understand true peace. Robert, well of course. While you are human you will experience all those things. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm speaking as you follow this kind of procedure and as you begin to unfold higher and higher, you will let go of the world more and more. Because you will realize that the world cannot give you real happiness. No matter what you acquire. It's all temporary. SL, so acquisitions are burdens. Though if I wanted to give you a million dollars you wouldn't take it because it's a burden. SL. Well speaking of things. Laughter. That's a thing. SL, I know that's a hypothetical question. SR, things are great so I'll go along with that. Robert, things are great. I enjoy things. SL, yes but. Robert, there is nothing new. I enjoyed things a lot when I was younger and I have a lot of things and now I go through them and realize that it takes a lot of time away from what I really want to do sort of sorting them out dusting them. Robert, so you're acquiring the feeling and that's the way to do it. I'm not saying to give up a thing. Enjoy what you're enjoying. But like you just said as you grow spiritually those things cease to amuse you. They no longer give you enjoyment. But don't put it on. Do not say, I have to put on a blank face, and not enjoy life. Enjoy what you are enjoying. Do what you are doing until the time comes that you no longer have to do it. SR, Robert, you know I had this feeling if I put it in the right terms, like moving across this bridge toward this state and I have a terrible feeling that when I reach the end, I'm going to reach this void. An empty void that's almost like dust. There is nothing there. And I'm afraid that at this moment looking at it, at the way you're describing it, it doesn't seem like a wonderful place to end up because I haven't experienced it. Whereas all of the things in the world as I have experienced it, I know what they're like and I can touch them and discard them and go through them. And I can discard and... Robert, yet things happen to you that you don't like. You go through all kinds of experiences. There must be something else that is permanent and there is. SR, I see that clearer and clearer I really do. And all you got to do is practice the procedure and look what happens and watch. Or come to satsang like you do and watch what happens as the weeks pass. See what happens to you.
things will happen automatically. SR, I guess I'm wanting the reassurance that you understand where a person like me is, which I think a lot of people experience. To that common ground where we see a material world with things and the other is there, but it's sort of like a mystery. And really arriving at it and being sure that there is that solid ground, you can't call it solid ground, but there's this attitude of Robert, and you can't even be sure. Laughter. I just want to be sure that you understand that there are a lot of entities out here who don't have sure footing about what to expect when you push through this. Robert, of course, see this is why for most people to get into things like this the rug sometimes has to pull from under them. They have to have a sort of a negative experience in life and then they get up and ask themselves, what is life really all about? And they get involved in teachings like this. But, most people are having a relatively a happy life in the world which of course is due to karma, think that they are going to continue this happiness. But, I can assure you it will not continue. It has to stop somewhere and you have to start experiencing the opposite. As for every up there is a down, for every forward there is a backward. For every amount of pressure pushed forward, the same amount of pressure is pushed backward, as in the flight of jet planes. That is all duality. And everybody experiences duality now and again. The world is impermanent, and if you stick to the world you will always be disappointed. And let's say you even have joyous times all your life because of karma. The time will come when you're old 1995 years old, and you become invalid and senile and crippled, like President Reagan, then what are you going to do? You will become disillusioned, you will say I was so happy all of my life. Now I can't get out of my bed. People have to bathe me and feed me and take care of me, what happened? You will be completely disillusioned. So why not search for it now and become free? Why not make this your main objective to become free and liberated? Ask yourself, why not? SK, why do things get so slow? Students laugh. Uninterested in the outside world, and they lose their enthusiasm to do spiritual practice. Robert, well that can be apathy. Boom. Robert, it can be apathy because. What if it's coming from a state of meditation which becomes no different than everything else one is doing? Robert, you're apparently on the wrong track then. Maybe you have too many practices. So what you should ask yourself, to whom do these feelings come? Why do I have these feelings? Where did they come from? Inquire within yourself. SK, feelings of? Feelings of apathy. SK, I don't know if it is apathy I'm wondering. Well whatever it is. You don't have to know what they are just ask yourself, to whom do they come and why? And something will happen. SK, I think what I'm also asking is, you give practical advice to someone, and if so related to discipline, is discipline something important? Robert, do I give practical advice? SK, yeah. No, I'm very unpractical. I can't give practical advice. SK, you once gave me very practical advice one time. It appears to be practical. Laughter. The practical advice is always in the end to find out who you are. That's the most practical advice I can give. And sometimes I will talk to you besides that and tell you what you call practical. But, I will always end up by telling you, find out your true nature, discover yourself. SK. In other words if I'm blowing my nose too hard and as a result blood continually pours out of my nose and someone gives practical advice by observation and said, you are blowing your nose too hard. Robert, oh I remember that yes. That's why blood is coming out of your nose and don't do that. 
Though in the same way practical advice for someone who maybe is having some changes or whatever and decides to dissolve whatever discipline they have or what not whether practically speaking, discipline in one's life is important. Robert, for some people, if you think it's important continue with it. I mean just discipline one's life. Robert, in a way, you are right. T, it's very paradoxical. You are right in a way, but for some people, it is not important. Everybody is different. But, it always goes back to self-inquiry. If you ask yourself, who needs discipline? And why? You will realize that your real self never really needed any discipline, because you are already awake. SK, then what, is an experience of this enthusiasm for life by any chance? The experience of this may be enthusiasm for life, but you're going back to your body. SK, yeah. If your body has to have enthusiasm for life it will, and it will do whatever it has to do. But, you will always be aware that you're not that. It has nothing to with you. SK, it brings it right to that point. If one is experiencing equanimity to the extent that nothing appears to be any more important than anything else, you will experience that as the I as consciousness. But, your body will still go and do its work. SK, unless the body has nothing to do then it won't do anything? Yes. SK, and if that continues to happen then, in a material way, then changes occur. As changes occur and one needs to make some money perhaps or something then one is forced into a situation where one has to respond in a different way. Again no there is no different way. If you inquire for whom do these things happen the right thing will take place. Right action will take place in your life. SK. Ah but one should not wait for it. Well it depends what you are supposed to do. You've got nothing to do with it. SK, OK. I wonder if there is a pitfall with that process of sitting back and waiting for something? To occur outside of. You are not supposed to do that no, who told you to do that? S, well. Tape break Robert then continues. Robert, you are doing then inquire, who is the doer? And see if you sit back and wait. And if you are supposed to sit back and wait, you will not even have any questions because you will be so in bliss and so happy and so joyous that you couldn't care what your body does. At this point is a tape break. Robert, good things. Your body will take care of itself. S, when all concern for it is gone. But you have nothing to do with it. You don't even think about without concern. Your mind is telling you all these things. Your mind is hanging on to whatever I say. There is no such thing as without concern. The I will take care of you. The I is your life. It is your substance. It is God. It is consciousness. It is I am. It will always take care of you have no fear. You've got to trust it. Surrender yourself to I and let I take care of everything. It's like carrying your luggage in the train. Would you carry your luggage on your head and have that heavy burden? When you can put it into a compartment and let the train take you to its destiny. While the luggage is in the compartment. So what you're doing now Jay, you're carrying your luggage on your head. SK, in the train while it's moving. In the train. The train is God. So give God your luggage. Give God your burdens. SK, I'm not having burdens right now. And you will get to your. SK, the only burden I get. At this point is a tape break. Robert, if you focus on the eye on the source. Always on the source and not to think too much. The source, the source will take care of you. God. The source will always take care of you if you think of it. You've got to think of God and God will think of you, 
so to speak. SF, Robert, what about hope in the context of? Robert, hope. Yet in the context of the practice of self-inquiry. Robert, hope, hope for what? Laughter. Most of the people who have been practicing self-inquiry is thinking something in the beyond. When you yourself explain about what may happen, and what may happen may be something wonderful. That's breeding hope. Robert, no I was saying what may happen. SF, yes. I didn't say to hope it happens. SF, when people listen to that they may understand. Oh I see what you mean. F, that there is something to hope for. Oh I understand. SF, that's my question. Yes. Well if you've got to think of something think about good things. Think about that something wonderful is going to happen to you sooner or later. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. SF, right. It is better than thinking something bad is going to happen. So think while you are practicing that one day, I will be free. One day, I will be realized like right now and hold on to that. SR, Robert also I was thinking how important that keeping good company, if you want to call it good company. Some of the people I associate with, I have one friend who is in the entertainment field and he has his own show and every time I am around him he presents a whole reality that is something I'm trying to fight against. Shouldn't be fighting it, but it sort of brings me down and it seems so important to stick with people who have the same set of values that are heading toward wanting to find realization. Robert, so why are you around this person? SR, well for one thing he is the most amusing and enjoyable people from a humor point of view that I have found, which is just a little earthly pleasure. Earthly pleasure is of some sort. As long as you believe you're having entertainment and fun with this person, continue. SR, just take it for that. And work on the process. SR, yeah, I understand. It will all work out. That's what I meant before when I said, do not just give things up. Continue where you are at and work on yourself. And then what you have to drop will drop by itself. SK, doesn't the karma make it really impossible to give something up that you can't because you're still karmically going to do? Robert, yes. Robert, yes. Everything will always work itself out. You've nothing to do with it. SG, just playing the part. No you don't even play the part. Part will play you. When you say, play my part. It's like you have got a part to play. S.H. Yeah, like, who are you? Robert. Yeah. Laughs. S.G. I just read something in an ad. It sort of frees me at the same time and it kind of scares me. What it was, if I have nothing to do with being born and I have nothing to do with dying and what makes me think I have anything to do with what is going on in between. Robert, that's good. It brings freedom, but at the same time it's like giving up, giving up me doing anything at all. Robert, well if you are doing it physically it's wrong. But, if it just comes to you and you feel great about it then it's right. SG, well what I feel attracted on an earthly plane, but in my mind is all this criticism and comparing and judging and... So go and inquire within yourself. Ask yourself the questions. To whom does this come? Who feels this? SG, but it seems such compelling. But, ask yourself, why do I do this? Who needs to do this? To whom does it come? You will be surprised at what happens. Excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom. What I'm talking about now. I have to go to the bathroom. I don't ask myself, who has to go to the bathroom? I don't deny myself, I just do it spontaneously. Laughter. I don't even think about it because that is the body taking care of itself, I've got nothing to do with it. Note. Break in tape. 
The appearance of the body does those things of course. From all appearances, I'm just an average guy, but I know I've got nothing to do with that. SR, it's like the mind that says if you stop controlling and all that then something will go wrong, and that's the only thing to do is to eliminate all that and everything will be okay. Robert, yes that's what I meant, we've got to trust God. We've got to surrender all this to God. Who is none other than yourself. SG, is this the process of surrendering? Is what you were saying before that process? Robert, that process is surrendering too, yes. Because you stop thinking you say, it's a mystery, you give it all up. You surrender, you're quiet and still. When your mind becomes quiet and still then you've surrendered to God. SF, the same as it's a mystery is the same thing as I don't know. Robert, yes. Then you open yourself then. Robert, yes. SR, Robert I asked you once before, but does anyone ever understand the mystery? Even no matter what stage you reach or would you say that when you reach a certain state it doesn't matter, that just disappears? Robert, the mystery disappears, everything disappears. SR, so that's the answer to the mystery then of? There's no answer because everything is emptiness consciousness. Everything is pure delight. SR, I'm scared that one can't know it or living it through. Don't. Well to whom does the fear come? To whom does the fear come? Ask yourself. Who is that fear? And it will disappear. Always ask yourself. Because your real self, there is no such word as fear. Fear is for the body and the ego. SG, I can't seem to be able to get beyond that. Robert, so far. Tomorrow is another day. But, I always tell you not to put yourself down. Do not think you are a dunce or there is something wrong with you, or you can't get far. Just take it as it comes and keep up the procedure. It's like becoming a surgeon. You work on dead bodies until you get it right. Students laugh. At this point is a tape break. SR, the unknown. I'm just having to have faith that it's all going to be okay. Robert, you want me to give you a certificate? SR, that's helpful at least to me. It's just believing that it's all going to be good. Find out for yourself, don't believe me. What if I were just a trickster and none of these things were real, I just made it all up. SR, that's good. Find out for yourself. SF, I have one question to myself. I wanted to know what was the greatest fear. And I came to a conclusion that the only way to the greatest fear was totally ceasing to be. Is there a greater fear than that? Robert, nope. I was once driving to Santa Monica and for the time I was driving in the car I didn't care if this body ceased to be at that moment, it didn't bother me at all. At that moment. At this point is a tape damage. Robert. The last three or four years of his life, he was in terrible pain. He had rheumatism and cancer. Though if you saw him then and you do not understand this teaching you would say, who wants to follow this path? If you saw him when he was sick and you do not understand the teaching you would say to yourself, who wants to follow something like that? Who is wasting away? Why should I believe him at all? Because you want somebody to be robust and strong and happy and healthy. That's an appearance and appearances change. That's a hard one to explain. When you see someone in pain you should immediately help. Until you get to the stage where you understand and then you'll help even more. Here is a good example. Today I was taking a walk to the bank and a dog got hit by a car and the dog was lying there in the middle of the road. The dog was not dead but was in pain it was howling. Some people got there and I walked over and I observed and I watched and I felt for the dog. I had a great love, 
a great compassion for the dog. But just like a miracle a car pulled over, and it was a vet, and he felt the dog and he said the dog had a broken rib, and bandaged the dog and took him to the hospital. What's the point of the story? I forgot that the dog is consciousness and all is well. S. Y. So if the vet hadn't come along you would have taken the dog to the hospital? Robert, there were other people there to take care of that. If I had the opportunity I would. S. Y. Do you warn? That's not my business I don't think that way. Just there to help the best I can. Tape break. Tape continues with question from student. S.L. Well could it be that he had collected karmas of others? Robert. Could be possibly. S.L. What is that? I don't think he was ill. He never died. S.L. Robert at another level would the explanation of the cancer be that? That's possible. But I don't see it like that. With these things there is no cancer, there is no death, and there is no suffering. S.L., then there is no Ramana Maharshi. Not as a person. S.K., so everyone in this room helped just as much as you did in helping that dog. Robert, you can say that sure because there is only one. Tape break. Tape returns, but not in same place as it left. Robert. No, that's duality. Somebody has to be healed. There is nobody there to be healed. No one exists to be healed, and he never went anywhere. He was the same with a body or without it. S.L. So then if no one existed to get ill, but he did. For whom? To you. S.K. And not even to you. To someone who told you he was. He may or may not have seen something on the appearance level. All is well. SR, does it all boil down to how real do we want this waking state to be? Robert, well you can't really say that because it has nothing to do with you. Your body and your mind will take care of that for you. Therefore the only salvation is to get rid of the body and the mind. SH, which you never had in the first place. That's right. Sar, I mean where the freedom is, is not in the waking state that I think I'm in. I don't see you as any waking state at all. I don't see you as awake or unawake or sleeping. I just see you as you see me as one consciousness, one unit. There's no difference. SG, is all my perceptions, there is nobody doing anything to me. There is nobody here. Robert, that's right. S.G., whatever is going on is my own little creation. Exactly. S.G., nothing happens. That's true. S.G., outside. Right. Everything is an emanation of your own mind. S.G., that's frightening. No, it's beautiful. S.G., it's beautiful in a sense, but at the same time it scares me. Lass. Who is scared? Ask yourself, who is frightened? SR, for Bob to participate with us he might gain knowledge. This little body sitting around in this room here that you seem to acknowledge and answer questions to, that there is some sort of agreed upon reality to them. Robert, I do. I do not have to acknowledge anything. I just acknowledge that you are reality. That you are ultimate oneness. Pure awareness. I'll acknowledge that. Everything else is your business. S.H. Hallelujah. Laughs. Let's become still for a few moments. Long silence then tape restarts abruptly as Robert continues. Robert. A telephone answering machine. I want to thank you for it. About two weeks ago, I'm getting a large amount of phone calls. So I told myself, self you need a telephone answering machine. Today UPS comes and delivers one for me. Some cheap place down in Chicago. 
held them up and told them I didn't order one. Though they said it's all paid for. Though now I just have to connect it. At this point the tape ends. Transcript 37 Everything can be met with who am I? 20th January, 1991 Robert, to know total happiness is to quiet your mind. When your mind becomes quiet, quiescent, happiness ensues all by itself. There are many ways to do this. One of the best ways that I know is chanting. Chanting has a positive effect upon the nervous system. It also has other subtle qualities that cause the mind to become still and quiet. So let's prepare ourselves by doing a little chanting, shall we? Chanting. I'm not really interested in any of your problems because I know that you are absolute reality. You believe that something is wrong with your life, you're not being treated right, you don't understand too much, or whatever it may be. It's a lie. You are absolute reality, perfect intelligence. You are pure awareness. This is your nature and there is nothing else. You allow your mind to dictate to you whether you're sick or well, healthy or poor, richer or not richer. You allow your mind to tell you all these things. Your mind is a liar. Your mind does not understand because you won't give it power by feeding it more and more problems. When you begin to accept the fact that you are absolute intelligence, your mind frees. It dissipates. Your mind is a tool that causes you problems. Stop your mind. Annihilate your mind. Do not allow your mind to tell you anything. Things appear to happen in the world. You observe certain things and you react. Yet we live in a world of duality. Everything changes. Nothing is ever the same in this world. Therefore how can you believe what the world shows you? What can you believe? You can only believe yourself. You can only know that yourself is absolute truth. I'm speaking of yourself with a capital S. You are yourself. There is not yourself in you. There is only the self. There is only absolute awareness, absolute reality. If you would only accept this and not try to analyze, not try to compare. Just accept that I am absolute reality for yourself. When I use the words I am, I am referring to consciousness. Consciousness is omnipresence. Therefore when I say, I am absolute reality, I include the whole universe. I'm not speaking of myself, Robert. I include you. And if you accept my words there will be a transformation in your consciousness, and your consciousness will melt into absolute consciousness, and you will be free. All I can really do for you is to confess my own reality, and my own reality is also your reality. I'm Satchitananda. I am Parabrahman. I am Ultimate Oneness. I am Divine Love Pure Consciousness. I am that I am emptiness nirvana. There is nothing else. All of your worries, all of your fears, have no foundation. There is only the one and you are that. Why will you not accept it? Think of what you believe is wrong with your life for a moment. Where did this concept come from? Your upbringing? Some scars from past lives? You begin to believe that you are the body, your mind and that causes you to have other problems. And you identify with those problems. But, I say to you that you are absolutely clean. The past is wiped out. There are no samskaras. There are no past lives. There is no sin. You are pure as the driven snow. Have you ever seen a driven snow? Where did that saying come from? I didn't make it up. But, you are pure. There's nothing impure about you. You are divine. You are consciousness. Why will you not believe me? You believe you are somebody else. You believe you are human, you are the body and your name is Mary, or Jane, or John, or Joe. 
Remember your name was given to you at birth. What if your parents never gave you a name? Who would you be? You probably would pick out your own name. But you are not your name. You are not your body. You are not what appears to be. You are more than that. The reason that humanity seems to suffer is because it believes it is human. It believes it is separate. And when you believe you're separate, you begin to believe somebody is trying to do something to you. You have to compete with life or with other people. Though you're trying to do strange things to others, to be above them, to outwit them. But, I say to you, you do not have to do any of these things. You simply have to recognize the truth about yourself and you will be free. You simply have to accept that you are absolute intelligence, absolute awareness. That's you. The past no longer exists for you. It never was. It's a dream. The past can no longer hurt you. The future does not exist. Only now exists. Now exists as consciousness, as absolute reality, and as consciousness self-contained. There is nothing else. It is the nature of the mind to be restless, to want to find new things all the time, to go to new places, to become bored. It is the nature of the mind to move from place to place, to find new friends, new environments. In reality you can stay where you are forever and be totally happy. In reality you do not have to do anything to be totally happy. I'm speaking of mentally. Your body came to this earth to do what it has to do, but it has nothing to do with you. Watch yourself, be aware, but do not react. Unhappiness comes because you react to person, place or thing. When you no longer react to person, place or thing, you're free. We always want change in our lives. As if we make a change, we'll be free. Some of us get married and we get tired of marriage after a few years and we want to change. We think that will make us happy. But, we find it doesn't. There is no thing that can make you happy except the experience of knowing the self. Even at a meeting like this, if you keep coming all the time, the average person becomes bored after a while, and they want to find a new teacher, a new environment. Then they get bored where they go. It never ends. People talk at this meeting of finding a house in Phoenix, or New Orleans, or New Mexico, or in Seattle, and having an ashram, and then seem to live happily ever after. But, if you're not happy now you can never be happy no matter where you go. Wherever you go you've got to take yourself with you. Most people make the mistake of thinking about the future. They say, in the future I'll be happy when I get married, when I get divorced, when I find a new job, when I quit my job and do nothing. But, I say to you, unless you are happy now there will be no happiness in the future. Every ideal condition you're looking for, you have to acquire it now. If you want peace of mind you can't run to another country or to another city to try to find it. Peace of mind exists exactly where you are. Peace of mind is you. But, you think it's something on the outside. There is a person who hates their job and they say, I'm going to move to Seattle. The people are nicer there. I do not seem to get along with anyone at my job. I'm unhappy here in Los Angeles. So you move to Seattle. The environment is new, everything seems to be all right. Within six months Seattle becomes Los Angeles. Same problem, different people. You've got to take yourself with you wherever you go. You can't escape from yourself. Do not believe that others will make you happy, that a new environment will make you happy. It may appear to do so in the beginning. Sure there are people who never stay in one place long. They get bored and go somewhere else. They get bored and go somewhere else. How long can they keep it up? In the last analyzes, you have to confront yourself. No one can bring you happiness. No one can bring you peace except yourself. 
you have to stay where you are, even though the environment or your circumstances may seem unpleasant in the beginning. The wise person remains where they are and begins to work on themselves. They begin to transcend the body-mind. To the extent you begin to transcend the body-mind, to that extent you find happiness and peace. How do you do this? It has been shown to us by great sages. The secret again is to quiet the mind by any means you can. You see your real nature, remember is pure happiness, absolute reality. It is only the mental impressions that make you believe otherwise. Therefore, get rid of the mental impressions. How do you do this? It begins by taking control of the mind. That's the beginning stage of observing your fears, observing all of the thoughts that come to you. Realizing who thinks and watching, becoming the witness to whatever goes on in your mind. I'm not speaking of taking a negative thought and changing it to a positive thought. Negative and positive are both sides of the same coin. It's all part of duality. For every negative there is a positive. And for every positive, there is a negative. For every up there is a down. For every front there is a back. You want to transcend this. And you do this not by playing with your mind, but by becoming still and watching your mind, witnessing your mind, observing your mind, in a gentle relaxed way. It makes no difference how terrible the mental impressions may come to you. It makes no difference how deep your fears are. It makes no difference how justified you feel for being sorry for yourself because things are not the way you'd like them to be. That's the whole secret. Do not allow your mind to tell you anything else. For the mind will always tell you, look at you, you have a right to feel bad. You have a right to fear. Look at the kind of world in which we live man's inhumanity to man, the precarious condition of today's world. And it will tell you about your own life. Something bad may happen to you tomorrow. You may go bankrupt. Your husband or wife may leave you. You may lose your job. All these thoughts come to everyone. You are not alone. But I say to you, there's a way to transcend this and become the self that you are, if only you would do it. You watch your mind, you observe your mind. You look intelligently at what your mind is. You do not listen to it. Remember also, we're not trying to exchange bad thoughts for good thoughts. Your mind will try to please you and once in a while give you what you want. Then you will start to believe in it again and believe it's your friend. But, then all of a sudden the carpet will be pulled from under you and you will feel disillusioned again, discouraged. Do not allow your mind to control you. Realizing that as you observe the mind, as you watch, as you stop reacting to what your mind tells you, your mind becomes weaker and weaker and weaker, and the thoughts come less and less and less. To the extent your mind becomes weaker, the happier you become. That'll be proof to you. Then you can say to yourself, imagine if. Annihilate my mind completely, I will have total happiness. And that's true. You begin to work on yourself. Makes no difference what anyone else is doing. Leave everyone else alone. Do not compare yourself with anyone. Be gentle with yourself. Be at peace with the whole universe. Reconcile yourself with the whole universe, with the mineral kingdom, with the vegetable kingdom, with the animal kingdom, and with the human kingdom. Have no enemies. Allow yourself to love everything. As you begin to work on yourself this way, you will find all the old mental impressions breaking down. Your true nature will begin to shine forth. As you continue on this path watching, observing, the day will come when you can ask yourself, Who am I? It will come by itself. It's nothing you read in a book. It's nothing anyone tells you. It comes by itself. It's a natural consequence of observing your mind and watching your mind. 
If you do this long enough the question will come by itself. One day, as you are observing your mind something will say from deep within yourself, Who am I? Who am I? Am I my body? If I were my body I would always be the same. But, I am not the same body I was ten years ago. When I was a baby I was a different body. When I was a teenager I was a different body. Now I'm an adult. I'm still different. And I'm getting older. Who will I be then? When I'm feeble and cannot walk anymore and my days are limited, who will I be then? You think deeply about these things. It comes by itself. Then something else will happen to you. You will begin to notice every time you refer to yourself as a baby, as a teenager, as an adult, as an old person, you're saying I. And that's a clue. I always seems to be there. I was a baby. I was a teenager. I am an adult. I am going to grow old. I'm going to die one day. I'm always referring to I. When you go to sleep, you say, I am going to sleep. When you dream, you say, one dreamt. When you're awake, you say, I am awake. You begin to wonder to yourself, who is this I? Who am I really? Just by asking those questions phenomenal results will ensue in your life, for there is an answer deep within the recesses of your heart. The answer will come one day as a flash of light and then quietness. At that time you'll realize that you are the universe. You are the self. You are not yourself as a separate entity. You're the omnipresent self. You will feel it without words. You will know that you are the absolute reality, that you are nothing that can be explained. You are pure love happiness. It will happen of its own accord. What I'm giving you is not a teaching. It is not a philosophy. It is a way of life. You cannot force it to happen. People have been trying to force it to happen for years, to become self-realized, to become free, free of bondage. People have been searching for years. What they are doing unfortunately is that they are searching outside of themselves. They are looking to the world for assistance. The world cannot give you assistance because it does not exist. It is a dream. How can a dream help you? It just plays games with you. You achieve a certain profession and you believe you've made it in this life. You're making five hundred million dollars a year. You have a house, you have property, you have land and you think you've made it. All of a sudden you develop cancer and all your money, all your friends, cannot help you. Those are the tricks life plays on you. Though I say to you, do not go after things. Whatever you are supposed to have in this life, whatever you are supposed to do, will happen of its own accord. I know that's a little difficult to understand, but it's the truth. There is a divine plan for everything on this earth, for every leaf, for every bug, for every animal, for every mineral, for every human. Everything is preordained. In plan for you. Therefore you do not have to worry what will happen to your life. Do not waste your time pursuing things of this world, for you will have to leave them one day. Spend your time trying to discover who you are by inquiring, who am I? And when you find out, not only will you find eternal peace and infinite happiness, but you will also have a feeling of immortality. You will know, I was never born and I can never die. You will realize I am. I've always been. There never was a time when I was not. You will try to explain this to your family, to your friends, but you'll not be able to, for there are no words to describe the infinite. Therefore, you will be an example in the world, an example of love, an example of peace, an example of harmony. Everything will take care of itself. Your body will go where it's supposed to go, and it will do the job it came here to do. Yet remember that it has nothing to do with you. Why? Because you're not your body. Leave your body alone. The 
The same power that causes mangoes to grow on mango trees, that cause apples to grow on apple trees, that makes the sun rise and the sun set, that gives just enough warmth to the earth to sustain human life, that power knows how to take care of you. You have nothing to do with it. Your job is to leave yourself alone and ask the question, who am I? We're going to do an experiment this week, and the results of the experiment will be discussed next week. What I would like for you to do is keep asking yourself, who am I? All week long, under all conditions, under all circumstances. In other words, no matter what happens to you, what you go through during the week, instead of looking for answers, instead of looking for solutions to the problem, simply ask yourself, who am I? It sounds strange, but if you do what I say you're going to find something amazing happens to you. We will discuss it next week. Remember as soon as you get up in the morning the first thing you say is, who am I? You do not attempt to analyze it, think about it, or wonder what's going to happen. You simply ask yourself the first thing upon waking up, who am I? As you go about your business you ask yourself, who am I? The phone rings and your employer says, you've just been terminated. Don't bother to come to work today. Instead of responding you say, who am I to yourself? You won the state lottery and you acquire 50 million dollars. Instead of reacting you say, who am I? You trip down the stairs and you cut your leg. Instead of feeling sorry for yourself you simply bandage up your leg, but you ask, who am I? In other words, what I am saying is you are not to think of any condition, no matter whether it's good or bad. You are merely to ask the question, who am I under all circumstances, no matter what happens. It'll tell you what you're doing. You're causing the mind to become confused. Your mind is used to you reacting. Now you're not going to react. You're going to ask the question, who am I? Your mind will not know what to do. It will be in a state of confusion, for it seems you're doing something, taking some sort of action, either crying or becoming hilariously happy, or getting angry, or wanting to curse the world. That's what your mind knows you always do. But, you're going to fool it because you're not going to do that. You're going to ask who am I and keep still. If your mind troubles you again you say, who am I again? No matter what your mind brings up, you will ask the question, who am I? It can bring up anything. It can tell you, you better look about your business fast or something bad is going to happen. Simply say, who am I? I'm not saying to become apathetic and stay in bed all day. I'm saying to go about your business without thinking about it. As I have explained before, your body will know what to do. Your body will do what it is supposed to do. Only you are not supposed to identify with your body for one week. You're supposed to separate yourself from your body by asking, Who am I? If you try this this week you will become the happiest being that you ever imagined. I can guarantee that. Only you have to do that. I know that some of you will drop out, and you will not experiment this way for you will think that your mind overwhelms you, yet this is exactly what you have to do if you want to find eternal peace, infinite joy and total freedom. We will discuss the results next week. Those of you who have been practicing I am for many years, or who am I, and you're saying to yourself, I'll have been doing this, but you haven't done it this way have you? Forget about the past. This is a new day. You are to go back to, who am I? And you are to remember to say this every moment of the day. If you do this you'll have some good reports to tell me next week if you will say, who am I, only for one week. I know some of you will drop out in one day. Them in one hour. This will show you the control that your mind has on you. It will prove to you that you have been under the control of your mind all your life. Catch yourself and say, who am I? S, who am I will avert any idle thought. Robert, yes. 
Who am I will transcend every thought and every feeling that comes to you. S. Patriots missiles and scuds coming in. Who am I will knock them down. S. So it's in the mental activity. The whatever it is, is the cue to ask, who am I? Robert, exactly. But, you have to do it. When you're by yourself and you leave the meeting today, you'll forget about it for a little bit, then you'll remind yourself. But, you have to be strong. You have to say to yourself something like this, I want to be finally free. I want to find total release from attachment to the world, and this is going to do this for me. Though I will continue the experiment. And again, I can guarantee you, you're going to be the happiest individual who ever lived, if you follow it through. S. I made a cassette at home that says, Who am I? Who am I? And I listened to it, not as an automatic noise, but in a questioning mode every time. Will that be alright to use that? Robert, you can't have the cassette with you all day long. But when I can... Robert, say you're going to a grocery and somebody bumps you with their shopping cart and you get angry. Immediately catch yourself and say, Who am I? You can't carry the cassette with you all the time. You can use the cassette when you're going to sleep or getting up. Again the cassette tape can become a crutch. You don't want a crutch. You want to take control. S. It's my own voice, it's not somebody else's. I don't listen like automatic noises. I listen in a questioning. Robert, I know, but still it's something outside of you, even though it's your voice is helping you along. S. Yes. You want to be able to say it spontaneously, whenever you need to. It's better if you don't use the tape. S. Even if I don't use it. In the evening it's alright. Yes. S. Okay. Got it. Robert. Your body will do whatever it has to. You will do whatever you're going to do. If you go to work, you go to work. If you have to take a flight, you'll take a flight. You're simply saying, who am I? But something in you is taking care of your life. Your life will go on. You will do whatever you're supposed to do. Everything will take care of itself. Wait and see. You simply say, who am I, and you will make your reservation. You will go wherever you have to go, but you will say, who am I? It will not interfere with your everyday activities. We are under the impression that if we do not take care of our lives nobody else will. But, I say to you again, the same power that makes the sun shine and gives life so abundantly to the earth knows how to take care of your measly body. It knows how to take care of you. And you don't have to worry about those things. You just say, who am I to whatever comes up and you will see. You will prove it the first day. For the first day you will go about your business and you will do what you always do, but you will be happier because you're not thinking about it. Instead you're saying, who am I s, my wife will think she has a sick husband, because I'm going to be quiet all week. Robert, you don't have to be quiet. You can be spontaneous. You can answer your wife. You can talk to your wife. But, all the while to yourself you are saying, who am I you're not to stop your activities. You are to continue your activities like you always do. You're just replacing your thinking about your activities with who am I. Do you follow? S. Yes, I think so. Robert, the functioning mind will go on. Nothing stops. This is an analogy. Imagine that you have a pail of filthy dirty water that's been standing in one place for years and years and it's filthy. There is a little hole in the roof and every time it rains drops of pure water come into the dirty water. The drops of pure water are who am I? And as time goes by the dirty water dissipates and you have a pail of clean water. Though so it is your mind is becoming clear. 
All the dirt, all the thoughts, all the nonsense is beginning to dissipate. You become quieter and quieter. Every time you say, Who am I? It's like a drop of pure water but has to replace something. It replaces your thinking mind. Try it. S. Does the need for who am I eventually drop away? Robert, not for the experiment. S. No, I meant later. Robert, it will drop away, yes. But, for a weak practice, who am I? When you become totally realized, there is no need for anything. We're doing this to see the way the mind works and to cause the mind to become weak and the thoughts to stop. Everything that comes from the mind can be met with who am I? End. Transcript 38. The Leela. 24th, January, 19, 191. Robert, tape starts abruptly. Because you are all I've got. That's the wrong reason for coming here. This is satsing. There really should be no talk, no lecture. You come here to meditate, to observe yourself, to observe your thoughts in action, to see what is going on within yourself. I am yourself. Therefore when you observe yourself correctly, you see I am. This body is not a lecturer. This body is not a minister. This body is not even a talker. I do so for your sake. But, if the average person comes here for the first time, I would be most boring, because I speak in a monotone, and I reiterate many things over again. You have to understand what satsang really means. It means being in the presence of your own divinity, being in the presence of your own consciousness. Do not look at me as something separate from you. Most public speakers, ministers, philosophers, they plan a speech, they research it all week, they come prepared and when they leave everybody said, what a wonderful talk. But nothing happens. You feel good for the moment. When you go home you revert right back to your old self. If you know the true reason why you're coming here, it will make a tremendous difference in your life. You're coming here to awaken. To awaken from the dream of Maya, the dream of a personal I. You're coming here to find peace happiness. To awaken to your real nature. Therefore your being here is a meditation in itself. The modality I use to help you is silence, not words. There are no weekend seminars. There are no special mantras. There is no initiation. There is nothing. Yet that nothing is everything. You believe you are the doer, and everything you accomplish you think that you did it. That's a lie. You don't even exist. You weren't even born. How can you be the doer? There is no one who does anything. Yet everything gets done. It's a paradox. Everything gets done because you believe you're the doer. When you realize you're not the doer, everything gets done in a better way, for you stop identifying with the object and the subject. You become free of all attachments. As long as you believe that you're responsible for anything that takes place in this world, you have a problem. You will have to go through that experience over and over and over again, until you realize that you have absolutely nothing to do with anything. You are pure consciousness. Your real self is absolute reality. I tell you, you have nothing to do with this world. I know some of you are saying, then why am I here? Well, in reality you are not here. Where are you? Nowhere and everywhere. Some of you say, well I want to experience all the happiness I can while I'm here. Then you come under the law of karma and duality. Which means you go up and down like a yo-yo. When you get what you want you become happy. When your possessions are taken from you, you become disillusioned and you cry. Then you get what you want again you become happy. When change comes along you become angry. This is like a person who goes into the hot sun when the temperature is 100 degrees and gets burned, and then runs under the shade of a tree. 
but after a while when he's cools he forgets the hot sun and goes back into the sun and gets burnt again, then takes refuge under the tree again, forgets about the sun, how hot it is and goes back into the sun, gets burnt again then runs under the tree again. As you can see only a fool would run into the sun and get burned and then back into the shade and then back into the sun. Yet that's exactly what we do with our lives. We believe erroneously that person, place and thing bring us happiness. There is no thing external to you that can ever bring you happiness. Why? Because happiness is your very nature. Your happiness all by yourself. When you go after happiness outside of yourself, you have to know that it's a temporary condition. As many of you have so experienced. You can't wait to see a certain movie. You've been waiting for it to come around and here it is. So you pay your five dollars and you see the movie. And you're happy but then it's over. What now? Now you've got to look for another thrill. You believe you've got to find something to make you happy. Though you search and you scheme and you plan and sure enough you get it. That lasts for a time. Then it must change as all things change. And you become disillusioned again. You haven't learnt your lesson. You are still looking for happiness and joy outside of yourself. Again it is like going back into the sun, getting real burnt and then running into the shade. And then going back into the sun again. You do this again and again and again you never learn. Pretty soon you are old and tired and it's time to leave your body. Though the disillusionment still continues and you feel and say to yourself. Well now I'll find real peace when I leave my body. I'm finished with this rat race. But no, because there is nowhere to go. If you believe that you're the body then, there are many bodies. When you drop one you take up another and you continue the game of hide and seek. It never ends. Until one day you become so disgusted with the world and with life that something within you leads you to the right book or the right teacher or the right something. And you begin to feel that there is something else. Though you become a seeker after truth. You begin to read many books. You discover there is something like Zen Buddhism different forms of Buddhism. There is the Tao, there is mystical Christianity, the Kabbalah Yoga, various forms, Hatha, Raja, Karma Yoga. You get involved in occult subjects, astrology, numerology, whatever. And you think you've discovered something. You go life after life after life being involved in those things. Yet, if you're a true seeker something else will touch you. And you will discover a guru, a teacher who is just right for you at the time. And you will become a disciple. Yet you will still have doubt and apprehensions. You will turn off and on like a water faucet. You will stick to the same philosophy for a while. Zen Buddhism, you will read about all the Zen teachers available and you will go to Tibet to find one, to Japan to stay in a jendo. You will run to the Himalayas. You will read all the Zen books you can find. But you'll keep coming back to that one teacher. And that's what makes you a disciple. Again this goes on incarnation after incarnation. Yet if you're really sincere something will touch you and you will realize, I and my father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the father. You will begin to feel that you are one with your teacher, that the teacher is within and without you. The teacher within you pushes you forward. And the teacher without pushes you inward. You begin to understand that the only thing you have to do is to get rid of the idea that you are the body-mind phenomena. Thus, you become a devotee, which means you become one-pointed, interested in one path. You ultimately become the path and you awaken. Most people of course never even get to the point where they become a seeker. But, we don't look at most people do we? Again many think that a path like this is selfish. For instead of trying to help the world, instead of trying to make this a better world in which to live, we're only interested in our own awakening. 
but the truth is, unless you really awaken you can never make this world a better place in which to live. Why? Due to the fact that you are the universe. Right now just the way you are. Therefore if you are filled with anger, animosity, greed, avarice, and the rest of those things, so is the world. You have created the world. The world is an emanation of your own mind. What you think of yourself you think of the world. If you are filled with fear then world frightens you. If you are filled with greed you believe everyone else is greedy. The world is a reflection of you, that's all it is. When you awaken, you see a new world. You're in heaven. For when you awaken you realize the real self transcends the universe, that the world is like a dream. It exists but as a dream. The self or consciousness is the reality and I am that. I am doesn't mean Robert you know what I'm talking about. I am is consciousness, absolute reality. Therefore when you awaken you can state I am that. You are no longer talking about your individual I. You are speaking of the whole universe. I am that. Now everyone becomes that also. Remember, I am is omnipresence. I am that. This is why a realized person can only see himself or herself. They do not see what other people see. They see love, harmony, peace, joy, happiness. Simply because they have discovered their real nature as happiness, pure awareness, absolute reality. They no longer are the personal I. They have risen. They're no longer going into the sun and getting burnt and then going back into the shade tree. These people are always under this shade tree. No thing external can ever happen to them again, as in birth or death or in between. The universe does not prevail for them. For they are egoless. That's how you bring peace into the world. If you go back in time there have been people trying to make this a peaceful world from time immemorial. No one has ever succeeded. It is the nature of this planet to be what it is. No matter how you try to improve it, it will never happen. Why does it seem sometimes that the planet is improving? Because of time and space. It will improve to a certain degree, and then people will start talking about the golden age, so forth. Yet, it will only go so far. Then it will start to regress again and go back into the dark ages. This is the dream of Maya. When you identify with the body-mind or the world and you believe that you are the doer, you keep coming back again, back again, back again at different phases of the world's evolution. You may come back in the dark ages during the Inquisition be tortured. You may come back during a sort of golden age period where there is more harmony and peace in the world. Yet you're living in a life of duality. Which means you have to experience both. So you go back and forth, back and forth, again like the man going into the sun getting burnt, going into the shade then back into the sun, it never ends. And let me remind you again, there are too many people that I speak to who are suffering and they say, well soon I'll give up my body and I'll find peace. As the story goes when you leave your body you do take a vacation. You take a rest where you review all of your karmic activities. Remember all of these things I'm telling you is a lie. I'm telling you these things because you want to hear it. And as long as you identify with the body, it's true or it appears to be true. You take a rest then you're either pulled back or you go back voluntarily into another body and you continue the game until you get sick and tired. As I mentioned previously when you get sick and tired of the game, you become a seeker of truth and you evolve that way. The question therefore is, what to do? How do you begin? You begin by taking a good look at yourself and reviewing your life in retrospect. Asking yourself, who has gone through all of these experiences? And you will realize I have. You will start to think, 
when I was a little boy or girl I had such and such an experience, when I grew into a teenager I had such and such an experience. But, you're always referring to the first pronoun I. You're saying, I had the experience when I was a little girl or boy and I am having my experiences now in life. Something within yourself will make you think, it's always I. I always return to I. I had this experience. I had that experience. I was born, I went to school, I went to sleep, I got married, I got divorced. Always I. Who is this elusive I, and where does it come from? How does it arise? It didn't exist when I'm sleeping. It's only when I wake up I start thinking of I. At that time I can say, I slept. Where does it go to when I go to sleep? It doesn't appear to be around. You begin to feel that all of your problems concern themselves with the I. So you say to yourself, well if I get rid of this I, everything else will go also. And that's true. You therefore start looking for ways to get rid of the I. You begin to understand the only way to get rid of this I is to question it. Where did you come from I? Who gave you birth? And to follow it to its source. So you ask yourself the question, what is this I? Where did it come from? Who am I? If you are sincere you will follow the I to its source which is the self. The I or the personality will therefore dissolve into the self. This is called awakening. People give names to this, it's called moksha, liberation, self-realization, reality. People attach all kinds of names to it. All you've really done is to become yourself, that's all. There is nothing mysterious about it. You do not have to repeat sacred mantras or go to certain schools of ancient philosophy. Everything you're looking for is within yourself. There are people who always come to me and they ask me, Robert, we should get together with the people who have been with you for a long while and have a special class where you can give us the highest teachings. There are no higher teachings. This is it. Laughter. What else is there? Destroy the I and become free. Though satsang is when you come to a place like this and you're not wondering what I'm going to talk about. You have not come to hear me speak. It's a place where you come to meditate, to awaken, to see me within yourself, for I am yourself. If you can only remember this, you'll stop running all over the place looking for lecturers and listening to speakers. The proper thing to do is to find somebody you have an affinity with, a teaching someone who does not talk too much, and you just sit. And everything will take care of itself. So as I said in the beginning, I wasn't going to talk too much and I did. It always happens and the reason I do is because most of you want to hear me talk. But, the day's going to come when you come in here and I won't say a word. Then we'll see what you do. Any questions? SG, then why you talk? Robert, who knows? Because I feel that most of the people here come to hear what I've got to say. So I try to explain certain things. But, I try to emphasize over and over again, talking is not going to do it. It may inspire you for a while, it may give you a good feeling. But as you already know when you leave here, as soon as you get to your car you revert back to yourself. And you start thinking who you're going to listen to tomorrow. That's called the seeker as I explained before. And that's good to an extent. But it will not awaken you. The only time you will awaken is when you realize, I am myself. I have always been myself, there is only one self, that self is called Satchitananda Parabrahman Absolute Reality, and I am that. When you say, I am that, it will include everyone, the whole universe. That's the time you will awaken. If you do not understand what I've been talking about, ask some questions if you like. S.C. Robert, is reincarnation an illusion? Robert, reincarnation never existed and it never will exist. But, it appears to exist. 
you cannot deny it if you believe you are the body. As long as you believe you are the mind or the body, and as long as you believe in the world, that the world is a reality, then so is reincarnation. That's an interesting question because there are many people who say, I don't believe in reincarnation. I'm not going to accept it. Yet they accept that they are the body. Therefore why should there be only one body? If you are accepting that you are the body, then there can be two bodies, four bodies, twelve bodies, a hundred bodies, a thousand bodies, why only one? And that's what reincarnation is all about. You are causing it yourself by your erroneous belief that you are the body. Therefore you don't deny reincarnation, you ask yourself the question, to whom does it come? And you will realize yourself that it comes to your body, not to you. You have absolutely nothing to do with it. Sell, so since it's not happening to us, it's not to worry. Robert, well, it is easy to say, not to worry. But the first calamity that comes along, do you worry or not? That's how you should see yourself. As long as things are going your way and you're relatively happy, because you've got what you want, what if everything stops for you, will you still be happy? Will you not worry? It's easy to say, don't worry, be happy, but how many of us can do that? We only do it when things are going our way. SN, even if we could not worry and be happy, what good is that? Robert, you are realizing yourself when you are not worrying and being happy. You're into bliss. Into harmony and joy. SL, in the ego state. Robert, no. It has nothing to do with the ego. When you are in the ego state, you cannot possibly be completely happy because your happiness is dependent on things. So what were you saying, Jay? SK, if you're just happy and you're in a blissful state, there has got to be more. It seems like there should be much more than just bliss. Robert, well who asks the question? Remember, you're asking the question from your viewpoint. Right. Robert, but when you experience real bliss you become the universe, the creator, God, love. It's a completely different ball game. You become self-contained happiness. And since you're omnipresent there is no comparison you can make because all of your comparisons have been transcended. It's K. So on a relative level, it's very hard, between the absolute level and relative level, there is such a thin line, but I've been trained in a sense to, that there is much more than just bliss, in other words, if you're just sitting in your own bliss, and you cannot come out of that too. Note, break and tape, then what more is there? Robert, when I speak about bliss I am referring to absolute reality, to consciousness. You become an instrument of love in the world of peace. Your very presence causes harmony and peace to people. Your very presence is a blessing to the whole universe because you are the universe. It has nothing to do with human understanding and human knowledge. It has absolutely nothing to do with human bliss or human happiness. It is beyond comprehension. SK then Ramana was a doer. Robert, on the contrary. Ramana wasn't enlightened. Robert, Ramana Mahar, she didn't do anything himself. Yet things happened. Robert, he denied that he had anything to do with it. Well you can deny anything you want other people experience such things. Robert, so they believed it's because of him. It's their belief that makes it happen. I don't know. Things happen without them thinking that this was going to happen, as far as I know, I don't know actually. Robert, well to be in the presence of a sage, all kinds of things can happen. Just as someone may get up to go to the bathroom, a sage might wink his eye and maybe spontaneously some other something could occur that we an outsider would take as a power, a demonstrable power. Robert, Yes, but a sage does nothing purposely. Right, so in that way, 
a power can be demonstrated spontaneously without a sage being the doer. Robert, well the sage does not have any power to demonstrate. Right. Robert, but I understand what you're saying. It happens like that. So that's how it would occur. Pause. If one really had real strong faith, had real strong faith in all of this then rain or shine, roof or no roof, food or no food they would just be dedicated to realizing the self. Robert, you cannot make it that simple. It has to do with God's grace, which is always available. And you're awakening to that grace. You can't pinpoint it. St. Were you a student of Nisargadatta Maharaj? Robert, I wasn't a student of his but I was with him for a while. Are you also familiar with Jean Klein? Robert, no I don't know her. S.H., you knew Nisargadatta frankly? Robert, I knew Nisargadatta, yes. Did you spend much time with him? Robert, six months. Six months? Robert, whom? Continuously? Robert, yes. Was that before you went to Ramana Maharshi? Robert, no, that was after. After? What kept you there for six months? Robert, I was interested. In what? Robert, in watching his actions. I was there when Balsakar was his interpreter. Moira Patton wasn't his interpreter then? What was your conclusion after watching him in action? Robert, my conclusion is all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. I gather that covers everything. Students laugh. Well you want to end the conversation. More laughter. Sel, when you were talking about not doing anything, even we don't really do anything. I wondered if anybody else was able to look back after talking with you, look back over their lives and see that really we didn't cause anything to happen? Robert, well ask everyone else. It all seems like a miracle looking back that, I don't believe in luck especially, you say in fate or something, but it seems that if one believes in good luck then they have to believe in bad luck. Robert, find out who the I is that wants to believe in anything at all. But, is that true Robert do you know that about all of us that we didn't really do anything in our lives? Robert, I only know myself and you are myself. Therefore you are absolute reality, pure intelligence, emptiness nirvana, ultimate oneness, consciousness parabrahman. St. But you cannot see her personality or my personality can you? Robert, I don't look at personalities. So that's your answer, you cannot see it. If you wish to, can you see it or not? Robert, look at it this way. You take a screen and you put images on the screen. The images keep changing, they have all kinds of personalities, but the screen remains the screen. If you try to grab the images, you grab the screen. Though I feel like the screen, and the world and its images are superimposed upon the screen. I see everything, but they are not real to me. St. But you do see everything. Robert. Yes. So in other words you have access to my life story, let's say if you wanted to you could see my life as a body. Robert. No I can't. You cannot? Robert. No, because there would have to be somebody to see that, and there is nobody left to see anything. Uh huh. SK, spend a few days over at Robert's house, maybe that's it. SF, I hear it causes a lot of conversation and something I think that I talk too much. But, I'm glad that I'm selfish in a particular way. And I want to be even more selfish in doing what I need to do concerning myself about myself more than anything else, until that work gets done. Robert, Concern yourself only with the understanding that you are not the I. Right, that's what I mean. That's what I mean by the selfishness. It's the selfishness I should have. Selfish to know who's selfish. 
Pause. SK, a lot of people with different spiritual backgrounds came to Ramana, and if they had things going on or difficulties in whatever path or practice they were doing, was he able to help them? Robert, he never helped anybody voluntarily. He simply sat in his couch, and everybody was doing whatever they wanted to do. He answered a couple of questions now and again, he kept silent most of the time. SK, and that was it. That was it. When people used to come to him with all kinds of problems, he used to look at his attendant and he would say, they come to me to help them with their problems. To whom should I go with mine? SK, that leaves me a little confused. He was not the doer. SK, all right, so I don't care if he wasn't the doer fine, but this body arise and he'd be. How can he help people with problems? He's not a psychologist. SK, well I know someone who is not a doer, and someone came to them and had some kind of problem in their practice dealing with part of their body and lo and behold the person's body would up and perform some kind of function to the outside eye and that person was helped in their practice. Robert, by his very presence people were helped. All right. S.H. Is it true that he taught through silence? Robert. Yes, very true. He was silent most of time. That was his central teaching? Robert. Yes. And people got all kinds of things out of the silence. Just by sitting in his presence all their troubles vanished. With some people. Not with all people with some people. There were others that came in to see him and they left and they said, He's just an old man I felt nothing. S.G. What is that feeling you feel? Robert. What do you mean? When you seem to be in the presence of someone who is like you, I guess you do get to feel something. What's that? Robert. You're feeling your real self, your own bliss joy happiness. That's beyond words. S.K., what about if the feeling changes from being in the presence of a different teacher? Robert, what's that? The feeling's different in the presence of different teachers, to me in essence. Robert, well that's like confusion. Because you get this feeling then you get that feeling, you get this feeling and that feeling. And that's confusion? Robert, because you never really change. The whole idea is to get the feeling to go deep within yourself. A real sage gives you the feeling that you want to dive deep within yourself deeper than you have ever gone before. And you do and you become free. SG, so this feeling in a way is a kind of demonstration. If you feel that feeling you want to go away, and you want to have more if you eat it dive within yourself and you have it no matter where you are? Robert, you want to hold on to that yes. And you hold on to it by practicing self-inquiry. St, could you please tell me something about Sufu? Is that a genuine practice to worship God or is it just a? Robert, I'm not too familiar with it so I can't explain it too well. All practices that lead to God are good. SF, I won't answer your question about Sufu, but I met Pak Sufi once you know and what I experienced that time is totally beyond words. The only words I know is the biblical words, the peace that passeth understanding. That's a very faint explanation what I experienced when I passed him by. Robert. Boom. What happened after that? Nothing I guess I knew he was supposed to be in that house on that day, but just the same I. Robert, no I mean what happened to your feeling. Did it go away? Oh yeah. Robert, why? Don't ask me. It was just the way it was. It wasn't permanent. Sage, don't all feelings go away? Robert, well he was speaking of an exalted spiritual feeling. Those come and go too. Robert, they come and go but why they go? SK, why do they go? Robert, because we're not doing the right things. 
There is something about our practice that is limiting us. We should therefore dive deeper within ourselves. SK, is it ever a question of non-practice? Robert, what do you mean? I mean we're not doing something right with the practice. Could it be that we're not doing enough practice? Robert, that's possible. My teacher told me if I ever was unhappy just do so much more practice, and he was right. Robert, for some people that's true, for some people it's not. Aha! Uh -huh. Robert, you cannot pinpoint it. Yeah. I understand. Robert, you cannot say it's this or that, everybody's different. But everyone exists. Find out who exists. SK, so the teacher that we're in the presence of is touching something within ourselves and it could be a different aspect and maybe that's why we feel a different feeling. Robert, that's true. It's up to you to dive deeper than you ever dived before and become totally free. ST, there is a saying about the music of the spheres. Are you capable of hearing that ringing? Robert, again, there has to be somebody left to see spheres or hear spheres. All the music of the spheres is of the mind. All phenomena comes from the mind. Get rid of the mind and it'll all stop. Okay, you're saying, you are talking now, that is phenomena too. Robert, boom. How does that all go together with your all-pervasive consciousness and your mind talking? Robert, the body talks. The body acts. The body does what it came here to do. But I have nothing to do with that. Can the body hear the music of the spheres? Robert, no. It cannot? Robert, boom. SK, if it came to my house it can. Robert, you've got a tape. I've got a CD. Laughter. SF, Robert, this comes. Some of these questions may have to do something with so-called Siddhis. What exactly are Siddhis? Is he an enlightened being who gather illusion? Robert, a Siddha is a person who has been working with Kundalini. And the Kundalini has risen and powers are developed. But... A Siddha is not a sage. SK, actually that's a limited understanding of the term Robert. Robert, okay, explain the term. Siddha means perfection and someone who is perfected is considered a Siddha. And I think it's been Muktananda since they called the Siddha Yoga and all that kind of stuff and they related it to Kundalini but in that way someone could be called a Siddha in a particular tradition so to speak or attainment like Siddha Bhakti or a Siddha Gami or something like that, but Siddha means perfected. Robert, so it's semantics. Yeah. Robert, forget about Siddhas, forget about everything, find your true self and become free. SF, but there are some people who are attracted to these powers and... Robert, yes. Clairdience, clear guidance, or whatever you call it, and they equal that with enlightenment or with sagehood. That was the reason of my question. It's a question of semantics, I think, Siddha. Yes, there is also perfection, but there are also so called Siddhas which tend to gather and tend to manipulate a kind of powers in order to impress their disciples. And I don't think they're sages, I don't know if I'm right. Robert, this is true. That is why I told you not to go after the Siddhas. Do not follow the Siddhas. Follow the I and become free. ST, so you are saying the Kundalini is not worthwhile to go after. Robert, in my opinion anything that leads to powers is dangerous because it keeps you earthbound. Bypass them, go beyond them. It is true that as we evolve we do develop Siddhis. But, the Upanishads and other spiritual works tells you to go beyond. Not to get caught. Go beyond everything. The example I use is that the king invites you to his mansion, to his kingdom, to share the kingdom with him. 
but he has two hundred acres of beautiful property. And when you drive to the gates, you see the beautiful flowers, and you become interested in agriculture. You forget about the king. Then a few years later, you remember, and you start driving towards the king again. But now you see beautiful mountains and beautiful shrubbery and beautiful dancing girls, and you get involved with that, forgetting about the king. Each thing you get involved in is a sid, I a power. But if you go straight to the king, you will share the kingdom. That's the difference. S T, you said that your body is acting, and on the other hand, you say you are all pervasive. Aren't you and your body one? I tell you, my body is acting for your sake because that is how you see it. S T, okay. In reality. No one is acting, and no one exists. The body does not exist. S T. If no one is acting and no one exists, why does it all happen? Robert, it doesn't. It appears to. It doesn't happen at all. Robert, no. Though in other words, God didn't create anything. Robert, there is no God to create a thing. S T. Nothing is created by God. No. S T. But yet he makes it all possible. There is no God to make anything possible. S T. No. No. S T. I thought that God is perfect. Nope. As long as you separate yourself from God, God does not exist. S T. I'm only a part, portion of God in a sense. Then remain a portion. But in reality, there is no creation. There's no God. There's no realization. There's no illusion. There's consciousness. S T. What I am trying to get to is why is there this big universe? It's not just because of me. When I would vanish, there is still a whole universe left, right? Robert, that's how you see it. But isn't there a fundamental iness, or we all say God, which is undivided, which is perfect, right? Is that correct, Robert? There is nothing apart from you. St. Well, let's forget me for now. I'm saying that there is. Though if we forget you, we forget everything else too. St. No. Because if you don't exist, nothing else exists. St. But that's only my point of view. When you go to sleep and you sleep, what exists for you? S T. My point of view. But the rest point of views are. We know that there are hierarchies. You know minor creations or. No, we don't. It just appears like that. S T. It just appears, but the appearance is enough for us to be an illusion. Because you believe you are the body. S T. Well, I don't have another choice. I don't have a choice besides, you know, when I wake up, I am in the body. That's how it appears to you. S T. Yeah, I have no choice. Robert. Well, why don't you ask yourself, to whom does it come? S T. Pardon me again. Ask yourself, to whom does the body come? S T. To me. Ask yourself. S T. When I wake up, I'm in the body. When you wake up, the sky is blue. S T. No. But if you go and investigate, there is no sky and there is no blue. It's an illusion. Though everything you are telling me is an illusion, but you think it's real because you identify with it. S T. Do I have a choice? I don't. Do you do? S T. It doesn't seem to me. We'll find out if you do. S T. Well, I've been trying, but there is no choice. When I wake up, I am in this mind, and that's it. Well, that's how it appears to you. You have to ask yourself: To whom does the mind come? Who feels this way? S T. It comes to me. When I wake up, who is me? S T. Me, my individuality, my point of view. Hold on to that point of view to me. I. S T. 
Yeah, let's all I have my point of view. Follow the point of view I. Point of view is I my. Follow that to the source, and your point of view will disappear. St, but you do agree that there is creation. No. St, no. Sg, well, what is consciousness then? Robert, consciousness is a word that's used to describe. Sg, nothing. Beyond phenomena, emptiness. You cannot go beyond that with your finite mind. Finite mind cannot comprehend the infinite, but you can experience it. St, are totally happy right now. Robert doesn't answer, but holds a long silence. Robert, shanty piece, piece. I got Prashad to share with you. Can somebody bring me the bag? At this point, the tape ends. Transcript thirty-nine. Sitting in the silence. Twenty-seventh January, nineteen hundred ninety-one. Robert, most of you have come here to hear me talk, and I say to you that sitting in the silence is more potent than any words you can ever hear. If you came just to hear me talk, you're going to be disappointed, for I am not a public speaker, I am not a lecturer, and I really have nothing to say. But yet, most of you function by listening to people talk. Think back in retrospect. How many teachers have you heard during your life? Literally hundreds. How many books have you read, and where are you? Here. If the talks and the books did you any good, you wouldn't be here at all. You're here because you're still seeking. You're still searching. You're trying to find something external to yourself, and you cannot do that. What you're looking for, you already are. There is nowhere to go, and there's nothing to do. Everything already is. There is no one that can change it for you. When you sit in the silence, you have to deal with your own thoughts. Most people do not like to do this, so they want to hear me talk. When they're finished here, they go home and watch the TV. They hear someone else talk. Then they talk to their families. They go to a movie, and there's nothing but talk, 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 talk. It gets you nowhere. Many of you do not like to sit in the silence, for your mind attacks you. It brings up all sorts of things about the past and worries about the future. So you want to be entertained. You want to hear good words, profound knowledge. There is no profound knowledge. There are no good words. Everything you've been taught is a lie. The only truth that exists is yourself. But who is the self? The self is you, just the way you are. The mistake most people make is they want to change themselves. How can you change yourself? You think you've got problems, or you think you've got a bad mind, or you think something is wrong, and you want to change that. Those things don't exist. There is nothing to change. That's what I mean when I say, "Be yourself, just the way you are." Yourself, just the way you are, is spontaneous, lives in the now, has no time to worry or think. When you are yourself, you are God. You are consciousness. You are absolute reality. You are always yourself. You never were anyone else. You never were anything else. Your nature is divine. You are not what you appear to be. The only thing you have to remove is the appearance or the belief in the appearance, for the appearance is false. Most of you still believe you are the body-mind phenomena. No matter how many times I tell you you are not the body mind, you still keep identifying with the body and mind. That's false. That doesn't exist. But what is this body all about? If you look at your body with an electric microscope, an electronic microscope, you will see trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms. What is an atom? Science tells us that an atom has a proton. Which is the center, and electrons swirling all around the protons. Your body appears to be made of trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms, which means it's always in a state of flux. You are not as solid as you believe. Nothing in the world is solid. Now the amazing thing about all this is you are the microcosm in the macrocosm. 
which means you are a small universe in a large universe. If you look at the universe, it's composed of galaxies and solar systems. In each galaxy there are trillions and trillions of solar systems. What is a solar system? It's a sun with planets revolving around it. Isn't that just like the atom? That's why in scripture it tells you, we live in the body of God, for the whole universe appears to be some pulsating being. It pulsates. It breathes. Can you imagine that? The universe actually breathes just like you breathe. You are a replica of the universe. If you found yourself the size of an atom in your body, you would be in a universe. You would look up and you would see suns, stars, planets, but they're all taking place in your body. Mind-boggling. Though you are not what you appear to be. Therefore when I say you are not the body it is not only spiritual, it's scientific. There are spaces between the atoms just as there are spaces between the atoms that you see up in the sky, the planets. The space between the molecules and the atoms and the electrons is what we call space. That's what we see with our eyes space, but is it really space? Thages tell us it's actually consciousness. What is consciousness? Something that is conscious. What this means is there is a life force which is the substratum of all existence. What is that life force? What is the cause of creation? What is at the bottom of all of this? The answer, my dear friends, is you. You are the cause of all creation, and you don't exist as you. Therefore creation as it appears to be also does not exist. In other words, creation only exists because you exist. When you go to sleep at night what happens to creation? It no longer exists for you. I know you can say, well I know it's there anyway. No you don't. Who knows? You're in a state of deep sleep. As far as you're concerned you're dead. That's how it is when it comes time to leave your body. You become consciousness itself. The difference between sleeping and being realized is that when you're asleep you're realized, but you're not conscious of it. When you are realized, you are conscious of the whole game. Though you see when you really see what you're made of atoms, trillions and trillions of atoms, you are not who you think you are. You've been fooled. Awaken. Why should you awaken? When you look at the world today and you see what's happening, you become completely confused. You have no idea why there's war man's inhumanity to man. There's going to be a civil war in Russia. They're fighting in South America. In Africa there's upheavals. There appears to be no peace anywhere. Yet reality is love. Reality is peace. Reality is infinite happiness. It doesn't make any sense. How can reality be happiness, love and peace, when you behold the effect of reality, which appears to be chaos and confusion and man's in humanity to man? You have been hypnotized. Have you ever watched a hypnotist? A good hypnotist can hypnotize you and make you believe almost anything. The universal hypnosis is called Maya. It makes me believe I'm Robert and have a life to live. It makes you believe you're Joan or Fred or Henry or Mary and you have a life to live. You worry about your life. You have no patience. You always want to change things, make things better, improve this and improve that. It's all a joke. You cannot improve anything. The only thing you can do is to wake up. When you wake up you see the world as a reflection, as a reflection of a mirror. The mirror is always the same. It never changes. The reflections has changed. The question is of course then why are the reflections? Where do they come from? And as you know my answer is that they do not exist. It's an analogy I give you to let you understand where everything is coming from. Only reality exists and you are that. Only consciousness exists and you are that. Only love exists and you are that. 
If you only realized who you were you would be the happiest person that ever lived and I mean happy, totally happy, unchanging happiness. Is there such a thing? Yes there is. Unchanging peace. Unchanging love. But you have chosen to identify with the Maya with the unreality and so you think you suffer. You believe your life is not what it should be. You compare yourself to someone else. You want to make changes. As you know by now, when you make those changes they only last a short time, then you're back where you were before. The wise person, therefore, does really not look to change anything. They become quiet. They have patience. They work on themselves. They watch their thoughts, watch their actions and observe themselves getting angry, observe themselves getting depressed, observe themselves getting jealous and envious and the rest of it. Little by little they realize, that's not me. That's hypnosis, that's a lie. They do not react to their condition. To the extent that they do not react to their condition, to that extent do they become free. They no longer care what anybody else is doing. They compare themselves with no one. They compete with no one. They simply watch themselves. They observe themselves. They see the mental confusion. They don't run around shouting, I am absolute reality. I am God. I am consciousness. Rather, they see where they're coming from and they leave everyone else alone. Such a being unfolds at a fast rate. It makes no difference what predicament such a being is in. It doesn't matter for such a being is already free. When the mind rests in the heart, that means when the mind does not go out any longer and identify with the world, when the mind rests in the heart there is peace, there is harmony, there is pure being. When you allow your mind to go out of yourself it begins to compare, it begins to judge, it begins to feel offended, and there is no peace. There's no rest. How do you begin? Well first you realize the place that you're in right now, whether you think it's good or bad, whether you think you're happy or sad, whether you think you're rich or poor or sick or healthy, the place where you're in right now is your right place. That's the beginning. You stop trying to be someone else. You stop trying to change your life. You're in your right place right now just the way you are. If you can become happy and peaceful in the place where you are right now, all of a sudden you will find circumstances will change in your favor, and then again you will be in your right place. Whatever change comes along as far as your body mind is concerned, you are in your right place. The more you can see that, the more you can look at what I just said intellectually, intelligently, the more peaceful you become, the more the karmic patterns begin to break away, and you begin to awaken. It may be gradual at first. You notice that things that used to annoy you no longer annoy you. You notice that people that you live with, the conflicts you've had, they stop because you've stopped. There's no more trying to get even. There's no more trying to win your point. There's no more trying to find the right book or the right teacher or the right anything. You remain centered. You remain free. When something comes along, whether it's good or bad, you simply sit where you are and you ask, to whom has this come? And you laugh for you have separated yourself from your body mind and you begin to realize that your body mind is going through the experience, but not you. So there is nothing to worry about. There's nothing to fear. There's nothing that can upset you. There's nothing that can harm you. You realize whatever someone does to your body physically, or with words or otherwise, can never never hurt you because you are not your body. No matter what anyone tells you, no matter what you see with your eyes, can never affect you, for you are not your mind. You have actually separated yourself from your body and your mind. That's only the beginning. As you go further your body and your mind drop off. I don't mean that you die. 
I mean that they become less and less important to you, and you no longer identify with them at all. You actually know, and you feel, and you experience, that your body and mind do not exist, yet you exist. You do not exist as your body or your mind. You exist as absolute reality, as consciousness, and you no longer believe that your body and your mind are a modification of consciousness. You just know that there is no body and there is no mind. You are egoless. There is no reason for your body, mind or the world to exist. You may first feel this slightly, but you will notice the greater the feeling, the greater the happiness. You are beginning to merge in consciousness. You are beginning to feel reality. The world goes on, people do what they always do, yet you see it quite differently. You no longer see the same world you used to see. It's like reading a magazine. The images in a magazine are in front of you, but you are not the magazine and you are not the images. Who you are may still be a mystery. Remember as long as you can express it, it's not that. Therefore you do not walk around telling everybody, I am pure reality, or I am consciousness. You remain silent. By their fruits ye shall know them. You become a light in the world of darkness. Automatically people come around you, and they just feel good by being around you. You have found peace. It has always been you. You have really not found anything. You have just become yourself. Now let's talk about you. Think about your experiences for a while, what you're going through personally in your life, the things that worry you, the things that upset you, the things that make you cry. How can you allow things to have control over you? That's what's called blasphemy. Being the God that you are, you believe that someone or something can make you cry, can upset you, can make you feel bad, can make you want to make changes. As an example, there are so many people who come to me every day or call me on the phone and ask me, Robert, when are we going to have a place of our own? We should go into the woods somewhere and be peaceful, or have an ashram somewhere far away in the woods or the jungle. And my answer is always the same. If you're not peaceful now, you're not going to find peace no matter where you go, because wherever you go, you've got to bring yourself with you. What makes you think you will find peace? If you're a troublemaker, if you're a gossip spreader, do you think the change is going to change you? It will in the beginning, but soon you'll be doing the same things you always do. You'll be restless, you'll find fault, you'll look for reasons to curse people, be upset with others. Though I say to you, stay just where you are. Once you have found yourself, and you've found the semblance of peace and harmony, then see where you want to go, but do not go anywhere until you've found yourself. You and I both know people who come to Los Angeles for a while, then they foul everything up and they go somewhere else, San Francisco, then they foul everything up and they go to Oregon, they foul everything up and go to New York. It never ends. They've never seen themselves for who they are. They simply run and make changes. This is why last week I asked you for one week I want you to ask yourself the question, who am I? Whenever something happens in your life, instead of trying to change it or take some action against it, simply ask yourself, who am I? Whenever your mind starts thinking, ask yourself, who am I? Whenever you hear bad news on the TV, when you feel upset, ask yourself, who am I? That's all you had to do. Not to go any further than that. Now what I'd like to do is hear the results of that experiment. Who would like to tell me or tell us what happened during the week? By posing the question to yourself, who am I? Who would like to say something about that? Pause. Don't all answer at once. Tape unclear student answers then Robert continues. Robert, that's a good answer. The more she asked herself the question the more she realized she didn't know. And what happened when you said, I don't know. S.U. More and more I felt peace. More and more you found a little peace. S.U. 
makes you feel you want to do more practice. It seems the more I practice brings a feeling of ignorance. Robert, and you say, I don't know. Your humanhood can never know who she really is. As long as you're trying to find the answer through human methods, it will never work. How you feel now about that? S.U. I don't know. Okay, that's good. She doesn't know. That's the beginning of wisdom. When you plead divine ignorance. When you don't know what anything at all is. That is the beginning. Who else would like to share? As fee, when I ask the question, it's mind boggling. Nothing comes up except my ego keeps talking to myself. All my limitations come up the more I think of myself. Robert, that's great. You are beginning to see what you really are. As far as your physical form is concerned, you are beginning to see all your limitations and everything that has been going on within you. That's a start. Anyone else? St. Only that I am nothing more than that, and then I would lose that. You know, the world would pull me back to the same old rut, so to speak. So I would go back and forth, back and forth. Robert, that's normal. That's normal. I've did this more intensively than I've ever done it. Robert, great. All this stuff that has been waiting to sprout like dormant seeds—it's all coming up. That's what is supposed to happen. You should actually feel worse than you ever did before, for all this stuff is beginning coming up. And as you keep watching yourself, as you keep looking at all of your stuff, all of your stuff begins to dissipate. Your mind and your thoughts become weaker and weaker and weaker, and your eye becomes stronger and stronger, until you begin to focus and hold on to the eye, and it's revealed to you that all of your stuff is attached to the eye. I have been the cause of my own misery. I have been responsible for everything that has happened to me. No matter how it looks, I am responsible. Therefore, if I goes, the responsibility goes, and everything else goes with the eye. That all should come to you. Anyone else like to share with us? S S. The reality was more intense afterwards, more than before. Robert. Yes. More of a dream existence. Robert, that is very good. You are having a good experience. S S. Thank you. It should become more intense for up to now. You just allow all of your stuff to come forth to make you angry or upset or whatever. But now you are taking a good look at it, and you're realizing what is really going on within your mind. And as you continue to practice, you will soon realize. But wait a minute. I am not my mind because, after all, I am looking at my mind. So how can I be my mind if I am observing my thoughts? I is observing the thoughts. Therefore, I cannot be these things. I cannot be my depression or my hang-ups or anything else because I am observing them. Then who am I? And you keep silent. Who am I? Is similar to the atom I was talking about. In between the atom, the proton, the electron, there is space, which is consciousness. In the same manner, in between, who am I? There is the real self. Every time you say "Who am I?" and you wait, something is happening to you. Your old self is being depleted, and your real self will begin to take place in the space between "Who am I?" You will come to that conclusion yourself as you keep practicing. Anyone else like to share? S H. It seems to me the question you stated in the first place doesn't know who, and there is also no I. There is just a ness. Period. Robert, you can also say there is no am. Then there's nothing at all. Robert, and there is no consciousness and no reality. Okay, now you've got it. Robert, and there is no searching and there is no seeking. At this point is a tape damage. S C. Can I think there is something else than ask a question that answers it? Robert, as you keep inquiring with your mind, it's like a policeman becoming a thief to catch a thief. 
As you keep asking and inquiring the mind turns on itself. It becomes weaker and weaker until it dissipates completely. S.N. Robert if and when one gets rid of the ego. One doesn't get rid of the samskaras and their tendencies from their personality. Though their actions can seem the same, but it's the attachment it's how they view that. A true? Robert, to an extent. The actions may appear the same to others. But, to the one who has realized there are no actions. What I am saying is if one has a temperament to be an intellectual, or philosophical, or emotional, or whatever their samskaras or personality or character is. If in the process one gets rid of their ego one doesn't stop being what they are. Robert, it depends. It's like the example of the electric fan. When you turn off the fan there is no more power, but the fan still spins around until it stops by itself. Though when some people transcend, they still have some of their samskaras left over. But, they are burning themselves out until there is nothing. Everyone is different. Sn. Some may think that well you become holy when all of a sudden, you become an ocean of compassion all of these things. Do you see what I'm saying? Or are you just as you are? Robert, you are as you are. But, your consciousness, your pure being, how others see you is up to them. But, you've become absolute reality. I know what you're talking about because it appears that some Johnnies have all kind of traits. That's why I give you the example of the electric fan. Their ego has been cut and they are totally free, but the fan is still spinning. Their body is still going through certain acts and doing certain things until it stops completely. That's why there appears to be a certain masters, Johnnies that seem to have some negative traits. But that's for others to pledge. Person who has experienced freedom, liberation is totally free. St. Student asks question not clear. Robert. Semantics yes. It's the same thing. It depends where a teacher is coming from and what they mean by it. Would God realization be if you are totally pervasive and aware of all in Maya and so I can say that you are not aware of all in Maya and self-realization you are not aware of Maya, you're just aware of your beingness. Robert, it depends what school you're coming from. In my explanation, in my experience, God realization and self-realization is the same. There is no one to realize. As long as there is someone left over to realize, it is not self-realization. You cannot say, I am self-realized, I no longer exist. There is no one to be realized. Otherwise it's duality, there is not two. There's not I who has become self-realized, there is just realization. There is really nothing at all. Words spoil it. Therefore there are people who have to go after God realization, and there are people who give their own meaning to self-realization. This is why words keep us back. The more we talk about these things, the more confused we become and the less we really know. It all has to do with silence. In silence there is strength. When we try to explain it we spoil it. Question cannot be heard. We pick up Robert midway of answer. Robert, just by being here, there is something about you that's different. It wants to awaken. And if you simply ask yourself, who am I without answering, then the answer will come eventually. At this point is a tape damage. SF picked up at end of student's question. The other one is that I didn't know the answer and I really couldn't get the answer in any kind of mental frame, that's just mental talking, and that's about it. Robert, that's exactly what's supposed to happen. Again, when you first begin, who am I? Teacher, all the stuff is going to come up. SF, with a vengeance. 
everything will come up and attack you from all sides and you are supposed to observe and watch and see all this stuff and to realize, hey wait a minute, that's not me. I am not that. If I am not that then who am I? At this point is a tape damage. Robert continues to answer a question about prayer. Robert, prayer has to do with all those things. Pray for them. Prayer makes you peaceful. Makes you believe that somebody is listening to you. It's like telling the psychiatrist your troubles. After all to whom do you pray? You say, I pray to God. Where does God live? Who is God? And soon you discover you're praying to yourself. And it helps. This leads you to identify with yourself. The one that you pray to. And become that one. For there is only one, there are not two. There is not one who prays and one who listens. The prayer and the listener are the same person. There is no differentiation. St. In the Arabic tradition they pray to Allah and I'm sure now the bombs are falling on them. They all are praying to Allah. And they seem to sacrifice their life to that because of their belief system. But it doesn't change the fact that the allied forces keep bombing them until they don't exist. So there is no way out of this dilemma in their prayer. They may be peaceful, but still they are annihilated with the bombs. Robert, what has that got to do with anything? Well in the reality in Maya, I'm saying is prayer affecting Maya or is it an illusion that we pray? I have prayed for many people in my life, but has never was effective. Robert, if a person is really sincere and they really feel that what they're doing is correct, this will help. Because your mind is very powerful and the prayer is done through your mind. So in the Maya you can create conditions when you pray. But first you must really believe mentally what you are praying for. S. Question picked up toward the end. How do you still worship God if you still? Robert, that's possible. It has to do with your karma and your samskaras and the rest of it that doesn't exist. Do not judge anyone else worry about yourself. At this point the tape ends abruptly.